Honourable Senator, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Documents, Clark. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? No. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind the senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. We will now move in to the swearing in of a new senator. I table the certificate of the choice by the Parliament of Victoria of Greg Mirabella to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Ryan. Mr. President, Senator Mirabella representing Victoria. Admit the senator. Senator, please come to the table and make and subscribe the Oath of Allegiance. Senator, please take the Bible in your right hand and recite the oath on the card handed to you. I, Greg Mirabella, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll. So whereabouts? Oh. In these uh, COVID times, things are a bit less uh, perhaps ceremonial than they used to be, but we all welcome Senator Mirabella to this place. I'm sure we'll all have a chance to catch up with him uh, a little later on. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. Mr President, I move that the rules for remote participation in Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2021 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 8 to 10 February 2022. Mr President, in, uh, in doing so, uh, I do just note uh, and reinforce to Senators that this is a time-limited extension of uh, the eligibility to participate in remote sittings for this sitting week only. Uh, we have continued to extend remote participation uh, as uh, border controls and other restrictions have existed around the country. Uh, but it is the wish of the government and I believe of other parties uh, to ensure that remote participation is not a permanent feature uh, of this place. 
Uh, no senator should automatically assume that it will be extended for other sittings, and we will continue to monitor carefully the COVID situation around the country uh, and work cooperatively across the chamber to ensure participation is available to senators, but also that the appropriate place for Senate participation being here in this chamber is the paramount consideration in the long term. I thank the Senator. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, do I need to seek leave? To, uh, oh, no. Just Thank you. Um, well, I think the opposition would like to associate uh, ourselves with the, um, the comments made by the Leader of the Government in the Senate uh, around extending remote participation for this period of two weeks, acknowledging that there are still border restrictions in place in WA and quite widespread um, community transmission of COVID. However, uh, we don't see remote participation as a permanent feature of the Senate um, and it should remain under review for each sitting period. Um, our view is that people, if they are able to, should attend the Senate in person. It has served a purpose uh, during these unprecedented times, but it is time limited uh, and that senators should be aware that that is certainly the thinking of the opposition on this matter. I'll put the most Senator Lambie. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that Jack and Lambie Network, um, their stance on this with remote participation, the sooner it is over, the better. Uh, you're all talking about the country getting back to normality. Um, and quite frankly, unless you've got a medical certificate, you should be sitting in this chamber. It's as simple as that. Thank you. There being no further participants, I will put the question. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. In the final sitting weeks of 2021, the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplace places was published by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins. Today, on the first sitting day of 2022, we deliver this statement on behalf of the Parliamentary Cross-Party Leadership Task Force recommended by Commissioner Jenkins and is a reflection of the Parliament. We acknowledge the unacceptable history of workplace bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. This issue is of the greatest importance and the responsibility of all people who work in this place. Any bullying, sexual assault or sexual harassment is unacceptable and wrong. We say sorry. Every workplace should be safe and respectful. This place and its members are committed to bringing about lasting and meaningful change to both culture and practice within our workplaces. We have failed to provide this in the past. We today declare our personal and collective commitment to make the changes required. We will aspire, as we should, to set the standard for the nation. We thank all of those who participated in the Jenkins Review acknowledging everyone who came forward to tell us of their experiences. We also acknowledge the many others who could, could not or did not participate, but who may have experienced misconduct. We know that your experiences have had profound and far-reaching impacts on your lives. We have listened and heard you, and we accept your calls for change. This parliament should serve as a model workplace for our nation. Only by creating the best workplace will this parliament attract the best people to our, that our country has to offer. And only by attracting the best our country has to offer and listening to the communities we represent will we deliver the high standard that our country deserves. Parliamentary workers feel pride in working for their country and the privilege and honour of making a difference to the Australian people. However, for far too many, this has not been safe or it has not been safe or respectful. The Jenkins Review proposes an ambitious program of reform to ensure Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces meet the highest standards. We are fully committed to working across the parliament to implement all of these recommendations within the time frame proposed by the Commissioner Jenkins. We have started to act. Last year, we established a new independent complaints process and began providing trauma-informed support for people who have experienced serious incidents working in the parliament. Members, senators and staff have undertaken professional workplace training. Parliamentarians must uphold the highest standards and be accountable for delivering required actions. We know that cultural change has to come from the top. 
It has to be role modelled and championed by all of us. While we know we cannot undo the harm that has already been done, we are committed to acknowledging the mistakes of the past and continuing to build safe and respectful workplaces. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I seek leave to make a statement in uh, response to your statement of acknowledgement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr President, uh, I thank you and the Speaker in the other place uh, for the statement you have just given. Uh, I welcome and endorse the statement, its content, its spirit, its intent. It is a statement of unity, I trust, from this place and of senators to say sorry for the bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault that has occurred in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, and to commit to doing everything that we can do individually as senators and leaders and collectively as members of this chamber and as parliamentarians across the board to change culture and practice to make our workplaces safer and more respectful for everyone. The impact of workplace bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault is profound for the individual victims of it, for their families, for their friends, for their workmates and colleagues. The impact on the work of the parliament in serving the Australian people is also significant. The skills, commitment, passion and drive people have for making a contribution in this place is enormous. Commissioner Jenkins highlighted the contributions of many of the hundreds of individuals who contributed to her work. Her report set the standard. I thank all of those who participated in the various ways by making submissions, by participating in interviews, uh, by uh, undertaking the surveys and other engagement methods. One of those quotes of so many uh, that Commissioner Jenkins highlighted said, and I quote, I felt that I had no option but to leave that building. And it wasn't because I didn't like working in politics. It wasn't because I didn't enjoy staffing. But that office made it untenable for me to be in the vicinity of that building and to even show up I was getting severe chest pain walking into the building. Their loss, that individual's loss, reflective of others who contributed to Commissioner Jenkins' work, is our nation's loss. The fact that we lose good people is a loss in each of our offices and a loss to the parliament as a whole. This statement of acknowledgement delivered by you, Mr President, and the Speaker today was the first recommendation of Commissioner Jenkins's report. Her report, as you acknowledged, was received in the final sitting week of 2021, and today, on the first sitting day of 2022, we take the action of delivering upon that first important recommendation of acknowledging the harms that have been caused, of saying sincerely sorry for those harms and apologising for the circumstances and culture that led to them and for the failures in systems in terms of the way in which they have been handled over time. We commit ourselves to change. I thank Commissioner Jenkins for the enormous work that she did to ensure the voices of current and former staff, current and former parliamentarians could be heard through her review. I thank her for her guidance and feedback, not just in that report, but through the process and the undertaking of that report and subsequently in the actions in implementing the report, including the drafting of your statement and the work around the procedures for it to occur today. This review and this statement would not have been possible indeed would not, have been, uh, would not have occurred without those current and former staff who were willing to share their stories and their experiences. I acknowledge all of them, most of them, the vast majority, unknown in terms of publicly, as they would wish in terms of the respecting of their privacy. But I acknowledge those who have spoken out publicly as well. Those such as Ms Brittany Higgins, who's shown bravery in sharing her experience and who has also continued uh, to engage constructively with Commissioner Jenkins, uh, with Ms Stephanie Foster, who undertook the interim report and review last year for shorter-term responses the parliament could take, 
and uh, who now continues to engage with Ms Kerry Hartland, the chair of the leadership task force recommended by the Jenkins Review to oversee the implementations of the recommendations. They all, both publicly known and named, uh, and those participating, advising and uh, making uh, their views known and experiences known uh, in private, uh, all have played a role in bringing us to this point today. Life, Mr President, is a journey of learning, of understanding, of growing. Each of us learn in different ways right throughout our lives. One of the great privileges of the jobs that those of us in this place serving as members of parliament have is the ability to learn from the diverse experiences of so many others right around the country as we engage in our jobs and seek to represent those who put us here. The events of the last year have been a period of learning for me, and I hope they have been for all others, as I have reflected upon the experiences that have been told, stories and experiences of my own office and those uh, across the rest of the parliament to think about how we can do better, how we can change culture one step at a time through the actions of each and every one of us. Today's statement is an important step forward and it builds on some steps that we as a parliament have already begun, including through our unanimous motion in this chamber and in the other place in support of the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service established last year and its independent complaints mechanism. It builds upon the steps that overwhelmingly we have all taken in undertaking the professional training that is in place, as well as the steps that have been taken through the provision of trauma-informed counselling across this parliament. But this statement of acknowledgement rightly identifies that those steps are not enough that we commit to delivering upon uh, the recommendations and acting upon the recommendations of the Jenkins Review to make our Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces safe and respectful for everyone. These recommendations call upon all of us in parliamentary workplaces to show leadership. They are not a matter for any one party. I thank the opposition, the minor parties and independents uh, for their cooperation in support from the early commissioning of the Jenkins Review, the legal protections that were put in place for participants in that review, the conclusion and handling of the release of it, uh, and more recently, the establishment of the Leadership Task Force uh, and the initial steps towards implementing on its recommendations. As we implement those recommendations, there will be legislation introduced into this parliament this week. Uh, there will be a motion to put in place other procedures to implement recommendations this week, and there is much more work occurring uh, in the background to deliver upon the other recommendations. I look forward to the same spirit of cooperation and support across the chamber and the parliament in delivering upon all of those different aspects of this report. The cross-parliamentary approach has been a hallmark of what we have done to date, and as Commissioner Jenkins has said, will be vital for us to continue into the future. We owe our staff of today, the staff and members and senators who served here previously, and perhaps most importantly, those who will come in the future, nothing less than to continue that cooperative, thoughtful approach to implementation of these recommendations. I look forward to continuing to work with colleagues through the Cross-Parliamentary Leadership Task Force and the ongoing work that we have to do to ensure, Mr President, that we do uphold the highest standards in all Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, that we do, as Commissioner Jenkins's report is entitled, set the standard appropriately for the nation. I thank the Senate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. And on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, I thank you for your statement and acknowledgement today. The last passage, Mr President, in particular, struck a poignant chord. While we know we cannot undo the harm that has already been done, we are committed to acknowledging the mistakes of the past and continuing to build a safe and respectful workplaces. And the President is correct, we cannot undo the harm. For all the words in the Jenkins Review and all the speeches that will be given here today, nothing we can say will undo the harm that countless staff have experienced in this workplace, and that is simply because we are too late. 
too many people have been harmed. Bullying, sexual harassment, and sexual assault have all been able to occur, in some cases fester, in this workplace. And like many senators here today, I have sat opposite too many people of their, as they have described to me the harms that they have endured in this building. As they have cried, we have cried. As they have expressed their anger, we have felt that anger. And as they have grieved, we have grieved. I have grieved for their harm, but I've also grieved for the harm that's taken place while they've been working here in Parliament House, a workplace that should represent a highlight in any career. Parliament House, our workplace, should act as a model for others and be something that all Australians look to with pride, a place that should attract the best talent from across the country, and indeed the globe, with people jostling to work with their elected representatives to build a better Australia. But too often, as the Jenkins Review has shown, we've let our staff down. For that, to all our staff, past and present, we say sorry. On behalf of the Australian Labour Party in this place, I say sorry. Sadly, in my conversations, and I am sure in many of the conversations that those in this chamber have had, too many victims have questioned their own actions. They have asked, what did I do wrong that caused this? If I had done things differently, could I have avoided this harm? And of course, the answer is they did nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong with expecting your workplace to be safe. There is nothing wrong with expecting your workplace to be free of sexual harassment and the crime of sexual assault. And there's nothing wrong with expecting your workplace to be deliberately fostering a positive culture, a respective culture, where you can feel safe at work. And yet this workplace, Parliament House, has not lived up to these basic standards. A culture has developed here over the decades where too often bullying, sexual harassment, and sexual assault has not been confronted. Indeed, in some cases, it has been deliberately ignored or covered up. Now, this, now is this behavior occurring everywhere in this workplace? No. But could this behavior occur anywhere in this workplace? And to that question, regrettably, we all must answer yes. And that is why we are here today, to both acknowledge the harm which we cannot undo and to embark on a fearless trajectory to help build a workplace where the expected standards of behavior are modeled, championed, and enforced. A workplace where respectful behavior is rewarded and in which any Australian, no matter their gender, race, sexual orientation, disability status, or age, feels safe and welcome to contribute. To those who bravely stepped into the media spotlight this past year to say enough is enough, to call for change, we are all in your debt. Without the courage of Brittany Higgins and others, the Jenkins Review might never have happened. And without the Jenkins Review, the hundreds of staff who have contributed to the review might never have had the chance to have their voices heard. To every staff member, both current and former, who contributed to the Jenkins Review, we say thank you. And so, while shortly these speeches will finish today, the real work for us is, uh, is just beginning. The Jenkins Review lays out the challenge before us and the roadmap for change. And maps are not always perfect. Course corrections are sometimes needed. But what we must not change is our commitment to build a better workplace. Australians will be watching what happens here, as will our staff, where, as the Jenkins Review is implemented. And Australians, rightly, will not accept another generation of parliamentary staff who have been harmed because of our inaction. The challenge is ours, and it is a challenge I am sure this chamber can unite around. Senator McKenzie, were you seeking the call? Yes, I was, was thank you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, Mr President, and I would like to associate the National Party, obviously, with um, the contributions of both Senator Birmingham and Senator Keneally. Um, and on behalf of the National Party, I, I have a brief contribution to make. Um, we have the report and we have a pathway to change. And today we honour the incredible bravery and strength of character 
is taken by all of those who have spoken up and told their stories. And to each of you, I'd like to say we hear you and we stand with you. What has occurred here over the years hasn't been acceptable. Uh, it's not who we strive to be as a collective and as individuals, and it's not uh, who we should be. We should be the workplace, an exemplary workplace, where young, our best and our brightest, irrespective of their political views in a liberal democracy such as ours, um, seek to compete to work in and for our nation to make it a better place. Um, and sadly, not just in the recent times, but over a long period of time, uh, this hasn't been uh, the case. We want every person to feel safe and secure, no matter where they live, work uh, or operate in this country. And sexual harassment and assault is never OK, anywhere, anytime. Uh, we have the report highlights both cultural and structural issues with this workplace. And in a bipartisan way, we're going to work towards addressing those together. Because uh, this isn't an issue of one side of politics or other, one chamber or another, one office or another. This is a shared problem over a long period of time. And that joint acknowledgement by our generation of parliamentarians uh, is the real breakthrough. Um, many of the people that have worked that are now MPs, I'm not one, but many of the people that are now MPs uh, were staff 20, 30 years ago and have seen this particular workplace evolve and change over time. But one thing hasn't, and I'm very proud to be part of a government that's taken a step, but also a member, a generation of parliamentarians who are going to work together to see uh, the cultural and structural change that this workplace needs to deliver going forward. Um, and we do need to be united in this uh, commitment. One of the key recommendations of the Jenkins report is for us to, um, for our parliament to reflect and think about what those appropriate changes need to be. And to paraphrase one of the greatest minds, uh, a brilliant scientist, but also a woman, uh, Marie Curie, we all share a responsibility for all of humanity. And progress is never swift or easy. And anyone that thinks it is and that it's going to be solved by an apology or one report is kidding themselves. Mr. President, today we will be remembered as the will be remembered as the hallmark of a new way of reflecting on who we are and what we stand for and where we want to be as a united nation and people. Our unity reflected in a respectful workplace uh, in our national capital, reflecting the diversity uh, of Australian political views as well, but united. Uh, that sexual harassment and assault is never OK. Thank you for the brave uh, men and women, former staff, current staff, MPs who fed into this report. Um, I do want to also acknowledge that many of these people still work in this building. And for this process, uh, it has been a difficult time. Everybody has their own story. Everybody knows someone, a sister, a mother, a child, a friend a work colleague uh, that has a very personal story to tell uh, um, in this space. And that is why this spark around the March for Justice last year was so powerful and why I was very proud with other National Party uh, MPs and senators to join um, those people on, on our forecourt uh, last year. I might not have agreed with all the political messages that were being sprouted on that day, but absolutely stood in solidarity um, with the principle that sexual assault and harassment is never OK. And I just wanted to ensure that we uh, understood and acknowledged that many, for many people, when we stand up and talk about this stuff, uh, it does trigger um, reflections for them. We welcome the review and thank the Commissioner for the exceptional work uh, that has gone into the report. Uh, we'll continue to implement all the recommendations as outlined, and we are all privileged to serve. Uh, we will be the generation that takes this responsibility very seriously and the Nationals are committed to not just talking about change but ensuring uh, both as individual MPs but as a collective that we work towards that end. Thank you. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, President. I rise to speak in response to the joint statement of acknowledgement given by yourself, President, and to apologise to everyone who has been harmed, abused, raped, harassed, bullied, made unsafe in this workplace, and to reinforce the Greens' full commitment to working for implementation of every single one of the Set the Standards recommendations. Around half the staff in parliamentary workplaces have experienced harassment, bullying or assault during their time here, almost half. We should all be appalled by that. For First Nations people, people of colour, people with disability, the harassment and disrespect is even worse. The Commissioner uh, heard that even raising issues of racism or the intersectionality of racism and sexism could provoke an aggressive response. Now, my own Greens colleagues have experienced that, as have our staff. Sexism and racism are alive and well in this parliament, and in combination, they are even more damaging and dangerous. This has not been a safe workplace. This has been an entitled boys' club. As the thousands and thousands of women and allies who took to the streets to march for justice said, enough. This has to stop. There cannot be more blame shifting and glossing over and waiting till later. The blame is ours. The shame is ours. On behalf of the Greens, we are, I am so sorry. There are many things on which people in this place do not agree, but on this issue we must be better and we must act collectively. The toxic culture that has been allowed to fester in Parliament, documented in appalling detail by Commissioner Jenkins in the Set the Standard report, must end, and that will only happen if we all work together to end it. As one of the participants interviewed by the Human Rights Commission said, this is Parliament. It should set the standard for workplace culture, not the floor of what culture should be. We are sorry and we have to do better, every single one of us, every single day. It's been nearly 12 months since Brittany Higgins bravely shared her experience, peeling back the curtains on the callous disregard that so many women, so many people have endured for so long. Hers was not the first story. Rochelle Miller, Chelsea Potter, countless others have spoken out before. Brittany Higgins' story was not even the most recent story, but hers was the final straw and this parliament must commit to making it the last story like that that someone has to tell. Brittany Higgins, Rochelle Miller, Chelsea Potter, Josie Coles, Emma Hussar, Julia Banks and so many others who shared their stories with Commissioner Kate Jenkins, they did so because they felt they had to, to reveal the toxic culture, the sexism, the bullying, the lack of support, the he said, she said mentality, the cover-ups. They did this in the hope that something would change. They chose to speak up for themselves but also for those who weren't able to speak up. And we know from the report that the vast majority of staff who have been harassed in this place have made no formal report because they had no faith that anything would be done. We have heard and we have listening, listened, but we must keep listening. The Prime Minister must listen in particular to Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins tomorrow at the press club. We must make sure that current and former staff, affected survivors, are involved in these reforms in a meaningful way and feel supported to tell us when we're not doing enough. We must work to support those who have suffered, those who are still suffering from their experience. We must maintain a robust, independent, confidential complaints process that people can trust. We must work to put in place a code of conduct that not only sets the standard, but makes sure that there are consequences when those standards are not met. We need to tackle inequality, racism, classism, homophobia and lack of representation in our parliament. The culture in this place will only change when decisions are being made with people with differing views and experiences. We must work for a more diverse and inclusive parliament that better represents our community. More women, more people of colour, more people with disability, more LGBTIQ plus people, people with diverse backgrounds. I want to thank Commissioner Jenkins and her team again for the incredible work that she and her team have done in setting out what we need to do. We owe it to everyone who took part, to everyone in this place, to everyone in the country, to show some leadership and get it done. I also want to acknowledge that this work needs to be done, not just in this workplace, but in all workplaces around the country. 
We must keep working to implement a positive duty on employers to ensure that every worker in every workplace is safe and respected. Yes. Oh, looking for further Mr. contributions. President? Senator Patrick. Oh, sorry. I'd I'll, like to make a contribution, please. I'll go to Senator Hanson remotely. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The apologies provided by both the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader of this Parliament are simply virtue signalling hollow statements. The Opposition Leader and wannabe Prime Minister Anthony Albanese oversaw one of the greatest smear campaigns of a sexual harassment victim in this Parliament. And rather than address the actions of the perpetrator, Mr Slipper, Mr Albanese ran defence and provided the millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to further prolong, torment and victimise the victim. This in turn forced the victim to accure more than $4 million worth of legal bills that he remains financially responsible for. And while an act of grace was provided by Labor to pay for Mr Slipper's multi-million dollar legal bill, the victim has been left fearfully of bankruptcy with a $4 million debt. Where is the apology and act of grace to Mr Ashby? What saddens victims of sexual harassment that continues to occur in this parliament is the fact that most victims have been forced to sign non-disclosure agreements in return for cash settlements. Victims live with the burden of knowing the perpetrators are free to carry on with their jobs, their stature and their positions without any fallout. The act of cover-up by political parties of sexual harassment is disgraceful. And if you were truly remorseful for the behaviour of current and former politicians, you would release the victims from confidentiality clauses and let them speak freely of the pain and suffering your members caused. I'm aware of at least three confidential payouts made to staff to the former speaker. These were orchestrated by senior members of both the Liberal and Labor parties. It is not the responsibility of the taxpayer to pay out victims. It should be the politician. Only then will it make them <clears throat> only then <clears throat> will it make them put their heads in, pull their heads in. Politicians should not be treated as protected species. Too many of you have blood on your hands, and the standards some of you have set as parliamentarians is shameful, both to the people who work alongside you and to the greater public. There's no wonder why some staffers think it's funny to film themselves masturbating on MPs' desks and send it on to their colleagues. I take my hat off to Brittany Higgins for coming forward. Brittany Higgins' alleged rape was not committed by a Member of Parliament but a work colleague. Yet it was used to a political level for point scoring, something the Labor Party went out of its way to avoid during the slipper case. The public see through your pathetic attempt to deal with the, the subject of sexual harassment within Parliament House. And while I sympathise, truly sympathise with each of the victims, truly it should be the perpetrator you're seeking an apology from, not me. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you, Mr President. I just uh, rise briefly in support uh, of the acknowledgement and indeed uh, share the views of the Leader of the Government, Opposition, uh, Nationals and the Greens. Uh, bullying, sexual harassment, uh, sexual misconduct is totally unacceptable. I just note that it is, it is the senators who set the tone, uh, who set the culture of uh, the way in which this building is run, uh, and it's up to us to make sure that where there's improper behaviour that it is dealt with decisively. Uh, in the case of a senator engaging in this sort of conduct, we need to make sure that we watch our colleagues, but also that leaders of parties are strong and de de decisive uh, when misbehaviour occurs. 
I thank Ms Jenkins for her efforts uh, and for uh, putting together a, a good report. The truth will be in the eating of the pudding and I hope these recommendations pass quickly through both chambers. Uh, Senator Hanson Young has also sought the call. Senator Waters, he, um, I'm happy to give you precedence. Senator, Han you moving on to the next thing? Yeah. Okay. Senator Hanson Young. I just told Nick. Are you seeking the call? Yes, thank you. Senator just briefly, um, thank you, Mr. President. Just to um, add my contribution to um, the statements that have been made and to um, respond to the acknowledgement. Um, outlined today and uh, in the other place. Of course, um, culture starts at the top, and that's why it is absolutely important that as members of parliament, not only do we look at the details of this report, read and hear the words and the pain of those that have told their stories uh, to the commissioner, been brave enough to come forward uh, either um, privately or uh, in the public realm. Um, but it is now up to us as members of parliament uh, to work together to respond and to uh, do this with genuine force uh, and passion and commitment to doing it. And I am truly sorry for those staff, uh, past and present, who have suffered um, harassment, um, bullying, assault, in this place as part of just doing their job. And I know that there are a number of staff uh, who would have liked to have been here today to have uh, seen uh, this acknowledgement themselves and because of the circumstances uh, of which we are in today and have not been able to. And I think it is important, Mr President, to reflect on the fact that many of our staff today uh, will be listening to the very words and, uh, and, and holding um, us as MPs uh, to that standard that we have now committed ourselves to, and I think that is absolutely important. I know that uh, Ms Higgins um, and Ms Miller and Ms Cole uh, and others are in the building today because it is an important, um, an important thing that is happening here, uh, and I hope uh, that um, they uh, no longer uh, have to feel terrified and upset and worried about when they walk back in that front door ever, ever again. Senator Waters, you're seeking the call. Yes, thanks, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to confidence and the lack thereof in this government. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to lack of confidence in the government. I urge the Senate to suspend standing orders so that the Senate can vote on this motion of no confidence in this government. This vote is urgent because no one can honestly have confidence in this government. We need to put this government out of its misery. This is not just about the text messages. It's because the government cannot keep people safe. It is urgent because each week 200 people are dying from COVID. For January, that's the highest in the Asia-Pacific region per head of population. They can't, keep, they can't keep people safe from the climate crisis because they're deliberately making it worse. They can't keep women safe at work, refusing to back all of the recommendations in the Safe at Work report. We must urgently consider this matter because the government can't keep people safe from rising inequality. Millions of people are in dangerous, insecure work, underpaid, living in unaffordable housing, not having housing at all struggling to keep their head above water. This is not just about the text messages. The texts just show what we've all known. These guys are in it for themselves. The Prime Minister would sell out anyone to get ahead, and those texts show that those closest to him know that all too well. During the pandemic, he and this rotten government have undermined the states. They've overseen a crisis in aged care, They've given false confidence to people and they've failed to, pre to prepare for life after lockdown. We must urgently suspend standing orders. Right now, our elders are stuck inside their rooms and Mr uh, Morrison and Mr Dutton can't agree on how to help. 
They're fighting for the top job while people drive around trying to find rat tests. And callously, the health minister is claiming that those who've died would have died anyway. This chaos is dangerous and the fish rots from the head. How can anyone have confidence in this government? We must consider this urgently because the government can barely pass legislation. It can't establish an integrity commission. Oh, it's too busy to do that one. It's too busy for the Prime Minister to watch Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins speak at the press club tomorrow. This government is hanging on by one vote in the House, and it doesn't have the numbers here in the Senate. It can't get real climate action past the National Party. It can't decide whether schools should be allowed to discriminate against LGBTIQ plus kids. It can't even back a wage rise of aged care workers. All of these issues are putting people's lives at risk. This government cannot keep people safe. That is exactly why we need to consider this motion of no confidence urgently. The last three summers, people have died because of the failures of this government. People have died in climate fueled bushfires while Mr Morrison went on holiday to Hawaii and he waved around coal in Parliament shouting, don't be scared. They've died in aged care homes while the responsible minister went to the cricket. In a crisis, in a pandemic, you need clear, honest information from trusted sources. We have been denied that from this government because, as the text messages show, they can't tell the truth. In trying to take all the credit and push off all the blame, the country has lost all confidence. And this Senate chamber must urgently consider this motion. Because while the country faced incredible anxiety, stress and uncertainty caused by the global pandemic, the government was more concerned about their own re-election. We've seen the Prime Minister try to appeal to anti-vaxxers when it suited him and then lock out sports stars again to try to be popular. But we remember what you've said and what you've done, Prime Minister. The people aren't stupid. The polls show that they're onto you. Women don't like being told that they're lucky not to be shot when they speak up. Aged care residents don't like being told that they were going to die anyway. People who are worried about the climate crisis don't like seeing coal being waved about in parliament. It's not surprising that someone in the cabinet reportedly called him, I quote, a psycho, a man who, was, uh, who has a trophy that he awarded himself for stopping the boats full of desperate people trying to seek safety in Australia, a man who waves coal in parliament, a man who stands over people to get what he wants. Only a, quote, horrible, horrible man could be proud to build a political career off the abuse of vulnerable people. The former Premier of New South Wales was right. This is a horrible, horrible man. This government, led by this Prime Minister, cares only about itself. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull knows that. The President of France knows that. Julia Banks knows that. Even Minister Joyce knows that. The Prime Minister is a bully. He's a bigot. He's a liar and he's a fraud. We must urgently consider this vote of no confidence because the people of this country have lost confidence in him and the government he purports to lead. This government have had a go, they've failed, and now they've got to go. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I uh, hate to, uh, to break it to the Australian Greens, but, uh, but Mr. President, there'll be a time and a place for this to be considered, and that will be at an election in a few months' time. That will be at an election in a few months' time. That will be when the Australian people make their decision about who governs and the constitution of this parliament for the next three years, just as they did a little under three years ago when they re-elected the Morrison government. And much as the Australian Greens may wish to change the normal electoral course, the fact is it's a job for the Australian people at the election. And I know, Mr President, there's the Greens calling for an early election, and I heard Senator Waters earlier, of course, proclaiming what she saw to be the election outcome, talking about the polls, predicting the election outcome, showing the same type of hubris that she did three years ago when she made exactly the same sorts of calls, exactly the same sorts of observations about the polls, only, of course, to be completely wrong. Now, Mr President, we take nothing for granted when we go to the election in a few months' time, but we will welcome the opportunity. We will welcome the opportunity to stand on our track record of keeping Australians safe and secure through some of the most uncertain times the world has faced. 
through the most uncertain times, arguably, that most people in this chamber at this point in time have ever lived through, Mr President. We'll stand on a record that sees 1.7 million more Australians in jobs, employed, with the opportunities and the dignity that come from paid work and employment. Today, 1.7 million more than when our government was first elected. Incredibly, a 1.1 million recovery and surge in employment and job numbers since the pandemic of COVID-19 struck, since it disrupted economies and lives in every country around the world. Now, you sort of get an alternate view of history from those opposite and from the Greens from time to time who seem to pretend that COVID-19 is happening in isolation here in Australia and ignore many of the comparisons of situations around the rest of the world. But here in Australia, Mr President, we have, not without challenge, not without difficulty and not without mistakes, we have nonetheless still seen lower rates of fatalities than global averages in most other comparable nations. We have achieved higher rates of vaccinations than most other comparable nations. And we have secured stronger economic outcomes than most other nations. That's a testament to the work and the cooperation of all Australians. We don't stand here as a government proclaiming all of those achievements as exclusively our own. They're the work that come from the earliest decisions that were taken to close Australia's international borders that Prime Minister Morrison took before, indeed, the global pandemic had been, occurred, been declared by the World Health Organisation. It was recognised here in Australia. And through that closure of borders, we managed to keep most of the earlier deadlier strains of COVID-19 at bay in Australia, to buy the time for vaccines to be developed, but to buy the time for the rollout to occur, to give Australians the opportunity to protect and secure themselves as they have done in record numbers. Through that time, our economic response plans have worked. That 1.7 million additional Australians in jobs that have been secured sees 1 million more Australian women in work as a result. See some of the highest women's workforce participation rates that our country has ever seen. Sees unemployment standing at 4.2 per cent, a 13-year low in unemployment. Youth unemployment at lows, Mr President. And in part, youth unemployment is at such lows because of the 220,000 trade apprenticeships that have been generated, operating today as a result of the economic response policies our governments put in place. Australian families, households, dealing with the challenges of COVID with the extra security of lower taxes, of some 11.5 million Australian families enjoying tax relief to the tune of $1.5 billion per month additional income into their homes, into their households to secure them. So, Mr President, we oppose the suspension of standing orders because this parliament has real business to get on with today, rather than the stunts of the Australian Greens. The Australian people will get to have their say at an election that we will contest and we will argue strongly in terms of our track record, in terms of our economic plans for the future and against the type of Labor-Greens alliance that will go to the election, that will no doubt, of course, no doubt, of course, were they successful, work hand in glove and see those opposite Senator held to Birmingham. ransom by the Senator likes Birmingham. of Senator Waters. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Labor Party will be supporting this suspension. And whilst we agree with the Leader of the Government in the Senate that there are important matters before this chamber this week, uh, the competence and capability of the Government is right at the top of that list. And it gives us no pleasure to say that this is a government that has given up governing and we have no confidence in this government. And the reason it gives me no pleasure is because by saying that, we are letting the Australian people down. You know, the Australian people who rely on government to help them, to give them a hand up, to fix their problems, have gone missing, so disunified at fighting each other, leaking against each other, attacking their leader, telling the truth about their leader, wanting the Australian people to know what they really think. And while they're doing that, they're not looking after the Australian people and all the problems that the Australian people are feeling now, whether they be in aged care, where the situation is so dire with thousands, 
infected with COVID, hundreds dying, staff not able to perform their jobs. That's the real world out there. People worried about COVID, people worried about their kids, people worried about getting the access to the booster. These are people's real worry, how they pay to fill their car up, how they buy their groceries, how they meet the rising cost of living. These are the problems that are out there and the Australian people deserve a government that's going to turn up every day and work on their behalf. And we haven't seen any evidence of that for months from this government. They're missing in action. And their disunity and their failure to govern has real life consequences for the Australian people. And that is what angers us. And that is why we are supporting this today. We have no confidence. The Australian people are fast losing any remnant of confidence they had, waking up to stories about psychos and horrible, horrible men and liars and hypocrites and stories about infighting. They don't want to hear about that. They want someone and a government in place that's going to deal with the real challenges facing this country. And we can go through the list of failures of this government. Others already have. But the rorts, the waste, the billions of dollars of taxpayer funds that's gone into political sandbagging of seats. The climate wars, nine years of inaction and scaremongering, leaving it to future generations to deal with a much bigger issue and a much bigger problem. The constant lying by the Prime Minister, the failure to take responsibility. World leaders have called him out, for goodness sake. His deputy has called him out. The COVID response, the lack of access to rapid antigen tests. I mean, how many of us, representative of our communities, experienced that over summer? You know, no one could get a rat. No one. And at the same time, we're being told you've got to get yourself tested if you want to do anything. Well, that's fine if you were able to. A massive failure. The aged care minister hops off to the cricket. I don't have a problem with people going to the cricket. I love the cricket. But I do have a problem with Australia's aged care minister going to the cricket when people are dying, people are not getting fed, people are not able to have a bath or a shower, staff are working in the most horrendous experiences. I do have a problem with that. And then I've got a prime minister who says, that's OK. I'm sure he copped that criticism, no problem while the system is in crisis and falling apart. Now, we are used to, in this place, the leadership failures of this Prime Minister. We see it every single day. Bushfires, vaccines, aged care, the failure to take responsibility, the blame shifting to the states. It's not our fault, it's theirs. The not being straight with people, the changing his answer. I remember I really did like electric vehicles. I never said they were going to end the weekend. Yeah, you did. So many times. And this is the standard we have set at the top of this government. The disunity. They cannot solve problems for people if they are too busy fighting themselves. And that is what we are seeing. This Prime Minister is out of touch. He has no understanding about how to deal with the challenges facing the Australian people. They've even given up pretending to govern on behalf of the people of Australia and they should call the election now. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, oh, Mr President. Sorry. Sorry, Senator Roberts. Senator, I saw Senator Rustin oh. first. It'll come back to this side again. Uh, yeah, um, look, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr President. Um, well, you can clearly tell um, that the Greens has... On, the point, on a point of order? Senator, uh, President, we're all wearing masks in here unless we're speaking. Senator Roberts is sitting there across the chamber not wearing a mask. It's entirely unacceptable. He's been asked to put a mask on by his fellow senators already. Can you please enforce the rule? It's on the point of order. I'd like to address the, the statement that Senator Wish Wilson just made. Well, I'm, I'm not sure this is the appropriate because time. He, 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 but if he misrepresented what I'm doing. Well, I'd like go, the opportunity. Go ahead, Senator Thank Roberts. Thank you. Um, Senator McKim came over, me, over to me earlier and very respectfully and courteously said that um, Senator uh, Steele-John has a compromised immune system. 
I said, I said, so I'm willing to put the mask on, and I did so. I took the mask off just now because I jumped to get the, get the call. I'm happy to put it back on, and I will be putting it back on. I did not deliberately ignore Senator McKim because I gave my word to Senator McKim, and that's, that's where it ends. But I point out, as I did to Senator McKim— Senator Roberts, Senator Roberts, I think you've explained your position well. I think we need to move on now. Thank you very much. Senator Rustin, you have the call. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, clearly we have started the election campaign today. It's, uh, it's particularly disappointing um, that you know, when we're in this place and we, uh, we, you know, we work, operate for you know, two and three quarter years of an election term, respectfully, uh, and then all of a sudden when the, the time comes, uh, the Greens decide they're going to pull some sort of ch childish protest party stunt. Um, and really disappointingly, the Labor Party decide that they're going to pile on as well. But, I mean, the reality is um, that you know, we have lived in the most unprecedented times for the last two years. Um, you know, a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic hit the world. Um, and I think you know, if you look at Australia's track record over the last couple of years, where we have got the highest vaccination rates of just about any country in the world, and, um, and we have seen um, a relatively low number of people lose their lives as a result of COVID, but that doesn't in any way diminish the pain and suffering of the families of people who have lost a loved one uh, as a result of COVID. But it does point to the fact that the, the provisions and the actions taken by this government have reduced the number of people who would have sadly died from COVID because of the action taken by this government. But at the same time as having high vaccination rates and, uh, and a relatively low death rate, we have also maintained a strong economy, um, which all of the experts are suggesting um, is well placed to rebound from this latest um, Omicron strain that has had such a devastating effect um, across Australia over the summer um, in, in recent months. But you know, there was no rule book for this. There was no rule book. And I love the, you know, the heroes of hindsight that come in here and pretend that they could have done this all so much better because they can look back and they can learn about the experiences that we have had and undertaken over the last two years and sit here and pass judgment on that. Well, I've got to say, heroes of hindsight are, are not people that will make good leaders, and, and I hope, for the sake of this country, that we don't see a situation where the Australian Greens are in, a co uh, in partnership with the Labor Party and inflict on the Australian population the kind of ridiculous behaviours that we've seen in this place, and particularly things like this stunt. I also find it really quite extraordinary um, to come in here and you know you hear uh, you know the accusations about you know lies and dishonesty. Well, I mean there is nothing that is more dishonest than running a scare campaign trying to tell older Australians that the coalition government intends to put them on the cashless debit card. You know that's not true. You know that is an absolute abject lie, and yet you're more than happy to allow your members to post this kind of stuff on their social media sites. You defend it. Um, so, I mean, there is not a skerrick of truth in what you're running as a campaign. So there is some level of irony that you would be coming in here and making comments about liars when the fact is that you are lying to the Australian public, you are lying to older Australians, you are trying to scare older Australians into voting for you in an absolutely shameless campaign, no regard whatsoever for those older Australians who are scared by the kind of tactics you use. It is absolutely disgraceful. So maybe you should have a look at uh, some of the things that, that you're doing, because this government has a proud track record in government. Over the last three years, we have achieved some extraordinary things in some extraordinary times. You know, we, have, we sit here today you know, with 1.1 million more Australians in work than when the pandemic hit. You know, we stand here today with a, an unemployment rate of 4.2%. I can remember, I think it was uh, uh, Mr Chalmers who made the comment, this government, before the pan when the pandemic started, will be judged about how many people become unemployed during the pandemic. You will be singularly judged about unemployment. Well, I would have thought that a 4.2 per cent unemployment rate, a prediction from many uh, economists and, and leading lights in Australia, that, that that potentially could have a three in front of it by the end of the year. Uh, I think that we've probably passed Mr Chalmers' test 
of making sure that we protected Australians' jobs through the pandemic. And we did this because we put in place JobKeeper. We supported other Australians with the coronavirus supplement to help Australians through this pandemic and, in doing so, ensured that our economy was strong and was able to rebound after the pandemic had gone through. So to come in here with these pathetic stunts as the start of an election campaign makes the Australian Greens just look like the disgrace they really are. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. It is amazing, isn't it, that the Greens want to call a vote of no confidence. We see the Labor Party adopting the Greens' policies. We see the Liberal Party adopting the Greens' policies. We see the current Prime Minister in the previous election campaign smashing the Labor Party because they were in favour of a 2050 net zero policy. And now it's part of the Liberal Nationals policy. So it looks like the Greens have no confidence in a government that is adopting Greens policies. The Greens support forcibly injecting people against their will. The Greens have no data which to back their climate claims that are now impoverishing people and threatening coal miners' jobs in the Hunter Valley and in Queensland, a major part of Queensland's economy, and stumping the whole economy if we follow down that path as the government is going. They lie because they say that the temperatures are rising. The temperatures have been flat since 1995, once one compensates for the El Nino and La Nina. They're impoverishing the poor, they're misleading the country. So I have very little confidence in the government, but I've got even less confidence in the Labor Greens alternative. The government, the Prime Minister leading the government says that there are no vaccine mandates in this country. That is a lie. It's a dishonest government. Senator Birmingham, the leader of the government in the Senate, said that the government has presided over lower fatalities. Another falsity. Taiwan has just skittled us in terms of the way they protected their vulnerable people and the people with COVID. They've got a much lower fatality rate, about 4.5 times lower than we have, or rather ours is 4.5 times higher than Taiwan's, because Taiwan has got a management plan for, for the virus. The Sen Senator Birmingham said, we have higher injection rates, and he was proud of that proud of coercing everyday Australians, forcing them by denying food to their kids to get an injection. I was at a protest last week in Brisbane. The protest leader went over to the police supervising us. And the police said, keep going. We've got to get away from this control. And one of the policemen said he was injected. And the protest leader, Dan McDonald, a wonderful emergency services worker, said, how do you feel? And I'll always remember this. A grown man saying, owned. He feels owned. Owned. What a debilitating thing for any man or woman to say. And yet I can understand that. That's not his fault. He had to put food on his kid's table. It's this government's fault, ably supported by Labor and the Greens. There is no plan for managing this COVID. It's been completely mismanaged, completely mismanaged. They've abandoned the vulnerable, abandoned the desperate. They've withdrawn a proven treatment in ivermectin from access to the Australian citizens. This is the first time in our country's history when healthy people have been injected forcibly it's the first time when healthy people have been injected with something that can kill them and is killing them. And it's the first time a government has withdrawn a treatment in ivermectin that is proven safe, effective, affordable. This is, this is a government in which I have very little faith, but it's a government that, is have, that, is, that actually shines because they haven't quite adopted the, like, the Greens' policies. I oppose Senator Waters' motion to stand aside, standing, stand aside standing orders because it will have no effect. It's a stunt. It gives her time to misrepresent reality yet again. And Pauline Hanson and I, Senator Hanson and I, do not vote for stunts. We will be opposing the setting aside of standing orders. Senator Steele, John. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. During this great COVID-19 pandemic, the Australian community, disabled people, older Australians, First Nations people, young people needed their government. Needed their government to listen to them and to act, to provide help. And over the last two years, this Morrison government, time and time again, have failed, have let the Australian community down. The Australian community said, let us have vaccinations. Let them get to the people that need them. Let's get it in quick. Let's learn from the failures of other jurisdictions around the world as they've battled the pandemic. And the Morrison government let us down. The Australian community said, let us have income supports so that we can focus on getting better rather than worrying about where our next meal comes from. And the Morrison government let the community down. The, the community said, let us access for everyone the basics that we need to be safe during the pandemic. Let us access rat tests and masks a proper ventilation in our schools to keep our kids safe, and the Morrison government let the community down. Failure compounded failure, and the outcome was people put at risk, people dying. Disabled people in this country will never forgive this feckless government for their disgraceful failure to keep that community safe, to keep our community safe. We will never forgive you, nor will the older Australians of this country, nor will the First Nations people of this country, nor will the immunocompromised of this country for propagating the absolute lie, the total misrepresentation that our lives are acceptable to be lost in this pandemic, that anybody with an underlying condition can be and should be written off as collateral damage. You have done so much harm in your time here, so much good work that needed to be done has gone undone. So much time has been squandered. The work of so many dedicated community members during this pandemic, attempting to keep each other safe, has been undermined by the reality that this government sees human lives far more in dollars and cents than it does in inherent human value. For all these reasons and so much more, this government divided, this government benighted, this government failed and rambling into ruin must now be swept from this place. A lack of confidence does not nearly cover it. Condemnation and allocation to the dustbin of history is all that you deserve. May you go there and never be thought of nor spoken of again. I will now put the question. The question is that the suspension of standing orders as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The no's have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. Stop the bells. Stop the bells. <laughs> the question is that the suspension of standing orders be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, teller for the eyes, and Senator Davey, teller for the nose. There being 27 ayes, 31 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I'll give senators a few moments and then I will call the clerk to call on business.
Could I ask perhaps a temporary chair to... Only for five minutes, though. Can I ask senators to take their seats or, or leave the chamber quickly and quietly? Clark. Government Business Orders of the Day Number 1, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform, Maves Law Bill 2021, Second Reading Debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to begin my contribution. Uh, obviously, I'll only get a few more minutes uh, before we go into 90-second statements and we'll resume after that. But I do rise to speak on the mitochondrial donation law reform, Maves Law Bill 2021. Uh, while I represent the Shadow Minister for Health in this chamber, I offer my support for this bill as an individual senator, not on behalf of the Labor Party opposition. Uh, it has been decided by the Labor caucus that the debate and vote for this bill will be a matter of conscience for our members. This bill has been referred to as Maeve's Law after Maeve Hood. Maeve, at the time this bill was introduced, was a five-year-old girl living in Minister Hunt's electorate. Maeve, at 18 months old, was diagnosed with Lee syndrome, a severe type of mitochondrial disease. Maeve, by all reports, is a bright, bubbly child, but struggles daily with the challenging medical issues arising from her disease. Maeve is one of thousands of Australians that suffer from mitochondrial disease. In fact, it is estimated that one in 200 people, or more than 120,000 Australians, may carry genetic changes that put them at risk for developing mitochondrial disease or other related symptoms, such as deafness, diabetes, or seizures during their lifetimes. Despite its prevalence, it's only in the last few decades that we have really begun to understand mitochondrial disease and its impact. Mitochondrial disease, or mito as it's commonly called, is a very serious genetic disorder that affects mitochondria in our body's cells. Mitochondria, often referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, process oxygen and convert the food, food we eat into energy. Mito happens when genetic mutation within the mitochondria causes it to not function as it should, starving cells of energy. Mitochondrial disease is caused by a defect in the mitochondrial DNA of an embryo, which is a type of DNA passed on only through the mother, that is, passed on through the egg cells rather than the sperm cells. Mito is a destructive and debilitating disease and can lead to multiple organ failure and death. Mito is a disease that often proves fatal for very young children. Up to 30 children born in Australia each week are at risk of developing mild to moderately disabling mitochondrial disease, while at least one Australian child born each week will develop a severe or life-threatening form of mitochondrial disease. It is proven very difficult to diagnose due to the range in severity and ways it can present, and there are currently very few effective treatments against mito and, as yet, no cure. Which leads me to the purpose of this bill. The Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill seeks to allow for the staged introduction of mitochondrial donation techniques in Australia under a strict regulatory framework. Mitochondrial donation is an in vitro fertilisation technique to prevent transmission of maternally inheritable mitochondrial disease from mother to child. Maternally inheritable mitochondrial disease refers to forms of this disease caused by changes in the mitochondrial DNA, which a child inherits only from its mother. This form of mitochondrial disease is the cause of approximately half of mitochondrial disease, and mitochondrial donation can assist in reducing the risk of mothers passing it on to their children. 
Mitochondrial donation involves transferring nuclear genetic material from the affected mother's egg into a donor egg that has had its nuclear DNA removed and retains only its healthy mitochondrial DNA. It is important here to note the distinction between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. Mitochondrial DNA, while incredibly important for the smooth functioning of cells, represents a tiny fraction of our genetic material. Almost all of our genetic material is nuclear DNA, contributed equally by the mother and father. These are the more than 20,000 genes that make up our character, appearance and other qualities that form us as individuals. Mitochondrial donation does not alter the DNA that makes us individuals. The procedure only targets the tiny fraction of DNA that helps to convert food and oxygen into energy. While this procedure can be performed in a number of ways, the two techniques under consideration within this bill are maternal spindle transfer and pro-nuclear transfer. Maternal spindle transfer means the transfer of the nuclear DNA from the mother into the donor egg, which happens before the fertilisation of the egg. It happens before the donor's egg is fertilised by the father's sperm. The second te technique, pro-nuclear transfer, involves both eggs, both the donor's egg and the mother's egg being fertilised. The mother's nuclear DNA is removed from her fertilised egg and inserted in the into the donor's fertilised egg, which has its pro-nuclear DNA Senator removed. Thank you, Senator Watt. You shall be in continuation. It being now 1.30, I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, today, thousands of shifts in aged care are going unfilled every week. Vulnerable residents are suffering appalling conditions and aged care workers are at breaking point. This is the Morrison government's aged care system at work in Australia today. And now, after nine years of Morrison government neglect, we're resorting to sending the troops into aged care. The Prime Minister should have listened to the experts years ago. He should have acted on the Royal Commission's urgent call for more aged care workers and proper pay to keep the dedicated aged care workers that we have. But in the middle of this crisis, instead of delivering a real plan to properly value these workers, the Prime Minister decided to insult them with a last-minute pre-election $400 bonus payoff. I asked three aged care workers what they thought about it. Julie told me this bonus is just meant as a bribe. Jude called it a desperate bid for votes. Elizabeth said it is insulting. And she also said, and I quote, the Prime Minister should spend a week in a facility, first as a resident, then another in our shoes. And if he is not heartbroken and exhausted after that, then he has no soul. The Prime Minister has had nine years to listen to the experts, nine years to respect aged care workers like Julie, like Elizabeth, like Jude, with a real plan, a long-term plan to value our aged care workers and their residents. The Prime Minister has dismally failed aged care workers. He has tragically failed aged care residents. And he has failed all Australians who expect their government to pass the most basic of tests protecting Thank our you, elderly. Senator Walsh. Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, I, President, beg your pardon. I rise today to speak on the cashless debit card, as I have in many times in this place. But I rise today with an update for the Senate, one that I'm particularly proud of and one that I've been working on personally. Last week, I joined my friend from the other place, the member for O'Connor, Rick Wilson, in the goldfields to open up the first cashless debit card employment support hub. We on this side of the House, or this side of the chamber, believe in a strong welfare system that supports people into work. The ca cashless debit card, much maligned by those opposite, is part of this system. Now, while the CDC is proving to be a more responsible delivery of welfare payments, it's not the destination. Economic independence through employment is the goal. Now, employment won't change everything, but without it, nothing will change. 
To this end, the CDC is being further supported in the goldfields by a network of hubs designed to help those who need specialist assistance to break into the workforce. Whether this is something as simple as obtaining a driver's licence, sourcing necessary ID or accessing the services of an interpreter to better understand the prerequisite requirements, these services and assistance will be available. And extra funding has also been committed to alcohol and drug rehabilitation services. Another key role of the hubs is to engage with employers in the region to source employment opportunities. Employers are screaming out for suitably trained and capable employees. They are eager to work with the hubs to make sure that they understand their requirements and assist them in sourcing quality candidates and then supporting them on the job. The Morrison government has made just, over, just under $2.4 million available for these services. And I was very pleased to be able to lead the consultation that has seen these services delivered. I thank the local governments across these areas and I thank them for their support and stepping up to the plate. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Wish Wilson. Australians have around 100 days before this nation goes into one of the most important, if not most important, federal election in this country's history. For those Australians who care about the future and future generations of this country, who care about the environment, who care about our oceans, who care about climate action, this is it. This is your opportunity to cast a vote for climate action by voting Greens. We look at the record temperatures we've seen in West Australia this summer, just another summer of record temperatures. But did we notice that off the coast of Sydney and at the Great Barrier Reef, we had the warmest water temperatures ever recorded in history, another record from burning fossil fuels. I'm proud to be part of a party that is keeping it very simple this election. We need to stop all new fossil fuel development in this country. And that's why our leader, Adam Bant, made it very clear to the national media this week that that is going to be our ask in the next parliament. The Greens will be introducing a Fight for Our Coastlines bill that will do exactly that. Last year, 80,000 square kilometres of our ocean was handed over by this government for more exploration, more oil and gas drilling, putting our coastlines at risk. The Greens will be introducing this bill as soon as we can. And I'm once again proud to be standing up for coastal communities and those who love our oceans right around this country and saying at this time in history we have no time left to waste except to take the strongest possible action on reducing our emissions, phasing out and ending all fossil fuel exploration and doing the right Senator thing Wish -Wilson, for future your time generations has of this country. Senator Pratt. Madam Acting Deputy President, I draw the attention of the Senate today to the recent decision of the Morrison government to cut funding to peak health organisations across a range of health sectors. Governments, communities, health sectors rely on these trusted, credible uh, uh, services and peak bodies to provide advice and leadership. Yet in 2021, the government cut the number of organisations funded and also cut out a number of well-established organisations from funding uh, at all under their peak organisation funding. At a time when we need mental health support and it couldn't be more pressing, the government ended its peak funding for Mental Health Australia and Lifeline. This has made all the worse coming just weeks after the Minister for Health assured organisations like the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations and the National Association of People Living with HIV Australia of their commitment to see an end to HIV transmission in Australia. We have seen great goals, gains made in ending HIV transmission in Australia, and in doing so, NAPWA and AFEO have been heavily relied upon by the government in meeting those goals. This is not the time to cut their peak funding at a time when we are still to reach zero transmissions here in Australia, a goal that is entirely achievable, but only with the support of 
Uh, these organisations who have a great track record have been there since the beginning of the HIV uh, pandemic and who bring a voice, the voice of affected communities, to the table. And without that voice, governments cannot possibly deliver on these goals. Senator Pratt, thank you. Um, Senator Hanson, remotely. Thank you very much. Today I put on the record One Nation's demand for the establishment of a Royal Commission into the management of the COVID-19 pandemic by Australian governments. It is essential there is a comprehensive, honest and transparent examination of how federal, state and territory governments have handled this pandemic. Because it has affected every single one of us. Many people have died, families have been separated, the education of our children has been severely disrupted. Thousands of Australians have lost their jobs. Countless businesses have been closed, in many cases permanently. Hundreds of billions of taxpayers' dollars have been spent. Military personnel and resources have been deployed in Australia, with yet more set to reinforce an exhausted aged care sector in crisis. How can we not have a Royal Commission into this unprecedented event? The Australian people deserve nothing less. If we don't learn and understand the mistakes of this pandemic, we are That's doomed right. to repeat them. Last year, this Senate denied, yes, denied Australians a parliamentary inquiry into my bill outlawing COVID-19 vaccine discrimination. You denied Australians their say about the pandemic of discrimination you unleashed upon us. You denied them a say because you were so frightened your conspiracy to silence the Australian people would be exposed. The people deserve their say to an open and honest accounting of this wretched pandemic. The people deserve to see what justified the decisions which have destroyed so many lives these past two terrible years. One Nation will never stop fighting for a Royal Commission into this pandemic. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to shift the focus. I want to talk about not what the media are focused on, but what the nationals and the government are focused on, and that is doing what we were elected to do, <clears throat> creating jobs and supporting businesses. Three years ago, when I entered this place, we had seen 28 years of consecutive growth in Australia. COVID threw us a curveball. But it has also given us a unique opportunity to reset and refocus on driving productivity here in our country. And that is what the Nationals are focused on doing before and post the coming election. Key to this is grabbing the opportunities that are presented before us by our low carbon future. Australia is already reaping the benefits of demand for more rare earth minerals and lithium to build components of solar panels, wind turbines and solar and electric vehicle batteries. This mining adds to our already highly successful resources sector, which has underpinned our economy through COVID, along with the agricultural sector. We are also facilitating our farmers to be able to access new ways to garner carbon credits, new ways to manage their land without threat or fear. Our good commodity prices, our healthy economy despite COVID, our government's job-ready training and apprenticeship packages have all led to contributing to our unemployment at an all-time low—4.2 per cent. That is our government's focus, that is the National Party's focus, and that should be our nation's focus. And that's what we are striving for. Thank you. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Of everything the ABC is known for, nothing is more important to Australians and to Australian democracy than its news service. All Australians depend on the ABC for its public interest journalism. But these services are particularly important in regional areas that would otherwise go without any local news coverage. This coverage is absolutely vital. Vital for Australians who live outside big metro areas and want to know what is going on in their communities and what their local governments and representatives are doing. And the ABC's regional journalists do incredible work. 
They have won literally hundreds of awards for their coverage over the last decade. They have exposed corruption and wrongdoing and kept regional Australians safe and informed throughout times of crisis. Funding for this work comes from the Enhanced News Gathering Program, which sits outside the ABC's base funding. Why? Well, because it is not base funding, it is not automatically rolled over each funding cycle, which means regional journalists have no certainty whatsoever about their ongoing employment. The ABC struggles to attract and retain journalists who need security in their careers and their finances. The government recently announced that they would extend the program for another three years and increase the funding. I've been advocating for this for years and emphatically welcome that commitment. But I would like the government to bite the bullet and roll this into ABC's base funding. This program deserves to be made permanent. It provides incredible value for money and an essential service to regional Australia. So let's make it a commitment today not to let down regional Australia in the future. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. While our students are preparing to return to school in Tasmania, the student, teachers and community of Hillcrest Primary School in Devonport and the wider Tasmanian community remember Peter Dot, Jalala Jane Marie Jones, Addison Stewart, Jai Sheehan, Zane Mellor and Chase Harrison. Their families now live forever with the tragic event that occurred on the 16th of December last year when these six young children were playing on a jumping castle inflatable balls at the end of their year breakup. Something happened that day that threw the castle and balls in the air, causing these children to fall from a great height. The community was rocked by the death of these six young lives. Tragically, the parents of these six young children will live with the loss of their child forever, a grief not all of us understand. My deepest condolences to the families. The staff, the other children, parents, the first responders were all faced with such a tragic event that they will carry with them always. The Devonport community and wider community of Tasmania, of Australia, and in fact the globe reached out with gestures of love and support. For the Hillcrest community, the start of school this year will be unlike any other. The school is working hard to manage the return to school carefully and sensitively. I send to the Hillcrest community my thoughts and best wishes in healing the loss and hurt that will be present for a very long time, as many of us still come to terms with that tragic day. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Lambie. Deputy President, you know that feeling the big parties aren't working for you anymore? I think I found the reason why. It's pretty simple, actually, because normal people just can't afford them. Last week we found out the Liberal and Labor raked in tens of millions of dollars in hidden money in the 12 months to July 2021. That's a lot of very full brown paper bags. Actually, it's so full, it's more, it's more filling than a tontine pillow, let's be honest. The worst of it is that we'll never know where the money came from or what it bought, but we know it's buying something, absolutely. No one in their right mind is handing over millions of dollars because they want Australian democracy to run better. That's not happening. They are not there. They are not there for the country. It's all about self-interest. I can assure you that much. Let's be honest. Donors are dishing it out to look after their own skins. Money buys access. It buys influence and it buys outcomes. And it shouldn't be that way. But that's the way it is. That's where we are in 2022 in Parliament in Australia. I'm fighting to stamp out the Canberra corruption and our candidates at the next election are too. We have the chance to get democracy back into voters' hands where it belongs. It's the right thing to do, but it's an uphill battle. We don't have secret money come from big business or big unions. We, have regular, we, we don't have mega bucks up our sleeves. We do what the Australian people expect us to do, to go and earn our seats. We do not buy them. Buying seats in the Jackie Lambie network it's just not spoken of because it will never happen. Not while I'm there. Not why it wears my family name. We earn them because that is the Australian way, with our boots on. I've had a lot of people from across the country coming to me and say they want big money out of politics. And do they want it out of politics? Absolutely. It's time for big money 
political donations to get out of politics. It doesn't belong Senator here. Senator Lambie, your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you and welcome back, Madam Acting Deputy Thank President. Uh, last year, I rose to speak about why our Defence Forces should be proud of their efforts in Afghanistan. Today, I rise to speak of the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding, unfolding there since the Taliban has taken control of the country again. 24 million Afghans are in need of humanitarian assistance, more than half the population, including 13 million children. As a result, Afghanistan now has the highest number of people in emergency food insecurity in the world. Over 1 million Afghan children are at risk of dying due to severe malnutrition. Australia's commitment of $100 million in humanitarian assistance should be one we are proud of, but this should be delivered through the World Food Program, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and the United Nations Population Fund. It is these multilateral organisations that are best placed to address the humanitarian crisis. Some small NGOs have good local access in some parts of the country, but they can only do so much due to the precarious security environment, and we do not want to put their people in further harm. Yes, there are criticisms of how slow the UN and WFP have been to get aid to the Afghan people, and yes, they need to do more, but a two-track process is not the answer. And the Australian government is not willing to put their people at further risk. NGOs are used to working with the UN and should be encouraging them to get aid moving faster. The UN can use peacekeeping forces if necessary to ensure aid gets to the people. I thank the NGOs for their brave work and encourage them to work with the UN and WFP, not separate to it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you. If Russia invades the Ukraine, there will be huge consequences for Australia. The EU depends on, uh, on Russia for about a third of its gas supplies and would need alternate sources if there's a major conflict. Global gas prices will surge. Australia's big gas exporters and the government have rushed to offer additional LNG gas to the EU should Russia reduce or shut down the gas it supplies. But where will that leave our gas market? The government's ga domestic gas policy is a total failure. It's an absurdity that Australia a huge exporter of, ga of gas is now building import terminals. We export our cheap gas to the Asian market and we leave the expensive gas here for our manufacturers. In the best of times, uh, the gas market, uh, the, ga the gas cartel, makes sure our manufacturers are at disadvantage. We have to take action on this. And back in 2019, I talked to the government about this. And, they, and, and the need to have a reservation policy, which the government announced but has not implemented, something that's a breach of an undertaking given to me uh, in writing by the government in June 2019. Two and a half years later, that's another betrayal of this government, always putting big business ahead of manufacturers and Australian consumers. So we're left vulnerable now to any disruption in the global market. If there's war in, in the Ukraine, Australian consumers, manufacturers and households will take another hit from a spike in gas prices, while the big exporters will be laughing all the way to the bank on our gas. That's apparently the government's concept of national security. What a joke. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, and also welcome you back. It's great to see you uh, back in Canberra. Well, we stand here now nearly 10 years after the election of this tired, stale LNP government. And what have we got to show as a country for 10 years of LNP government? We have an aged care system in crisis. We have Australian wages not keeping up with the cost of living. We have GP shortages right across the country. And any business you talk to will tell you that they are screaming for skilled workers because of the skill shortages this government has presided over. On any measure, this government has been a complete failure, and it has a long list of things that it should be doing in the run-up to this election. But instead, what is this government focused on? What they're focused on is leaking text messages against each other. 
That is what is occupying the minds of the most senior people in this country as we come to the end of this term. This government has become a bad episode of mean girls, leaking on each other, spreading rumours about each other, rather than focusing on the things that matter to the Australian people. What's happening around my home state of Queensland while this government just chooses to leak on each other? We've got the Jetta Gardens aged care facility south of Brisbane in complete meltdown, with 15 deaths from COVID of aged residents and 182 residents and staff testing positive for COVID. Further north in Rockhampton, people are waiting a month to see a GP, with specialist costs spiralling out of control under this government's watch. In Gracemere, outside Rocky, we've got GP clinics refusing to take on patients because they can't employ enough doctors, and in Emerald, it takes six months to get a psychologist appointment. These are the things that this LNP government should have fixed in nearly 10 years, rather than just spreading rumours and sending texts about each Senator other. Watt, your time has elapsed. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I received a text message from a trans woman this morning. She said, thoughts with you today as this hideous bill goes to debate. To be honest, she said, I'm scared. I'm scared of the already tenuous access to health care and support I have being further eroded. I'm scared of the increased abuse I will face for just walking down the street. Being trans is an ever-present reality of always having to be on your guard, always wondering if that next person will abuse you or attack you. We are so scared we are seriously thinking of leaving Australia. That is the reality of this hate-filled religious discrimination bill. It will increase discrimination and hate speech. It will allow hurtful and harmful discrimination to be made against LGBTIQA plus people, against women, against people with disabilities, against people with minority faiths. And it's not what the Australian community want. We saw the backlash last week when the City Point Christian College wanted to impose appalling discrimination and homophobic and transphobic attitudes upon their communities. Yet in response, our government isn't proposing if anything to address that, all, they, all Morrison is got, Prime Minister Morrison is going to do is to remove the ability to expel same-sex attracted students, throwing trans kids under the bus. Prime Minister, this isn't fixing it. Trans kids would still be able to be expelled on the basis of their very identity. And sc schools will still be able to make the lives of queer students absolute hell, let alone queer staff let alone workers in other workplaces who can be discriminated against in finding work, let alone people of minority faiths who will be discriminated against. For the sake of protecting all people's rights, for the well-being of all Australians, this bill must not pass. Senator D. Smith. Thank you very much and uh, welcome back to you, Senator Billick. Thank you. Over the summer, I had the opportunity to travel again across Western Australia's Kimberley region. And those of us who are familiar with the Kimberley will know it for its rugged charm, uh, its waterways, particularly in the wet season that we're experiencing now, and of course, most particularly, the resilience of people living across Kimberley communities. But I'm disappointed to have to share with the Senate today what is a new and emerging challenge for those people that choose to make the Kimberley and the communities across the Kimberley their home and the place of their small businesses. During the travels, I was surprised to hear the depth of concern and frustration and disappointment from people who have lived in Kimberley towns and communities for years upon years, in some cases since their birth and the stories they are now telling me of an escalation in crime and violence not seen before. Not seen before. Now, of course, we know there are many politicians who would be quick to point the finger at other politicians about the need to do more. But in standing before the Senate today, I know that my colleagues, Senator Dodson and Senator Cox, who have great passion for my home state of Western Australia and great passion for Northern Australia, are interested in working together to make sure that we can tackle these issues. Everyone will come to this debate with their own philosophical view. I'm someone who believes that we should trust the data first. Let's have a look at what the data is telling us. I don't believe that more money is the answer. I do believe that greater coordination between state and federal officials is important. I do believe there is a greater responsibility that the federal government can take on some particular matters, and I'll name one of those matters. It's very clear in what's been shared to me by local people that social media is emboldening 
the attitudes of some very, very young people. TikTok, I'm not familiar with it, but this is an opportunity for the federal government to think laterally, to exercise much greater influence over these Senator important Smith, but terrible issues. Your time has expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr. President. The Amnesty International report published last week confirms Israeli policies against Palestinians fit the definition of the international crime of apartheid. We are witnessing these policies enacted on a large scale through mass seizures of Palestinian land and property, forcible transfers, drastic movement restrictions and the denial of nationality and citizenship. It's also seen on an individual level through forced family home expulsions and discriminatory judicial processes. The report follows a long list of other institutions and human rights organisations, international, Palestinian and Israeli, that have analysed and confirmed the policies of successive Israeli governments constitute apartheid. APAN Vice President Nasser Mishni is a descendant of Palestinian refugees who fled their homes during the 1948 Nakba. He has experienced the apartheid policies firsthand as a Palestinian living in the diaspora. Apartheid meant that when my father passed away and his dying wish was to be buried next to his mother, less than 10 kilometres from Jerusalem in the West Bank, I had to call the Israeli embassy for permission, Mr Majni said. Our request was denied and my father is buried in Melbourne. Amnesty International is calling on Israel to dismantle this cruel system, and the international community must pressure it to do so. Senator Lyons, it being 2 p.m., time for this debate has expired, and we will move on to questions. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Tuesday 8 February, and tomorrow, Wednesday 9 February 2022, for medical reasons. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Government Services and the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Education and Youth. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Minister, is the aged care system in crisis, yes or no? The Minister for Aged Care Services, uh, <laughs> Minister Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank the Senator for the question and uh, uh, attempting to answer it for me. Uh, Mr President, I'm not here to play word games. The aged care sector, the aged care sector is uh, suffering extreme difficulty because of COVID-19, particularly the Omicron uh, strain at the moment. There's been significant commentary with respect to the state of the sector over the last week since Senate estimates last week. And yes, Senator, uh, the Prime Minister made his statements and views known as well. Mr President, my focus is to work to support the sector to help them to get through the current situation. It is extremely difficult, Mr President, and the work that I've been doing all through uh, the oh, pandemic, no. Mr President, and let's remember we are in a global pandemic here, is to work with the sector to assist them oh, to, no, get through the, to, to get through Senator the current Watt. situation. Will Mr President, uh, the ANMF, to take up the interjection from Senator Watt, described it as a crisis in 2012 when you were in government. So, Mr President, so let's, let, let's, let's, let's take that. Oh, so, so, no. so some of us remember that. And, and Mr. No, President, no. we were the ones that had the courage. Oh, we were no. the ones that had the courage to call a royal commission, no matter how difficult that might have been for us as a government. And we were the ones Order. that have responded comprehensively to the royal commission, Mr. President. And the only response we've had from the Labor Party and Mr. Albanese is that we'll spend more than the other lot. Twelve months after the royal commission's reported, and that's all we've got from Order. Labor, Mr. President. We'll spend more than them, Mr. President. We have, committed, we have committed over $18 billion to reform this sector. We've commenced the process of, we've commenced the process of reforming and legislating the reform Order. through this government, Mr President. So we're not interested in word games. We know how tough it is in the sector now, right now, Mr President, and we're doing everything that we possibly can to assist the sector to work, them, work their way through this extremely difficult environment. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
Has the minister told the Prime Minister that he was wrong when he acknowledged the aged care system was in crisis? Minister. Why can't you acknowledge that? Uh, Mr President, again, as I said, I'm, I'm not interested in playing Labor's uh, word games, Mr Order. President. Uh, my focus and the Prime Minister's focus, I might add, in all of our conversations Order. in relation to aged care is how we assist the sector, work their way, work, work their way through the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That's been our focus all along. Have we got everything right, Mr President? No, we haven't. And we've admitted that. We've had the courage to admit that. We haven't played nasty personal games like the Labor Party have. We haven't gone down that track. Not a constructive, not a single constructive discussion or contribution from those on the other side, Mr. President. But we have put all of the resources at government uh, towards the support of the aged care sector, and, Mr. President, that's what we will continue to do. That's what we'll continue to do. Uh, we we Order. are very, very on comfortable continuing Senator to work McAllister. cooperatively with the aged care sector, the providers who we talk to on a regular basis and their peaks in, these, in the case of Minister, helping them to work their Minister, way through the current situation. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, Thank a you, second Ms. supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. While hundreds of older Australians in his care had di have died and more than 1,000 aged care homes were dealing with outbreaks, this minister went to the cricket for three days. Yep. When this minister thinks going to the cricket is more important than protecting elderly Australians in his care, isn't it time the minister resigned? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. And, and again, uh, Senator Gallagher knows exactly what I was doing um, and when I was doing it. And, and, and she continuously and dishonestly, Mr President, uh, dishonestly misinterprets Senator misrepresents Watt. the circumstance. She knows that I spent most of Friday working on trying to deal with the issues that aged care were facing at the time, including blockages in supply chains that are, might admit a, a lot of industry around the country were dealing with that at, at the Order time, which was inhibiting land. the supply of, of crucial supplies out to raid aged care sectors. Uh, Mr President, uh, I, I made some Senator decisions Watt. with respect to uh, the events that I attended over, those, over that period of time, Mr. President, but I was always available and always continue to work Order. in respect of the support of the aged care sector. People will criticise me as they will, Mr. President. I have to take uh, that on the chin, Minister, Mr. President. But I Minister, your time has expired. I'm not going to call Senator Bragg until there is silence in the chamber. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is taking action to strengthen the economic recovery and create jobs as we move to the next phase of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Order. Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Bragg for his question, and I know his uh, his relentless focus on how we help Australians through uh, the challenges caused by COVID-19. And globally, we've seen yet another wave uh, of the challenges resulting from COVID-19, just as we see the waves of COVID-19 continue. The most recent waves that have challenged the globe, of course, have been the Omicron wave, seeing huge spike in case numbers right around the world but, thankfully, a less severe variant than has previously been faced. I want to thank all Australians for what they have done over the past two years, but particularly during the recent summer season in the face of the global challenges of COVID-19. Together, the resilience the efforts of Australians have achieved remarkable outcomes. Some of the lowest fatality rates in the world, some of the highest vaccination rates in the world, some of the strongest economic outcomes in the world. More than 51 million vaccinations have been applied across our country. More than 90, around 94 per cent of those aged over 16 fully vaccinated and more than 9 million people having had a booster. Watt, now, Mr Senator President, Lines. there are no silver bullets to dealing with COVID-19. We have to continue to work through the ever-changing circumstances. Billy. And as we do that, we are able to continue to work towards the normalisation of the treatment of covid as we live more effectively with COVID with a highly vaccinated population. From the 21st of February, just 13 days, we will see our international borders reopen to tourists. 
giving a much needed lift to our tourism industry, a further step in our economic plan that has kept Australians secure in their jobs, kept Australian businesses stronger and has enabled our economy to withstand its biggest test in decades. We are one of only nine countries in the world to still have a AAA credit rating intact, even with the spending incurred through COVID. Our inflation is well below that of other advanced economies. Our unemployment rate is at a 13-year low. These economic outcomes are facts and they're testament to the fact that Australia's policies have worked to help keep Australians safer and more secure. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. What has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Australia's employment situation and what are the expectations for the year ahead? Minister. Mr President, despite all the challenges that have been faced, more Australians are in work today than ever before. More Australians are in work today than ever before. Indeed, 1.7 million additional jobs have been created during the time of our government. Unemployment today stands in its last recorded figures at 4.2 per cent. That, Mr President, is a 13-year low. These are economic outcomes that would very much be the envy of so many other nations of the world. Just one year ago, unemployment was at 6.6 per cent. It's now at 4.2 per cent. We see women's workforce participation at its highest level and more than one million additional Australian women in jobs than was the case uh, when our government was elected. Youth unemployment has fallen to its lowest level since 2008. Again, investment in trades, in apprenticeships has helped to drive outcomes there, protecting young Australians from the ravages that previous recessions and economic Minister, downturns have inflicted upon them. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, a second supplementary. Thank you very much. What support is the government providing businesses to allow them to grow and continue to employ Australians? Minister. The last two budgets our government has handed down have been focused on the economic recovery plans to keep Australia's businesses strong, safe, secure, to keep Australians in jobs and to help us work through the continued uncertainties of COVID. And they have worked, Mr President, they have worked in terms of supporting those businesses, hundreds of thousands of livelihoods and Australian businesses. Our continued support through tax relief for Australians, more than 11 million Australian families enjoying the benefits of lower income taxes, $1.5 billion a month extra going into the pockets of those Australian households, Mr President. The support of the Home Builder Program and the Home Guarantee Scheme, seeing more than 300,000 Australians helped into home ownership even in these challenging international times. Our $110 billion pipeline of infrastructure projects, the 220,000 trade apprentices in training, these are the consequence of targeted, effective policies that we have put in place to help keep Australians secure. Senator Billock. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. How many Australians in aged care have died from COVID-19 since the 1st of January 2022? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, since, since the 1st of January this year, uh, there have been 12,088 infections into residential aged care in Australia. That's residents who have contracted the virus. And, uh, Mr. President, of those, uh, of the latest data that I've received, 587 have passed away, Mr. President. And I might add, might add at this point that. Um, that 12,000, just over 12,000 infections in uh, 2022 is off the back of over 2 million infections in the Australian community. Over 2 so, so, so that's, uh, that's off the back of over 2 million infections in the Australian community. Uh, and, and, and Mr President, uh, the, the, the interjections from the other side demonstrate that the Labor Party aren't interested in the reality of the, of the circumstance out there. They're only interested Senator in playing their cheap, nasty, dirty personal politics. That's what they do. Um, that's what they're. That's what, Mr. President. And, and can I say I, I would like to put on the record, Mr. President, here today, um, my thanks and congratulations to the sector and the workforce for the work that they have done um, through the pandemic, and and Mr. President. Their improved performance. Order. Their improved performance, Mr. President. Mr. President. So, in in 2020, 7.5% of infections in this country were in aged care. 
in 2022, 7.5% of infections were in aged care. This year, Mr. President, that number is 0.6% of infections. Order. And that is a result, Mr. President, of the work that the sector has done in conjunction with government, Mr. President. Uh, that, is, that, that is due to the, the infection control leads that were put in there and funded by the government back in 2020. It's in the result of the infection Order. control training that, that uh, aged care workers and providers have put in place. It's, it's, in Minister, it's put in place, Mr. Minister, President. Your time has expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How many Australians in aged care who died from COVID-19 since January had not had their booster shots? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, Mr President, as uh, we indicated to the, the, um, the committee, COVID committee last week, um, uh, that, that data is not available to us at this point in time because we are because of lags in reporting uh, through the state um, committees of births, deaths and marriages. To, to ensure that we can receive that data, Mr President, as you've said, Senator Keneally, uh, uh, we've put in place uh, a, a, a group to a task force. Uh, to pull together that data and provide it to Order. the community, to the parliament, in a more timely way, Mr. President. It's very important information for us all to understand, Mr. President. Mr. President, but in terms of the boosters, in the context of the boosters, we started the booster program on the 8th of November last year. On the 12th of November, or thereabouts, we got advice to bring the dates forward. And on Christmas Eve, Mr. President, we got advice Minister, to bring it forward even further, Minister, which we have done. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Billick, a second. Oh, a point. Uh, it's a point of procedure, perhaps. I've noticed that the minister I'll, I'll give has you some regularly gone over Senator time. Keneally, sorry. A, po a, a point. Of, I apologise, Mr. President. A point of order, please. Go ahead, Senator Keneally. Thank you. I, I noticed that the minister has regularly gone over the time, and I'd draw your attention to that. I, I have called the minister at the time of the clock expiring. Senator Billick, second supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr President. A task force after 22 negative reports is pretty pathetic, really. Instead of fixing the supply of PPE, fixing workforce shortages and fixing the booster rollout, this minister, Senator Colbeck, went to the cricket for three days. How many Australians in aged care need to die before this minister, that you, Senator Colbeck, finally accept there's a crisis on his watch and resigns? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I was going to say it's nice to yeah, see absolutely. Senator Billick back um, after an absence, and, which it is. Um, thank you for the question. Mr President, uh, <laughs> what, Mr. President, Mr. President the, the focus of the government all the way through uh, the pandemic has to be, work, to be work with the health system, to work with the aged care sector to support both of those sectors and that's been one of the foundational Order. elements of our approach to managing the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a pandemic, Mr President. People will catch the virus and there will be the out, uh, um, inevitable, unfortunate outcomes of that, Mr President. Uh, we continue to work every day uh, to clear the issues up that crop up in relation to uh, the pandemic, Mr President. We've acknowledged publicly that we had some supply chain issues with supply of PPE. We've got uh, additional assistance to the national medical stockpile to support that. Uh, we've, we've supplied over 9 million rats to residential aged care centres since August to support them in their efforts, Mr Order. President, and we will continue to do that. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has said that he's committed to making workplaces safe. But Commissioner Jenkins' earlier report, Respect at Work, made clear that a positive duty on employers is critical to achieving that. Uh, your party voted against that, but then we were told at last estimates that consultation on the positive duty would start in December with a view to implementation by late March. We're now in the second week of February with only a handful of sitting days before an election and none of this has happened. How can women in this country have any confidence that this government is committed to making any workplace safe for them? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Waters uh, for her question and uh, and at the commencement. I acknowledge that uh, uh, that my colleague uh, Senator Cash and uh, and the government have been pursuing action across a range of areas in implementing uh, recommendations from the Respected Work Report, uh, a very valuable and important piece of work undertaken by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, in terms of uh, advancing um, uh, equality uh, and opportunity across Australian workplaces, and the government's comprehensive response there has been uh, released. Uh, Senator Waters' question you relates specifically to Recommendation 17, the, uh, the positive duty uh, recommendation, which the government's been clear uh, we believe requires further consultation to, uh, to assess how such a duty would operate effectively alongside existing duties that already exist under various work, health and safety laws uh, and indeed under the Sex Discrimination Act, uh, including the duties to ensure that additional complexity is not created for those seeking to use such protections. Uh, so we are working through those, uh, those consultation processes uh, to make sure uh, that any changes uh, that are put in place operate as intended and do not result in unnecessary duplication, confusion or uncertainty, uh, either for uh, employers or employees. Uh, the vicarious liability provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act and model work health and safety laws already place, uh, I'm advised, a positive duty on employers to protect workers from health and safety risks including psychosocial risks such as sexual harassment uh, so far as that is reasonably practicable. Employers must therefore already take reasonable and preventative steps such as implementing appropriate policies oh, oh, and providing pardon. Minister, please resume your seat. Is this a point of order, Senator Yes, Waters? reluctantly, um, President. I, I did go to the question of timing. I'm, I'm aware of everything else you've said, but I'm interested. You said consultation would be done and it would be implemented by March. Where is Senator it? Senator Waters, you've brought the minister's attention back to part of the question. The minister was being directly relevant to other parts of the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. As I indicated, my understanding is the consultation is, uh, is underway. Uh, I'm not advised in terms of any uh, uh, variations around timelines or the like on that matter, but we are certainly working through that process uh, as the other recommendations of respect to continue to be pursued. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks very much, President. This morning's statement committed to listening to survivors and staff, but the Prime Minister is reportedly not going to listen to Grace Tame or Brittany Higgins at the press club tomorrow. He's not even going to watch it on the telly. How can women in this country have any confidence that this government will actually listen to survivors? Do you think Australian women even believe a word the Prime Minister says anymore? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, you know, these are uh, important matters and important matters that I would hope could, uh, could exist and be discussed uh, above cheap political pot shots or, uh, uh, or point scoring uh, such as, uh, as occurs in the question there. Uh, from Senator Waters. Uh, I have uh, no doubt, Mr President, uh, no doubt that the Prime Minister uh, will indeed uh, be, uh, be seeking to ensure he understands the messages and views that are conveyed uh, in tomorrow's press club address, uh, as he does in terms of other statements of importance that are made uh, across the country. Uh, he recognises the, uh, the important work around respect at work, uh, which is why, under Prime Minister Morrison, our government has been pursuing uh, the vast majority of those recommendations. Some 42 of the 55 recommendations under Respect at Work have either been fully implemented or fully funded, and work is underway on all remaining recommendations. As we discussed this morning, it is now in relation Minister, to that other report of Minister, Kate Jenkins your set time standard. has expired. Senator Waters, a second supplementary question. Thank you, President. Despite government commitments that survivors would be invited to today's statement of acknowledgement address, We've heard from a number of survivors who participated in the review who didn't know about the statement until they heard about it in the media. This is not acceptable. What went wrong? And what message do you think that sends survivors? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Senator Waters, uh, I thank you earlier today, as I did everybody else across the chamber, uh, for the constructive way in which we engaged in these matters. Uh, I'm disappointed uh, in relation to that question, that you would raise it in that way. As I have said publicly today, uh, my office asked the Australian Human Rights Commission last week uh, to contact uh, all those that they had contact details for who had participated in Commissioner Jenkins's review. 
My understanding is that they did that, uh, Senator. That is my understanding. Uh, now, I can't speak for contacting those individuals because, as you well know, we put in place legal protections for all of those who participated. So the government had no way of contacting all of those who participated in the review. We did, as you knew I had said we would do, and as I had said publicly we would do, which was to ask the AHRC to do that, and my advice is that's what they did. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government economic plan is delivering new jobs across Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. And Mr President, this government, the Morrison government, we are a job-creating government. And when you look at the labour force figures in December, they were positive news for all Australians. They show that new businesses and new jobs are being created right across the country. Mr President, this government's economic plan has always been based around getting Australians into work, creating jobs and getting Australians off welfare and into work. And that is exactly what's happening as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. When you look at the evidence in relation to the employment figures, the unemployment rate has decreased to 4.2 per cent. That is now lower than when we came into office in 2013. The participation rate, that's Australians putting their hands up and saying, I'm ready, willing and able to work. It continues to be strong, remaining steady at 66.1 per cent. More than 60,000 jobs were created in the month of December. And that, of course, is because of those fantastic employers across Australia. What that means is that employment is now at a record high in Australia, with 13 million 242,000 Australians in work. There are, in fact, now 246,600 Australians in work than there was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. When you look to the employment to population ratio, that itself has increased to 63.3 per cent. And underemployment, people often ask about underemployment. That has now decreased, that is a good thing, to 6.6 per cent. So, Mr President, when we talk about putting in place the right policies, uh, the right policies so that businesses out there can prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, the statistics speak Minister, for themselves. your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how the government is helping young Australians find a job? Minister. Mr President, the government has been acutely focused on ensuring the scarring impact recessions have on young Australians were not felt in the COVID-19 induced recession. We have invested Watch. heavily, we have invested heavily, as we know and quite proudly, into the skills and training system. That has of course helped businesses to retain staff because quite often it's the young person the apprentice that is the first person let to go, and we've ensured that by our investment in the skills and training system, employers have been able to keep those young people and those apprentices on. And this, of course, further supports that pipeline of workers in Australia. We have invested by way of the boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, the supporting apprenticeship and training wage subsidy, and again, this has now ensured that Order. more Australians, more Australians have trade apprenticeships than ever before in recorded history. That is a good thing, Mr President, but it is because Minister, of the investments made Minister, by the coalition government. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. How is the government's plan helping Australians who want to work and secure employment? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, when you look at the evidence based on the policies that the coalition government have put in place, when we look at where we were at the outset of COVID-19 and where we are today, if you recall at the outset of COVID-19, Treasury was modelling at the height of COVID-19 that unemployment could potentially go as high as 15 per cent. What they were saying was two million Australians could have been out of work. And then you look at the policy response from the coalition government. Look at where we are now. 
in December 2021, the unemployment rate has dropped to 4.2 per cent. We're at near record high participation. That is a good thing. Over $300 billion in health and economic support provided through our economic plan has helped us to reach this point. Mr President, it is because of the policies put in place by the coalition government Minister, that Australians Minister, are in work. your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Since the 1st of January this year, Jetta Gardens Aged Care Home, south of Brisbane, has experienced a major COVID-19 outbreak. 15 residents have died, and a total of 100 residents and 82 staff have tested positive. When did booster vaccines first start being administered at Jetta Gardens? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, <coughs> Senator Watt is right. There has been a quite a significant outbreak um, at uh, Jetta Gardens, unfortunately, and the, uh, the numbers that he's quoted in his question are the latest figures that I've had. Unfortunately, Mr President, uh, I'm able to say that the situation at Jetta Gardens has stabilised. There was a lot of concern over the weekend, and uh, Mr President, uh, I am cognisant of the question, Senator Watt, so I'm not trying to. But, but, Mr. President, there was a lot of concern over the weekend at Jetta Gardens when somebody quite irresponsibly, quite irresponsibly started a rumour that the facility was to be evacuated by the Defence Force. It caused a huge media Order. storm. Order. Mr. President, this, Order. This, this is an important point because it's caused enormous distress, distress to the families. Mr. President, uh, the booster clinic. I'll, give, I'll deal with the booster clinic, and I'll deal with the rest of it, Mr. President. The booster clinic, uh, scheduled and brought forward from its original date uh, at Jetta Gardens, occurred on the 31st of January, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, and, and of course, uh, there are a number of other methods through which aged care residents uh, can uh, get a booster shot. They can they can have a GP. They can get a GP or a pharmacist to come and do it, Mr. President. Uh, they can do uh, attend a, a, a GP clinic, Mr. President. So aside from the, the or the facility can run its own uh, clinic and will pay for the, the cost of that, Mr. President. Uh, but I just want to go back to the point that I've made because it's a serious one. The distress caused to the families by the irresponsible, the clearly irresponsible rumours that were started Order. in Queensland uh, at the weekend. Is, is outrageous. Fanned, might I say, by the opposition. Fanned by the opposition, irresponsibly. Uh, unfortunately, reported by the media before being. Uh, Mr. President. Minister, uh, Minister, uh, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In damning reports issued in March and September last year, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission found that care at Jetta Gardens failed to meet aged care quality standards, including the safety of res residents' care and the facility's preparedness for a COVID-19 outbreak. Why did the minister fail to take urgent action last year in response to his own regulators' repeated findings of non-compliance? Minister. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, Mr. President. give me your seat. Senator Watt, to interject before the minister has even had a chance to answer the question is highly disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, the, the, regulator, the regulator throughout this pandemic has done its job, which is what it did last year, Mr President. And the regulator worked with Jetta Gardens to bring them back to compliance. That's the role that they do, Mr President. Senator Watt. Mr. Senator Mr. President, Watt. That is the role that the regulator has, Mr President. That is the role that the regulator has, and, and uh, the regulator has taken further regulatory action, Mr. President, in relation to Jetta Gardens. Senator, um, and, what? and the government has taken additional uh, assistance uh, measures as well, Mr. President, uh, as the as the uh, outbreak progressed. Clinical first Senator responders what? and an Aspen team in there to support the facility in relation to their their infection control procedure and their processes within the, in the facility, Mr President. So we have continuously monitored 
the facility and we've put in place the measures and the additional resources that have been required to support the facility through Minister, the outbreak. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. This minister has ignored repeated warnings about workforce shortages, PPE shortages and ignored the alarming failures at Jetta Gardens exposed by two reports in the last 12 months. And now 15 residents have died and 100 residents and 82 staff had tested positive. When will this minister resign? Minister. Mr President, uh, over the course of the pandemic, the government has continued to work with the sector to support it with respect to the measures that need to be and the advice and the measures that need to be put in place to manage uh, COVID-19 through the pandemic. And Mr President, as I've indicated in an earlier question today, the sector has performed Order. extremely well in the context of the number of infections in aged care compared to those in the broader community. Uh, the I, my, my, my thanks and my congratulations again go to the sector and the workforce who have done a magnificent job in managing this, Mr President. Uh, we continue to work uh, with the Quality Commission to ensure that all providers that all providers meet the quality standards. That's the role uh, that the Quality Commission has, and it continues Order. to work uh, on that in that sense, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have been absolutely tragic, and I extend again my condolences to all of those who have lost loved ones as, Minister, as a result of the pandemic. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting the economic prosperity of Australian women as we reopen the economy? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question and her enduring commitment to women's economic security, which reflects the enduring commitment of the Morrison government. In fact, the Morrison government's economic plan is clearly working. Today, there are over more, more than one million more women in work than when we came to government. And let me say that again, more than one million more women in work under a coalition Liberal National Government. Now, this is not something that happens by accident. It can only have been made possible because of the economic policies that have been put in place intentionally by this government. We currently have the highest the highest women's employment to population ratio than Australia has ever seen before. More Australian Order. women in work than ever before. Women's workforce participation is hovering at record levels and women's underemployment is steadily heading consistently down. All of this achieved with the background of a global pandemic. Importantly, there are more opportunities for Australian women to work, to take up an apprenticeship, to upskill, to reskill, to start a business and to take on those Senator better McAllister. and higher paying jobs than ever before. And our government's commitment to enhancing Senator the economic Camille. security of Australian women extends well beyond economic management. In the 2020-21 budget, we made a landmark commitment and investment of $1.9 billion to improve the affordability oh, of childcare by increasing the childcare subsidy for families with multiple children. For women who want to return to the workforce to take on training, to take on study or to volunteer, their decision to, ha to take on childcare, on to, re to reduce the cost of childcare is made more, uh, more affordable for them. But improving women's economic security is only part of the goal, Mr President. On top of, uh, in top of our economic policy... Oh, Minister, mm -hmm. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate how the government is securing the economic future of Australian women? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr President. Yes, I can. Let's be clear. From skills, from childcare, from leadership to board appointments, and most importantly, to job opportunities, we are backing Australian women to get the choices and chances that they deserve, that we deserve. Australian women can rest assured that this government's economic plan will maximise opportunities as we continue to recover from the pandemic. I can certainly promise you, I can certainly promise you, Mr. President, that they, we won't be slugging them with higher taxes. We won't be proposing a retiree tax, for Order. instance, damaging their Senator retirement Watt. savings. Senator we certainly 
won't be bringing in $387 billion of new or higher taxes, smashing their jobs and robbing women of opportunities. And while the childcare subsidy is currently up to 95 per cent for those families with two or more children who want to work, who want to study or who want to volunteer, we certainly won't be bringing in free childcare for millionaires while regular women work longer and longer hours to pay the taxes to pay for Minister. such a scheme. Get order. Order. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister can the minister explain the importance of a collaborative approach across government and industry in reducing barriers to improve women's economic security? Minister. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So the Morrison government recognises that improving measures like the gender pay gap requires a commitment and a targeted policy and a, and a partnership between industry and between government, between the private sector and Order. all levels of government. But before I talk about what's ahead, let's talk about what is in the rearview mirror. 17.4 per cent gender pay gap when we came to office. Now, now it's 14.2 per cent. But there's more to do. There is no doubt about that. And as a government, we believe in policies that actually shift the dial. Policies not put in place for show, like your Order policy to give millionaires free childcare, but policies with genuine substance. That's why the Women's Budget Statement Senator this year committed to a full review of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to ensure to determine how government can further work alongside the private sector to collectively close the gender pay gap. The Gender Equality Act requires that employers with more than 100 employees Minister, can be required to report to the gender equality. Minister, oh, your goodness time me, I didn't get it out. Has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for Minister for Finance, Minister Birmingham. Minister, there are 75 politicians up here right now who own a second home in Canberra. Each and every one of them can claim the full rate of travel allowance, nearly 300 bucks, to sleep in the comfort of their own bed this evening. That's $20,000 in free money going out to 75 politicians tonight alone. I reckon it should be illegal for politicians to claim full travel allowance to sleep in their own bed. It's not allowed anywhere else in the country, so why should Canberra be any different? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Uh, Mr President, um, the, uh, the rates of travel allowance and arrangements for travel allowance are set independently through the Remuneration Tribunal. It's been a long-standing practice that in relation to the rates paid for members and senators uh, to stay in Canberra, that uh, relative to uh, the rates paid in other capital cities. There is a discounted rate applied in Canberra, uh, recognising and indeed uh, encouraging members and senators to make uh, longer term uh, arrangements in relation to uh, their accommodation in Canberra. Now, that's a private matter for each uh, member and senator to undertake, uh, but, uh, but the government stands by the independent process of the remuneration tribunal on these matters. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I think we get that. No one is breaking any rules here. Politicians are allowed to claim full travel allowance to stay in their investment properties in Canberra. I'm not denying that. But as the Finance Minister, do you seriously have no problem with politicians using travel allowance to pay their own mortgages and then come out with a nice hit at the end when they leave Parliament? Do you Minister. have no issues with that? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, um, uh, I'd simply make the observation, uh, as I indicated in the primary answer, uh, that the rate that is applied for, uh, for overnight stays in Canberra is, uh, is assessed in a slightly different way by the REM Tribunal compared with the rate uh, for, uh, for commercial accommodation provision in other capital cities uh, of Australia. Um, so, in terms of uh, the cost effectiveness for the government's finances, Senator Lambie, uh, it would concern me. Uh, were we in a situation that changes were made that indeed potentially increased the cost by increasing the nightly rate to, that, uh, that was paid. So, uh, so again, I back the independent processes there to uh, seek to find uh, the right uh, approach to, uh, to um, respect taxpayers' dollars, to minimise costs where possible, but to ensure uh, that, uh, that uh, indeed recompense is made to, to enable members and senators to make their own arrangements for overnight accommodation as is necessary in Canberra. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese, no one's getting an inch here, by the way, billed taxpayers $17,000 in travel allowance to stay in his Canberra flat while Sydney was in lockdown last year. He says he has no plans to change the rules either. He doesn't see a need to. So I just wanted to clarify this. To the best of your knowledge that the Liberal Party, the Nationals and the Labor Party are on a unit ticket uh, because of uh, because of their own self sense of self entitlement when it comes to claiming this money from the taxpayer. Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I uh, reject the assertions made there, Senator Lambie. Um, what we are indeed backing is an independent process uh, that has been in place for many years uh, for, uh, for the remuneration tribunal to make independent assessments at arm's length from uh, politicians uh, that uh, we are not. Uh, I am not as finance minister. Uh, Mr Morton is not a special minister of state responsible for setting uh, the rates, terms or arrangements uh, for travel allowances. It is, of course, the fact uh, that every one of us here, aside from uh, Senator Gallagher and Senator Seselja, um, travel here uh, away from our homes and perhaps Senator Molan, yes, uh, Senator Molan, uh, travel here away from our homes, uh, do, of course, then incur costs of some form or other in relation to the accommodation while we were here. Uh, as I said, it's been a long-standing practice the REM Tribunal has applied in terms of the flexibility of that, uh, but that is also reflected in the different rates as they are calculated, uh, and that's why the independent approach is the appropriate approach. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. When former New South Wales Liberal Premier Mike Baird and the current CEO of Hammond Care called for the ADF to be employed to aged care homes to assist with the staffing crisis on the 12th of January, Mr Morrison rebuked this suggestion, saying Defence Force personnel were, and I quote, not a shadow workforce. Just 26 days later, Mr Morrison backflipped. Isn't this just another example of the Morrison-Joyce government doing too little too late? Uh, the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Order. President. Um, and, uh, Mr. President, uh, it's a pity that the good senator wasn't listening to what the Prime Minister said yesterday, because yesterday the Prime Minister reaffirmed that the Defence Force is not a shadow workforce for any workforce in this country, but particularly for the aged care workforce. What the, announcement, what the announcement that we made yesterday was, Mr. President, was to pull together some targeted support for aged care facilities that were in significant distress, Mr President. That's what we announced yesterday, and to, and to build teams in each state to support providers in each state. The, the, the Defence Force is not a shadow workforce. It is not a shadow workforce. Uh, the Prime Minister said that uh, in, when, the, when the, the proposal was first put on the table, and he repeated Order. it again yesterday, Mr President. So it would be nice if Labor senators opposite actually took notice of what was happening rather than just playing their politics, exploiting the pandemic rather than doing what we're doing, which is dealing with the pandemic, Mr President. So, Mr President, we continue to work with the sector to provide them with the resources that they need in support of their management of the pandemic. Important decisions like the advice that the Chief Medical Officer made early in January so that more work staff could go back to work quickly and safely uh, in support of the residents in the residential aged care facilities. A significant decision, Mr President, that has Order. made a real difference in the capacity of, of the aged care sector and facilities in particular to maintain their workforce and support residents. The supply of rapid antigen tests, which are now going to every aged care facility in the country, Mr President, 2.5 of them dispatched last week in support of the, um, of the, the facilities that have an outbreak the facilities that are, have contact and the facilities that require them for screening, Mr President. The supply of PPE, where there were some issues coming out of the national stockpile, which we acknowledged, and we provided additional resources to support the sector Minister, in respect of those. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. What a disgrace. How many older Senator Australians Ayers. in residential aged care died in the 26 days it took for the Morrison-Joyce government to listen to the warnings and to finally act. Minister. Mr President, I completely reject the premise of the question in the context that the Prime Minister said that it wasn't a shadow workforce. It isn't a shadow workforce, Mr President. 
and, 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 and we still say it's not a shadow workforce. The measure that we introduced yesterday, Mr. President, was a targeted approach to support particular facilities that are in significant levels of stress with respect to workforce. That's what we're doing. We're not providing a shadow workforce, Mr. President, as that lot over there dishonestly try to imply. That's not what Order we're doing, Mr. On President. My left. Mr. President. And yes, unfortunately, over well, the course of the Minister, pandemic. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Ayres. The point, point of order is relevant. The question was very direct. Over the course of the 26 days, how many older Australians died in the residential aged care system for which the minister is responsible? The minister directly addressed your question at the start of his question. I believe his answer has been directly relevant to the question. The minister has 18 seconds remaining. Minister, I am listening to the remainder of your answer. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I haven't done a calculation on I, I, I'm based on who died on what day and who died on another day, Mr. President. And as I told the Senate committee last week, there is actually a lag in the data. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lag in the data, and that's been demonstrated by some jumps in figures over the period of time. But we continue Minister, to work closely with the sector Minister, in support of them through the pandemic. Senator Ayres, a second thank, supplementary thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. If, if the minister can't answer that question, how many older Australians were locked in their rooms without a wash for days? How many were left in soiled pads? How many were left with untended wounds? How many were left unfed and neglected? In the 26 days it took for the Morrison-Joyce government and this minister to listen to the warnings and finally act. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And if anyone ever wanted an, an example of how the Labor Party are exploiting the pandemic rather than dealing with the pandemic, which is what we're doing, Mr. President. There's an example of it in that question, Mr. President. What a disgrace, Mr. Order. President. What a complete disgrace. You should be ashamed Order. of yourself, Senator Ayres. You should be ashamed, Mr. President. Uh, the, age, the, age, the aged care sector is under extreme stress in this country. We've acknowledged that. The Prime Order. Minister, all of us from the Prime Minister down, have acknowledged that. And we continue to work with the sector in support of them and, most importantly, the residents that are in, the aged, care, in aged care facilities. And, Mr. President, the catastrophic uh, approach, that the, the, the approach that the Labor Party is taking Mr. President, to uh, demonising the sector and the effects are making it very, very difficult Mr. President, for us to strike the appropriate balance about having residents Order. having visitors or not having visitors and being locked in their rooms. So, Mr. President, their Minister, approach is actually hurting Minister, residents in aged care Minister, and not helping them. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Minister, we've recently seen some extensive Order. flooding across Australia, including in my state around Griffith in the Riverina, to the north of the state in Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia, to the point that we have seen disruptions to our freight supply chains as well as incredible damage to a lot of small businesses and farmers. Order. Can the minister update the Senate on what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to support communities affected by these flooding events and severe weather across the country? Order, Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Order, Senator Watt. The Minister for Order in the chamber. The Minister for Emergency Services, Senator McKenzie. Uh, emergency that, Management, sorry. That's so good. It's a very long title. Um, it's uh, great to be back. And thank you so much, Senator Davey, for the question. Um, with the La Nina, the floods that have uh, swept across, particularly the east coast of our nation over the last three months, have been catastrophic and devastating, including uh, the loss of so many lives. We stand shoulder to shoulder with affected communities and individuals uh, as they make, through, make their way through natural disasters, respond and recover and build natural resilience uh, into the future. 
We've got the $85 million Natural uh, Hazard Research Australia um, money. We've got $40 million dedicated to strata resilience, the North Queensland flood recovery. We were able to put $1.58 billion on the table. $2.8 billion has been committed to the bushfire recovery. $600 million for preparing Australia to uh, better respond to natural disasters in the future, $13 billion alone from this government to assist impacted workers uh, through the COVID response, through both the pandemic leave disaster payment and the COVID disaster Order. payment. Our government has put $12 billion in conjunction with states and territories uh, to support these affected communities from natural disaster. In fact, no government in our nation's history has stood with Australians Order. in times of need like the Liberal National Government. Through bushfires, cyclones, earthquakes and floods and COVID, this government has been providing boots on the ground and financial assistance to both individuals and communities to help them at their time of crisis. We're helping people recover funding for cleanups financial assistance for small businesses and primary producers. The last three months alone, we've activated assistance for natural disasters 20 times, uh, with $50,000 grants Minister, for primary producers. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Can you also explain to the Senate how our government is utilising the Emergency Response Fund and strengthening Australia's emergency response and disaster preparedness so that we're ready for them instead of waiting for them to happen. Minister. Well, thank you Order. very much, Senator. And we do live in the country of droughts and flooding rains. The next natural disaster is simply around uh, the corner. And in this country, we spend 97 per cent of our money and effort on responding to a natural disaster and only 3 per cent in uh, preparing for the next one. Our government has fundamentally flipping uh, the response of the federal government in this country to get ahead of Order. that. And the Labor government is playing games and politicking with the Emergency Response Fund. It is being used and spent in exactly the way it was designed, in fact, in exactly the way the Labor Party voted for it to be used and spent. The fundamental issue they seem to forget is this is a future fund. Order. And this side Senator of politics Watt. has not seen a future fund that they cannot wait to raid, that they cannot wait to spend in the here and now. They're Senator salivating Pratt. to get their hands on it, instead of actually ensuring this money is put away to prepare Minister. for catastrophic Minister. disasters Minister. in our nation's future. Minister. Sorry, apologies. Minister, your time has expired. There was a lot of noise in the chamber, Senator Keneally. There was an excess of interjections in the chamber from one side of politics. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you very much. Finally, can the minister please outline how the government is mitigating disaster risk and building our national resilience? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we're not just focused on recovery. The Liberal Nationals government is also focused on mitigating disaster and building our resilience. We're the first government to have dedicated an entire agency with a sole focus to ensure we are prepared as we can Senator be for natural Watt. disasters, built on solid research and science, and that's the NRRA. The government's national climate resilience and adaptation strategy positions Australia to better anticipate and adapt to climate variability, improving climate information and services to contribute to our future disaster preparedness. Under our government, $210 million has been invested uh, to ensure that the Australian Climate Services was stood up, to use world-leading expertise and focus on supporting the NRRA and Emergency Management Australia to support decisions related to preparedness, response and community recovery from disaster. And we've got the PAP program, the Natural Minister, Flood Minis Mitigation Minister, Infrastructure Program. Minister, your time has expired. Yes. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment, uh, Senator Hume. Experts have warned that without urgent action, koalas will become extinct by 2050. Loss of habitat, climate change, and extreme weathers 
are the biggest threats to our koala population. Yet the Environment Minister has signed off on projects like the Brandy Hill Quarry expansion, the Vickery Coal Mine expansion, and even the rail line to Adani that will decimate koala habitat and make climate change even worse. Why is this so-called Minister for the Environment Order. putting the interests of mining companies and their big developer Order. mates ahead Order of our koalas right. and our environment? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, uh, and I, I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. Mr. President, the Morrison government is taking action and investing $50 million over four years to boost the long term protection and recovery efforts for koalas. This investment will protect and restore koala habitat. It will improve our understanding of koala populations. It will strengthen research into koala health and support training in koala care and treatment. Now, this new package takes the Morrison government's investment in koala recovery to more than $74 million since 2019. Mr. President, the spe uh, Threatened Species Scientific Committee has been undertaking a reassessment of the status of the listed koala following the impacts of bushfires and in addition to other threats such as land clearing, dogs, cars and disease. The Minister for the Environment, Minister Lee, is currently considering the advice within statutory timeframes. The draft national plan for the listed uh, koala has been revised in response to the submissions provided during the public comment period, and the government intends to formally make that plan um, uh, to formally make that plan as, uh, public as soon as possible. By working together with state and territory governments, with researchers, with land managers, with veterinarians, with community groups. We can all protect the koala for generations to come. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister's package means nothing if the Morrison government keeps signing off on the destruction, uh, the land clearing, and the bulldozing of koala habitat. They can't be saved if they have no homes. When will this government back the Greens bill for a moratorium on the destruction of koala habitat? No home, no koala. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The Morrison government's $74 million investment spans a range of threats and challenges for the koala, and that includes habitat protection. The management of habitat protection and land clearing are primarily the responsibilities of state governments, but where there are potential impacts on matters of national environmental significance, including the, the clearance of koala habitat, these may in fact require separate Commonwealth approval. The Commonwealth will thus continue to play a leadership role and to support the coordination of conservation outcomes for the koala across its range. The Morrison government's $74.3 million over six years, between 19, 2019 and 20 to 2024-25, into projects that are benefiting koalas both directly and indirectly include $47 million to protect and restore the important koala habitat, $8.3 million for koala health, genetics research and medical support, and an additional $12 million for the koala National Minister, Koala Monitoring Program. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. No amount of cute photo opportunities with the Prime Minister is going to save Australia's koala population. When will this government finally, finally declare koalas endangered as the science is requiring and to do something properly, seriously, to actually save their homes? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, one of the things that Hanson Young that uh, the Morrison government did early on after the 2019-20 bushfires was to talk to an independent panel of experts about the needs of koala. The Minister Order. for the Environment requested at that time that the spe Threatened Species Scientific Committee undertake an assessment of the status of the species. Now, that Threatened Species Scientific Committee has undertaken their assessment of the species and she is currently considering their, their final advice in line with the statutory timeframes. In the meantime, there are projects to benefit the koala that are already well underway. The landmark National Koala Monitoring Program, which is filling key, key data gaps and will produce a robust estimate of the National Koala 
population and monitor the health and condition of koalas. The habitat restoration and mitigation, threat mitigation programs that I spoke of earlier in key koala hotspots in New South Wales and Queensland that focus on both bushfire and non-bushfire affected areas. And it includes a partnership with the World Wildlife Fund that is delivering habitat restoration projects in northern rivers of New time. South Wales and south east Queensland. Minister, sorry, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I also, Mr President, seek leave to move a motion to vary the routine of business for today and uh, to enable additional time this evening for the consideration of the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill 2021. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senate. I move the motion as circulated today that would provide for uh, Maves Law Bill second reading speeches to continue until 10 p.m. this evening or at the conclusion of the second reading debate, uh, whichever is earlier, uh, noting that there would be no divisions after 7.20 p.m. Senator, can... you're seeking to speak or are we just going to put the motion? Uh, Senator McKim, are you seeking to speak? I, I am president, yes. Is leave granted? Do, uh, I seek leave to, to make a 15-second contribution. Oh, no, you can speak. Well, in that case, uh, I will just kick. I'll crack into it, President. Um, <laughs> uh, look, and as I indicated, very. You are time limited, but uh, go ahead. As I indicated, President, very, very briefly, we won't be opposing uh, this motion. We do understand uh, the need for it, and we don't want to stand in the way uh, of that important legislation being debated. We just wanted to express our concern that one of the um, effects of this motion will be that we lose the open-ended adjournment debate this evening. Um, now, uh, we would ask the government please to consider uh, uh, by um, another motion tomorrow to restore the open-ended adjournment debate to tomorrow evening rather than this evening, and the government will you know, make their own response to that. But I just wanted to be clear from the Greens' point of view, even though we're not going to oppose this motion, we are concerned that, in effect, it means the loss of a significant uh, adjournment uh, opportunity for all senators to make uh, contributions on the adjournment debate. Thank you, Senator Kim. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Keneally. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the performance of the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. Yeah. Is leave granted? No. Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Keneally. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Wong, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a, mo a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the performance of the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. Let me be clear. From the outset, Senator Richard Colbeck has repeatedly demonstrated over a prolonged period of time that he is incapable of fulfilling the task of looking after the interests of older, vulnerable Australians. For this matter alone, this minister should resign. And if he does not have the decency to resign, the integrity to resign, the self-awareness to resign, the Prime Minister should sack him. And if the Prime Minister will not sack this minister, then he confirms he does not have the character to lead this nation. Right. Our aged care sector is in crisis, an absolute crisis, the third year of this pandemic. Almost 12,000 aged care residents and workers infected with COVID in more than 1,100 facilities as of Friday, and over 600 deaths amongst aged care residents this year. Tens of thousands of aged care residents still waiting for a booster dose. Aged care facilities left without rapid antigen tests and PPE. Aged care residents left without food, without food, water, medical care because the government, in the third year of a pandemic, after last year's diabolical handling of COVID in aged care, failed to learn, failed to plan. This government always acts too little too late and only acts when there's an absolute crisis on its hands. An absolute crisis. We have had hundreds of Australians in aged care die of COVID. How many were preventable? 
if only this aged care minister had acted. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that the Morrison-Joyce government had ignored aged care. It's all there in one word, neglect. That is not my word. That is the word chosen by the Royal Commission into Aged Care to title their interim report, neglect. This is a government that has neglected older citizens in aged care before the pandemic, neglected them in the pandemic, and continues to neglect them to this day. We had a clarion call from the former Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Mike Baird, now CEO of Hammond Care, begging this government to send in the Australian Defence Force 26 days ago. The Prime Minister rejected it. This minister rejected it. This minister said the sector was performing exceptionally well. Those were his words. And he felt so relaxed and comfortable about the aged care sector that he toddled off to the cricket for three days. Well, he probably did get booed, Senator Billick. You make an excellent point. He, should, he got booed at the cricket, and he should get booted out of his job. It is an absolute absolute disgrace, an utter disaster, disease running rampant through under-resourced resource facilities, too few staff to care for those living there, our greatest generation left unwashed and without food. Have you no shame? Have you no responsibility? Have you no care? What happened to ministerial responsibility under this government? Where has it gone? Was it ever there? For if Richard Colbeck can have job security under this government, it is absolutely clear there is almost nothing you can fail at and still be confident to retain your job under Mr. Morrison. Who takes no responsibility? Who tried to blame the states for the outbreaks of COVID in aged care? Who tried to blame other people? He was warned, by the way, on rapid antigen tests. So many people warned him. Katie Allen warned him. Call was coming from inside the house, by the way. The business community warned him. The Transport Workers Union warned him. He was warned we need rapid antigen tests. And just like his it's not a race approach to vaccines, it was not a race to get those rapid antigen tests. Failing older Australians, leaving them behind. And to those people who say, what would it do to change the minister? It would send a clear message that this government gives a brass wazoo about older people in aged care. Let somebody else, anybody else, have responsibility for this portfolio because surely nobody could do as bad a job as the incompetent aged care minister. The crisis, the word, the C word he dares not utter the absolute crisis in aged care. The Prime Minister has acknowledged it, that there is a crisis. The Prime Minister backflipped and sent in the ADF. The next thing the Prime Minister needs to do is sack the Minister for Aged Care. Thank you, Senator Keneally. And I just remind you, when referring to those in the other place, to use their correct titles and equally for Senators. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Well, Deputy President, we have yet another example that it's all politics and zero policy from those opposite, that it's all personality attacks and little, of course, focusing on the substance of issues that need to be addressed, Mr President. When you listen to those opposite, Deputy President, you'd be forgiven for thinking that there is some sort of alternate universe that Australia could operate in, an alternate universe in which COVID could be locked in a box and just kept away somehow, an alternate universe in which Omicron was not a significant global game changer as it is. But that's not true, Deputy President. That is not the reality of the world in which we face. We face a global pandemic, a highly infectious global pandemic, a global pandemic which has produced new variants, new variants that have become more infectious, more transmissible, and through that created new challenges. They have, however, Deputy President, in terms of those uh, variants, become, thankfully, less lethal, less likely to lead to severe hospitalisation and severe health outcomes. We can be grateful for that, Deputy President. But the reality is COVID is spreading throughout the world. Omicron has seen a huge surge in caseload right throughout the world. And no country has demonstrated, Deputy President, that when you have Omicron and COVID spreading throughout your community, you're going to be able to somehow keep it out completely of different sectors of your community, such as the aged care sector. Now, Deputy President, rather than denigrate the aged care sector, rather than denigrate 
aged care workers. Our government. I want to. I know Minister Colbeck does. Thanks them, Deputy President. This motion that Senator Keneally has you know, moved today, Deputy President, does it thank aged care workers anywhere in this motion? No, it doesn't, Senator. Does it thank aged care operators any in the, anywhere in this motion? No, it doesn't. Does it acknowledge? Does it acknowledge the circumstances? No, it's just a political diatribe, typical of the Labor Party, Deputy President. Order. A political Order. diatribe that we're seeing there. If there were a silver bullet, Deputy President, if there were a silver bullet to address the challenges in aged care in dealing with COVID-19 and Omicron, then not only, of course, would we have sought to deliver that as a government, but it might have provided a policy idea for those opposite, because they've shown no policy idea in the aged care sector to date. Not a single policy idea from those Order. opposite, Deputy President. Our government, Deputy President, our government has ensured 100 per cent, 100 per cent of residential aged care facilities have been visited by InReach Clinic to deliver booster doses, Deputy President. We have provided surge workforce capacity. More than 80,000 shifts have been filled by surge workforce, including nurses, GPs, care workers, allied health workers, executive ancillary staff. The private health agreement in place to utilise private hospital staff. The furloughing changes made to minimise the loss of staff due to requirements to isolate. We have made sure, Deputy President, that in terms of PPE, we have seen more than 42 million masks, more than 15 million gowns, more than 43 million gloves, more than 12 million goggles, nearly 11 million rapid antigen tests delivered throughout, Deputy President, the aged care sector. We have made sure 50,000 treatments are sent out to aged care facilities across the country ensuring that we prioritise those facing outbreak. Deputy President, Senator Keneally goes on, when are they getting their boosters? All facilities, all facilities have had the opportunity for people to have a booster, Senator Keneally. And Order. Senator Keneally, all facilities have had the opportunity for people to have a booster. It is not the case, Deputy President, that of course everybody will choose to have a booster. And people won't choose to have a booster because the reality is that some people in aged care are already Order. in palliative care. Some people in aged care are part of end of life management. It is a sad reality, but it's a true reality that those opposite are blinkered to, Deputy President. They ignore the fact that these truths exist and pretend there is some sort of alternate Order. universe. Even when we address the broader questions of aged care, Deputy President, this government, under Minister Colbeck and Minister Hunt, has provided an $18 billion response to the Royal Commission, a comprehensive response dealing with more places in home care, dealing with minimum standards in residential care, lifting those standards in a range of different ways. We have responded comprehensively to the Aged Care Royal Commission report, and our response contrasts with no response from those opposite, no Senator response aside Keneally. from the type of rubbish that is bowled up today, the type of politicisation that is bowled up today, rather than the acknowledgement of the challenges and the hard work of those who are helping this sector get Thank through you, some Birmingham. of the most challenging Your times. Time has expired. Uh, just before I go to, uh, I'll go to Senator Rice, I do remind senators I was reluctant to. Uh, interrupt the minister mid-sentence, but I do remind senators he has the right, of, as does every senator, to be heard in silence, and I would ask you to respect that right. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. The Greens will be supporting this motion today because the Minister for Aged Services, Minister Colbeck, has failed. He has failed in his most basic of duties as a government minister, and that is to be keeping people safe. We are supporting this motion today because of the 587 people who have died in aged care in just the first five weeks of 2022, on top of all of the people who have died of COVID in aged care throughout 2020 and 2021. The minister has failed. There would have been fewer deaths of COVID of people in aged care if this government had been competent. They have failed in the vaccine rollout in aged care. They have failed to provide boosters to everyone in aged care who wanted to be boosters. They have failed to provide the PPE 
that workers and visitors in aged care homes need. They have failed provide, to provide the rapid antigen tests that are needed. We have a situation where nurses and aged care workers are still having to, to pay for their own rat tests. They have failed to provide the adequate working conditions to support nurses and aged care workers to continue working in aged care. And then the men, uh, and they have failed to, to provide that support so that we know that 20 per cent of nurses have said they want to leave working in aged care in the next year. And frankly, they have put in an amazing job that they have done over the last years. But I do not blame them because of the conditions they are having to be working under, because of the actions of this government. This minister has failed to do all of that. But of course he didn't fail to get to the cricket. Apparently that was a priority. And never mind that he earned more in that day that he went to the cricket than the aged care bonus that they had promised workers. So for the Greens, I want to say I am who, particularly to the families who are mourning and grieving for the people of their, who have, you've lost, we share your grief. And to the residents who are tired and frustrated and anxious and locked down in aged care homes, we hear your frustration. To the aged care workers who are doing ceaseless hours, waiting desperately for the support and the recognition you deserve, we hear your anger. I mean, a minister may think that it's acceptable to go to the cricket while people die. We do not. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. And I will, uh, of course, be supporting uh, the motion moved by Senator Keneally today. And I think, uh, to start at the very top, there is no fundamentally greater responsibility for any government than to keep its citizens safe. It's there to protect every Australian. And what we have at the moment is a catastrophic failure of keeping elderly Australians safe. This minister and this government has been unable to do that. And there is no greater example of the shambles that is this government, their disunity and their infighting and the distractions taking away from actually dealing with the issues that everyday Australians face than is the crisis in aged care. The crisis in aged care that the Minister for Aged Care Services refuses to acknowledge there is a crisis. I mean, there is no... that You cannot fix a situation if you don't acknowledge the crisis that is there right now. Everyone is saying it's a crisis. The workers in the sector, the families who have loved ones, individual residents are saying they've never seen the quality of care so poor as what they are experiencing right now. More than half of aged care facilities with outbreaks, thousands of staff, thousands of residents, 587 deaths since January, 587 deaths in the last 39 days. And this minister's defence of that and, he, and Minister Hunt's defence of that is, oh well, firstly, oh well, you, you're old, so you're going to die anyway. And the second one is, oh well, there's a lot of COVID out there, therefore aged care, sorry, you're just going to get it. And unfortunately, because you're old, it's going to be more severe for you. Like We have had the benefit of seeing what's happened in the Northern Hemisphere for two seasons now. We saw what happened in Victoria. We understood the need to get vaccinated and get boosted and keep those facilities safe with PPE and testing and workforce. And here we are, we get another, we get more widespread community transmission. And what do we see? Failures of PPE, failures of workforce, failures of testing, failures for people living in those facilities. Isolated, dislocated, in their, in their dying moments, hoisted out of the facility and into hospital. And this minister went to the cricket. And I am sorry, minister, if you think I am misrepresenting this, but you told me you didn't want resources diverted away from dealing with what was happening in aged care. That's what you told me. I, I took that on face value. You, I didn't hold a hearing with your attendance and you popped up at the cricket. Yep. That is what happened. That is exactly what happened. You said you were too busy dealing with the crisis 
that you didn't come. And I think when you go outside and talk to people who are witnessing what's happening in aged care and, you, and they talk to me about that, they don't think it passes the pub test. So don't try and rewrite it. You made the decision to go to the cricket when aged care was in crisis. And, you, and this minister, who we are holding to account today, is not a new minister. Like, this minister took his first portfolio responsibilities in 2004. He has been Minister for Aged Care or Minister for Aged Care Services for the last two and a half years. It's not like you are learning the job. We've had report after report, an interim report from the Royal Commission titled Neglect. Someone has to take responsibility for this failure. This government won't take responsibility. The Senate must stand up and speak on behalf of all of the voices of people in aged care and the loved ones who are contacting my office, incredibly upset that they weren't able to be with their loved ones when they were passing away, when they were locked out, when they hear down the phone their loved one telling them that they haven't been showered and haven't eaten any food. That's the anger out there about aged care. You know, we are not playing politics with this. These are older Australians in their most vulnerable moment and this government pretends that they've done everything they can and it's just a pandemic and Omicron came. Well, it's not good enough and that's why this minister should Thank resign you, and the Prime Gallagher. Minister Your should sack him if he expired. doesn't. Thank you. As Senator Roberts on this matter. Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam, Acting, Madam, Madam Deputy President. So what will this achieve? Think about what's happening in, in my state, Queensland. Forced vaccinations by the federal government have driven aged care workers into resignation and they've abandoned their jobs after being heroes for 18 months. People crying, staff crying, because they don't want to leave people, residents in aged care facilities in the lurch, but they don't want to take that mandated injection. Look what else is happening in Queensland. Forced vaccinations in health care, destroying our hospital system. We have a so-called pandemic, which there's no pandemic of deaths, but we have a threat, apparently. And the response from the state government is to destroy its own health system. A Labor state government destroying health care. Nurses resigning. Nurses being left out because they don't want to get injected. And at the same time, we're told we're going to face an urgent hospital, an imminent hospital crisis. This doesn't make sense, neither the Liberal Party, National Party, nor the Labor Party. We have in Queensland, at a time when there's increasing load on the police to enforce capricious lockdown and other restrictions in Queensland, we're taking police off duty to do those jobs and at the same time standing aside police officers because they won't get injected. We're threatening people in our, in our emergency services workers, aged care, teaching, nurses, doctors, police, NDIS workers, fireys. We're threatening them with sacking them so they can't feed their kids because we're going to go against a 3,000-year-old principle of doctor-patient confidentiality, privacy and bodily autonomy. So it doesn't matter whether we look at this mob or this mob. You're both reckless and dishonest. So I ask you again, what will this achieve? The Labor Party is full of talk but no action. You've got two or three months to an election. Where's your plan? Where is your plan? Instead of suspending, suspending the standing orders today, let's have your plan and put it to the people of Australia and let's see them decide at the next election who is competent to manage this country. Because at the moment, neither of you are. And that's why we keep saying to people, put the majors last because in 70 years you have destroyed this country. 
absolutely destroyed it, giving in to the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and now this rubbish. We will not be supporting the suspension of standing orders. There's an election. Let the people decide. The people right across this country. Senator Colbeck. President. Mr President, it is really disappointing that the Labor Party used this opportunity to play politics with the pandemic rather than being constructive in actually dealing with it, Mr President. They talk about the Royal Commission, Mr President. They talk about the Royal Commission. It's nearly a year since the Royal Commission has brought down its final report, Respect, Care and Dignity. And yet, what is the plan for the, from the Labor Party to deal with aged care out of, out of the Royal Commission report? A comprehensive, a comprehensive report, which we have not only responded to every recommendation for, not only put over $18 billion on the table for the reform of the sector, but their response? Their response? We'll spend more than the other model. That's it. That's all we get from Labor, Mr President. That's all we get from Labor. So they play their dirty, personal, nasty politics. That's what they do. That's what their, that's what their whole plan is. We saw that before Christmas. That's what they do. Meanwhile, Mr President, as difficult as this is, and this is an extraordinarily difficult circumstance, it's not just a pandemic, Senator Gallagher. This is a global pandemic. We have a deadly virus. Uh, people will contract it throughout the community, and tragically, and tragically, some of them will die. Some of them will die. And we work from the Prime Minister down within this government every day in support of all Australians with respect to uh, the pandemic. We took action early. We took action early, Mr. President. We closed the borders. We put the private hospital agreement in place to support the state health systems when they needed it, and they have needed it during January of this year through the Omicron outbreak. And of course, that private health, health, uh, our, um, private health hospital agreement has also provided support for residents in aged care in the context of surge workforce and during 2020, in particular, beds for residents who needed them. We've vaccinated the aged care population. Uh, in, in 2021, uh, and we commenced the vaccination program for aged care residents on the 8th of November last year, Mr. President. On the 12th of December, or thereabouts, we got advice to, to accelerate the program. On Christmas Eve, Mr. President, we got advice to accelerate it even further. The length, the period between vaccination and booster was shortened. We set out, which is what we were doing all through early. January this year, we set out to bring forward the boosters for every facility in the country, and now every facility has received a booster. And we've started going around again, Mr. President. And we've started going around again. We've done over 130 facilities for a second site, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, Order. of those eligible for a booster, um, of those eligible for a booster, as of last night, 77.4% of residents have taken. Up the opportunity for a booster, and we continue to work in the interests of residents. We've, we've provided um, vaccines. We've provided PPE throughout the program. Have there been some problems along the way? Yes, Mr. President, there have. Of course, there have. We had supply problems, supply chain problems earlier this year, which is what we were working out when the Senate wanted us to be there. When, when Senator Gallagher wanted us to be there on that morning which is when the hearings were supposed to be, not while I was at the cricket, but that morning. We were working on bringing the vaccines forward and we were Order. working on ensuring that the vaccine, that the, the, the rapid antigen tests and the PPE required was getting to aged care facilities. Order. So have there been some issues there, Mr President? Yes, Mr President. So we continue to do that. So the Labor, can play, Labor Party can play their, their, their dirty, nasty personal politics, and we know that's their campaign strategy, but they have no plan. And why would you trust the mob that couldn't safely insulate your ceiling to run the response to a pandemic? Why would you, why would you trust them to do that? Could not build a school hall, Mr President. How can they manage the recovery from a pandemic? How can they do that, Mr President? We from the Prime Minister down, have applied our attention to supporting Australians through the pandemic. We will continue to do that. Tragically, tragically, some of them, some Australians are going to catch the virus 
and absolutely tragically, and we all know the impact of a personal loss. We all feel that. We've all, we've all felt that loss. We extend our condolences to all those that have suffered that loss, Mr President, but, but our focus will be on managing the pandemic while the, the opposition play politics with the pandemic. I will, I believe time has expired, but I'll just check. You have the call. Thank you, uh, Mr President. As other speakers from Labor have said today, older Australians deserve our respect, our support and our love. Instead, from this minister and this government, they get neglect, they get cuts and they get blame shifting and excuses. Instead of our respect and our support, they have a minister who presides over a rolling crisis, a crisis that has existed since he took on the role and has only got worse as we have faced COVID-19. Instead of our support and our respect, older Australians, their families, the aged care workforce get a minister who sees aged care as a part-time job, something he fits around his trips to the cricket. We have known about the horror stories in aged care for years. There was a Royal Commission into it, which exposed the neglect, which exposed the elderly Australians sitting with open wounds, unable to get the care that they need because of staffing shortages, because of underpayment of aged care workers, because of under-resourcing of the sector. We have known about this for years, and yet we continue to read about it, to hear about it, to watch it, to see it with our own eyes, with our own families everywhere around the country. And rather than knuckle down and actually get these problems fixed, get the workers paid what they need to, to attract to people and keep people in the workforce, to make sure that providers use the funding they get transparently so that the funds are used to support the elderly Australians in aged care facilities. Instead of that, and rather than knuckling down and fixing these problems, we have a minister who decides his priority is going to see a cricket match for three days. It's not as if time couldn't have been spent in those three days continuing to fix the problems in the aged care facility. There's no shortage of problems. There's no shortage of recommendations about what needs to be done. But instead, this minister chose to go to the cricket and let things rip. Just one example that we've turned to today, the Jetta Gardens aged, facility, aged care facility south of Brisbane. At the time this minister was at the cricket, COVID was ripping right through that aged care facility and we now see 15 residents dead as well as dozens more testing positive. This minister must go and Senator he must White, go today. The time for the
stop the bells. We are considering parts one and two of the motion. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator Davey, teller for the nose. There being 29 ayes, 26 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I'll ask senators to uh, just remain in the chamber. I will now put uh, part three of the motion. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is part three of the motion be agreed to. Eyes pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 27, nose 30. The question is resolved in the negative. We have one final motion. Senator McGrath, can I please get you to move 1301? Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, to begin with, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion No. 131 before seeking to have the motion taken as a formal motion. This is just pushing back the date from the 10th of February to the uh, 14th of February. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McGrath. I amend the motion. The term circulated and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. The question is the motion be taken as formal. Senator Lambie. Uh, yeah, Mr. President, uh, I ask that I request that item A1 be taken separately. Uh, all right, um, uh, we will do that. A1. Was that Senator Lambie? A1. Senator McGrath. I move the motion as amended. Question is that this motion as amended be agreed to. We will move first uh, part A1. Sorry. Question is the motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion, sorry, part A1 of the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the motion, uh, part A1 of the motion, be agreed to. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, no to the left. I appoint Senator Davy Teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 28. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I will put the remaining parts uh, of the motion. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Question is the remaining parts of the motion be agreed to. Eyes were passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davy, teller for the eyes, Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose.
There being 31 ayes, 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And that concludes formal business. We'll now move on to the matter of urgency. I'll give senators a moment to clear the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 22 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Chisholm proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 17 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. This morning I heard from Susan, an aged care worker. Now, Susan has been working in the aged care sector for 17 years. And she says that the facility she currently works for is at breaking point because of the pandemic and because of the government's failure to support that sector throughout this critical Omicron phase. Staff shortages means that she finds herself solely responsible for a floor of 40 elderly people. And when two or three or four buzzers go off at the same time as they always seem to do, she actually has to decide who she is going to help, whose needs she is going to prioritise, who is most important. She has to take responsibility. She has to make a choice. She doesn't have the option that Prime Minister Morrison gives himself time and time and time again, and that is to say that it's someone else's problem to shrug the responsibility off onto someone else. I mentioned Susan because this morning, to meet with her, I had to go past a large crowd of people outside the parliament who are angry about life-saving vaccinations and angry about public health measures associated with the pandemic. Now, this is a group of people that coalition members, members of the coalition party room, members of this Senate, have been directly speaking to and encouraging for some time. It's been reported that some of the coalition party room were down there at the rally in person. Senator Rennick in the media is reported to have said, and I'll quote this, that he is working to make sure, working to make sure that our children aren't vaccinated. Well, you'd think, wouldn't you, that the Prime Minister might be concerned that members of his party room were spreading vaccine misinformation, spreading misinformation about the safety of vaccines. If not that, you'd think he might be concerned that members of his party room are addressing protests whose leaders have publicly called for the violent overthrow of state and federal governments and the murder of public servants. Apparently, he's not concerned about that, not interested in that. He's silent. It's not his responsibility, not his problem. It's a shame, actually, that the Prime Minister didn't meet with Susan, because if he did, he could have learned something, something about what it means to take responsibility and make difficult decisions. Actually, calling out vaccine misinformation and extremism shouldn't be a difficult decision. It should be an easy choice for any leader with integrity. The reasons provided by the government for the cancellation of Novak Djokovic's visa actually spell out why it's dangerous for someone with a high profile and status to be stoking anti-vax sentiment. In the government's own words, and I quote, it may encourage others to emulate him. If others were encouraged to take up or maintain resistance to vaccination or to COVID-19 restrictions, then that would present a problem for the health of individuals and the operation of Australia's hospital system. 
may go on to say this, his presence may lead to rallies and protests that may themselves be a source of community transmission. Well, they're the issues when it came to Mr Djokovic. But we've had members of the coalition party room doing all of these things and, in fact, much more. We've had false medical claims and distrust of science being provoked by Senator Rennick. He said this, all the data that says that they're neither safe nor effective. What data is he referring to? He goes on, on the basis of this false claim, to say it is criminally negligent to roll out booster shots without any attempt at rectifying these serious safety issues first. Well, if distrust in science and medicine isn't bad enough, we've then had Senator Antic, who's been out there peddling distrust in government. And here's a quote from Senator Antic. Power-hungry bureaucrats and a largely pedestrian media have fuelled fear in our community for two years. And on the rallies in Canberra this week, he said, we are with you all the way. Well, Mr Christensen, serial offender, went further and said yesterday, I've watched with pride over the last few days as thousands of Australians uprooted their lives and drove to the nation's capital to send a message to all politicians, we want our freedoms back. Now, that's an unsurprising statement in some ways. Mr Christensen gave a speech last year comparing vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions to a totalitarian regime. He then called for civil disobedience, and this was at a time when protesters were constructing gallows at the front of a, fed, at a state parliamentary building. It comes on top of two years from Mr Christensen of boosting unproven and dangerous alternative COVID treatments. Now, during the time that Mr Kelly, Mr Craig Kelly, was a member of the Coalition Party Room, the Prime Minister stood idly by while he disseminated false COVID information misinformation on social media. Facebook has taken more action against Mr Kelly than the Prime Minister. So why hasn't the Prime Minister done anything? Well, when asked why his government had acted on Novak Djokovic and not coalition backbenchers, Mr. Mr Morrison said this, you're conflating two different issues. In Australia, if you're an Australian, you're a citizen, you can be here and you can express your views. Well, what a hollow and vacuous response that trivialises the issues at stake. It also serves to minimise the Prime Minister's responsibility, because the truth is that they are not merely Australian citizens, are they? They are members of the Prime Minister's party room. They are members of the government that he leads. He ought to take responsibility for their behaviour. Deputy Prime Minister Joyce took time out from texting to say this, what can we do? As, Immigration Minister Alex Hawke, as much as Immigration Minister Alex Hawke would like, he can't send any of our politicians to Serbia. Again, what a trivial response, because he's right. That's not an option for the PM. But I'll tell you what the Prime Minister could do. He could publicly rebuke them. He could have called them out in the party room meeting happened this week or in any other week. He could have cornered them for a private conversation, like he did with Bridget Archer when Ms Archer had the temerity to cross the floor last year. Why hasn't he done anything like this? I think it's pretty obvious because there is nothing in it for him. Because, as former Premier Berejiklian allegedly wrote, the Prime Minister puts politics before people. He never takes responsibility. But the Prime Minister's silence matters. The government's federal court submissions in the Djokovic matter make the point that anti-vaccine rhetoric can have a real impact on the health of individuals and the operation of Australia's health system. It means that people like Susan, the aged care nurse, have even more elderly and sick patients to care for and more difficult choices to make about who they are able to care for. But I tell you what, the health of our public debate matters as well. Any success that we have had in combating this pandemic is due in no small part to the willingness of the Australian people to band together and to make sacrifices. Australians have worn masks. They have stayed home from work and school. They have rescheduled their weddings. And heartbreakingly, some of them have had virtual funerals. The statements by some members of this coalition 
undermine that solidarity. They undermine the faith in science that has delivered the vaccines and the public health measures that have saved tens and thousands of Australian lives. And they undermine the trust in government and our public institutions that we will need to deal with the next pandemic or the next strain of this virus or indeed the next crisis that we confront as a nation. Because the problem is broader than the pandemic. By encouraging and standing beside extremists, government members and senators are legitimising them. There is something qualitatively different about protests that call people traitors, that seek to dehumanise them. And we've seen where that kind of politics leads in our history and in our global history. And it's not to a democratic place and it is not to a safe place. A leader of any integrity would call out the members of his own government who are spreading COVID misinformation, vaccine hesitancy and encouraging violent protest. But where is Mr Morrison? There may be nothing in it for Mr Morrison politically, but he should use the weight of his position to defend the integrity of our public debate, because that is the right thing to do. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Macdonald. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise in defence of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, not just for my colleagues, but for every single person in this place and indeed all of Australia. Western civilisation has been founded on the freedom to speak out, but Labor does not believe in free speech. Labor doesn't care about people, only ideologies that deny freedom for every parent, business owner, religious person and farmer. Surely the ability for every Australian to be fully engaged in this pandemic and its response is not only a good idea but it is a necessary idea for our mental health and for our recovery uh, from this situation. This is the most left-wing Labor opposition we have seen in decades. And after the last election, it's lurched, if possible, even more to the left. They're quick to condemn conservative politicians for speaking out, but silent when those of the left support Invasion Day, anti-Christian rhetoric, shaming of conservative women and calls for quotas. How many Labor and Greens MPs support socialism, communism, violent left-wing groups such as Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Do these groups get to express their views but others can't? Labor's double standards are a joke. Now, I don't agree with the stance taken by Mr Christensen and Senators Rennick and Antic, but I will fight every day for their right to represent those, those Australians who share their views, because Parliament should be the one place where we can have an open and vigorous debate, where we can contest ideas. This idea that these people are calling for harm upon pol police and politicians is truly outrageous. It is certainly not the actions and uh, words of these named members and senators. In fact, hundreds of thousands of Australians have raised these issues, have marched against mandates without incidents, because these are everyday men, women, children, from CEOs to pensioners, pilots, nurses, teachers. They are not enemies of the state. My office have taken scores of calls from doctors, nurses, tradies, truckies, lawyers, cleaners, parents, grandparents dairy farmers and others against mandates. And I and others in this place have public su publicly supported that view, while Senators Rennick and Antic and Mr Christensen are showing their support in different ways. Vaccination rates in Australia are amongst the highest in the world. Close to 90 per cent of people are getting their advice, their health advice, from doctors, not from politicians. However, it is not that long ago that in Queensland the chief health officer suggested that AstraZeneca 
was going to kill young people. And that was the beginning of serious concern in our community for the AstraZeneca vaccination. But it is Labor playing politics with public health. The Labor candidate for Higgins. Uh, in January of 2021, Dr Ananda Raja tweeted multiple times, undermining the effectiveness of, yes, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, she has also, uh, I'm sorry, the doctor has also criticised Doherty Institute Direct Shannon Lewin and ex-Victorian Deputy Chief Health Officer Alan Cheng for lacking any real expertise in pandemic planning or response. And as two of the Australia's foremost public health experts who have worked tirelessly to assist both the Commonwealth and state governments respond to the pandemic and to save lives, Professor Lewin and Dr Chen should be praised for their efforts. And indeed, Labor, this federal Labor opposition, is preferencing an independent COVID anti-vaxxer ahead of the nationals in the upcoming state by-election in Monaro. Extraordinary, the double standards. Now, to coin a now common phrase, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you in Labor look down on those people who have different views to you, Australians who hold different views, smear those with genuinely held concerns and beliefs as would-be thugs and murderers. You want to deny a person's lawful right to speak and protest because Labor is now the epitome of the new sneering elite. The unvaccinated are a minority, but they're not the correct type of minority for Labor, so their views and concerns don't matter. And instead of a crusade against freedom, how about you get into regional Queensland and ask what's important to them. Because in Queensland, my great state, it has been the sort of misinformation uh, that has been spread on social media after comments like those I've already just quoted. The vaccine hesitancy for AstraZeneca allowed, allowed a whole lot of views to grow up. And as a federal government, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been nothing short of world leading. We were able to stem the tide of COVID in this nation, to allow time for people to become vaccinated, to save jobs and save lives, to ensure that we now have an unemployment rate down to 4.2 per cent, that Australians are able to get off social security to have a job, to engage uh, in the world and the life that they want. Because the government's priority is the safety and well-being of all Australians. And to that end, have spent significant money and effort in combating misinformation. There is a COVID-19 misinformation portal, COVID-19 mythbusting on the australia.gov.au website that corrects myths and misinformation. The Department of Home Affairs reviews and refers online misinformation about COVID-19 to social media platforms to request its takedown. And $116.1 million has been committed to the national COVID-19 vaccine campaign. And we know that's been successful because look at our vaccination rates in this country. Because, as I said at the beginning, Australians generally take their medical advice from a health professional, not from politicians, which would be a wise, a wise decision. But this inf misinformation that's been allowed to spread has created genuine, genuine concern in people right across this nation. And it is our responsibility to talk to them to hold out our hand and listen and understand what those genuine concerns are and try and assist them to understand what is the best medical assistance, best medical advice for them, for their families, for their children. That is our role. 
It is not in any way to look down on these people as somehow being uh, wrong or stupid or certainly that they can't hold these views at all. That's not the sort of country we are. And the members and senators who have listened to those people, who are trying to represent their views and ensure that they are heard to allow for better government planning, better government responses, is only the right thing to do instead of this elitist, sneering response from Labor. This holier-than-thou, smarter-than-you, uh, inner-city kind of response that we in regional Australia are sick of. We're sick of feeling disconnected from Labor, of them having no understanding of the genuine industries uh, and infrastructure and concerns that we hold, because we are the part of the nation that does the mining, that, does the, that grows the agriculture and has the terrific communities that we're so very proud of. So I will, I will continue to defend the rights of Mr Christensen and Senators Antic and Rennick yeah, yeah. to support Australians right across this country who have genuine concerns, genuine misgivings, but it's our responsibility to assist them. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam, Acting Deputy, Madam Deputy President. I speak as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia. It's a matter of urgency that our elected parliamentary representatives are increasingly not a reflection of the typical everyday Australian. It's fundamental to our Australian democracy that people can demonstrate against incursions to their freedoms. I applaud any politician who has the guts and the integrity and the resolve to make a stand for the people, even if it is against their party line. Senator Chisholm has done well to show his true self in this MOU when he believes that only good order should reign at the expense of individual voices. Senator Chisholm clearly believes politicians ought not to use their public profile and status to represent the deep concerns of the people. Does Senator Chisholm suggest politicians use their high profile and status to be solely compliant and silent? I believe that politicians have a duty to listen to our con consciences and speak out when we believe it is not in the interest of the Australian people. Senator Chisholm's urgency motion says more about his narrow Labor perspective on life than it does about the topic or about the Australian people. Personally, I'm proud to stand beside anyone who has the courage of their convictions, who is brave enough to take their own popular stand and risk ridicule for their beliefs. I admire anyone, particularly politicians, who have not lost sight of the Australian people, our democracy, our values and freedoms, and will stand with the people regardless of the party line. I have done so and will proudly continue to do so. Senators Rennick, Antic and Mr George Christensen and Mr Craig Kelly have the medal to stand for a broader Australia. I support their efforts to question, expose and call out the deliberate misuse and abuse of science, the fraudulent use of science, as a basis for lockdowns and vaccine mandates. Senator Chisholm's motion has demonstrated his belief that there should be only one worldview held by all, held by everyone, and Senator Chisholm will decide what that view is, no matter how far removed this groupthink is from how Australians see ourselves. The good order of the Australian community requires both debate and dissent, compliance and cohesion, and most of all, robustness and honesty. Our social and democratic institutions, failing as they are to protect the rights and freedoms of the people, must be robust enough to, to embrace a debate from the people and from politicians who represent them. Why is there low and declining trust in MPs? Here's a quote from someone today. Declining trust in our institutions is not the problem. It is the solution. We need to have less of the institutions. It's a sad day when any politician whose career and life is predominantly political thinks that his narrow world perspective has any resonance, resonance with the Australian people at large. Senators Rennick, 
Antic and Mr Christensen are fighting for the people because they themselves are of the people, having carved out independent careers from the city to the land, facing uncertainties along the way. Senator Hanson and I have this same grounding in real life. From their actions, these representatives, like us, feel what the people are feeling. They know, as One Nation knows, that unnecessary lockdowns, debilitating and inhuman vaccine mandates and an absence of longitudinal testing on vaccines is just not good enough. They know that the people deserve better and are willing to stand up for what is right. They also talk about ivermectin, a, a proven, safe, effective, affordable, accessible treatment that has stopped COVID wherever it's been used properly. And the government falls silent on it, actually withdrew that from the people. The real matter of urgency here is that too many Labor, Liberal, National and Greens politicians do not have the courage to stand against this attack on our freedom and basic human rights. Too many in this place stand meek and silent while businesses fail and everyday Australians are coerced into a repeated, unproven medical experimental procedure in order to feed their families. To feed their families? It's time that gutless groupthink politicians are consigned to the bio-waste bin of history. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Ayres. Well, um, Madam Deputy President, um, this um, debate is in no way a debate about free speech. Australians have free speech. It's in no way a debate about the right to protest. Uh, I've been involved in plenty of protests. Um, this is a debate about political leadership uh, and about whether the office of Prime Minister is going to be used uh, for political leadership. Now, I listened carefully to Senator Macdonald and I, I have to say that I had no idea until this moment how degraded the Nationals' commitment to political liberalism has become. Former Senator Ron Boswell recognised the threat to Australian democracy that the One Nation Party posed, and he fought them and he opposed them right through Queensland in this place uh, and at the ballot box. Well, the modern National Party just seeks to incorporate them, incorporate those views. They don't recognise the threat to Australian democracy uh, that's posed by the kinds of views been put out there in a systematic way by Mr Christensen. Now, Mr Christensen, in the material that he propagates around the place, supports violent extremism. He cozies up to people who, let's call a spade a spade, are fascists. They are a threat to democracy. I had a look at Mr Christensen's website before coming in here. He caught support from some of the darkest recesses of far-right movements overseas. He has a page there that says, reject the Great Reset. It's got references in the usual anti-Semitic tropes used by these extremists to poor old Mr George Soros. I don't know what he ever did to offend these people, but it's the usual anti-Semitic tropes, new world order, global elites, the kind, the kind of terminology that on that side of this place and in Mr Morrison's office has become a plaything, a political plaything for people who don't recognise the seriousness of the threat and don't understand their political responsibility. This is not about free speech. People can say whatever they like. This is about whether Mr Morrison is prepared to act in the national interest, in the interests of Australian democracy and in the interests of what used to be the party that represented the liberalist trend in Australian political thinking, has now drifted, has now drifted to the far right not become more conservative not become more conservative because 
traditional conservatives are repulsed. The, the, the former leaders, former prime ministers, former liberal leaders, former national leaders, John McEwen, would be repulsed by this ideology that's been propagated by this group. Uh, in the United Kingdom, a Labor MP was murdered by people professing the same ideology propagated by Mr Christensen. More recently, a Conservative MP murdered doing their day-to-day -day work as politicians because people like Mr Johnson in the United Kingdom have decided in desperate political circumstances that it's okay to propagate far-right political conspiracy theories and mobilise people around those ideals to try and damage your political opponents. These things have consequences in our democracy. Nobody is arguing that people don't have the right to protest. Nobody is arguing that people don't have the capacity for free speech. What we're after is political leadership. And outside, of course there are people who have different views. More people should listen to the science about the COVID-19 pandemic, about the important role that vaccinations must play in keeping us all safe, about the role of the public health measures. There has been enormous pain in our community as a result of the public health measures that have had to be taken in no small part because of the failure of Mr Morrison to deliver vaccines on time, to get rapid antigen tests out there, to ensure that there's personal protective equipment in aged care. These are the things that have driven the pandemic and made things harder for ordinary Australians. But what we've got out the front that Senator Rennick and Senator Antic and Mr Christensen, old Red Pill Rennick and all the others down there urging it on is a group of fascists and fringe dwellers and some fixated persons. A person was arrested out there with a sawn-off rifle last week and there's people over here and Mr Morrison who think that's not a problem. Like, what does it take? for the modern Liberal Party and what passes for the National Party these days to take these things seriously. When people assemble outside parliaments with nooses, it has consequences. It's not reasonable debate. It's a threat of violence. I saw yesterday what happened to the British Labor leader with loops and extremists chasing him down the street. The good work of the protective services in the United Kingdom or what saved him from a very serious assault. Now the truth is Australians do not support this madness. They have voted with their feet. Well over 90 per cent have received two doses of the vaccine. Australians trust scientists. They trust healthcare professionals and they trust each other. Uh, but Mr Morrison has failed to stand up to the extremists on his own backbench. And we know why. In one of his occasional truth bombs—we had another one last week via text from Mr Joyce—Mr Joyce made it clear why Mr Morrison won't take Mr Christensen on. Because Mr Morrison relies upon Mr Christensen's vote over there in the House. And Mr Joyce relies upon Mr Christensen's vote in the National Party room. Not prepared, not an ounce of political courage or principle left in this Prime Minister. No courage, no principle has kowtowed to extremists, kowtowed to violent political extremism, and, it's, and as a consequence, it's become more and more prominent uh, in the Liberal Party. Now, uh, Mr Christensen still sits in the party room. 
He still has a vote in the caucus. Uh, and those opposite who know this man much better than we do have known this for a very long time about how dangerously off course he has gone. And I've said it. I wrote to Minister Andrews in November last year and to the Australian Federal Police when I saw threats of political violence, direct threats, made on Mr Christensen's Telegram account. Well, there's been crickets for Minister Andrews and crickets from Mr Morrison. No capacity, no capacity to stand up. And what do we have revealed today? But Mr Christensen is spending tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money every month, hundreds of thousands of dollars over his term in office, using taxpayers' money, public money, to propagate extremist political ideology and to make things worse, to undermine the public health message. And yet all we have here, and what I anticipate we're about to have, is some quizzling defence based on free speech as if anybody is arguing here about free speech. We just want a Prime Minister who puts the national interest first, who puts Australia first and puts Australian democracy first. And I'm afraid we're going to have to wait for an election before we get one. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Roberts. What we're witnessing this afternoon is Labor's attempt at a tawdry reinvention of Hillary Clinton's deplorables a comment which divided the United States society and saw she, who was going to be elected as the President of the United States, defeated by the people of Australia because of their repulsion at this sort of politics that Hillary Clinton failed to execute and, I predict, Labor will fail to execute with this tawdry motion. Isn't it amazing that this is that this motion is put forward by a Queensland senator, Queensland, which through its state Labor government was the government that sought to scare people from AstraZeneca. Oh, no mention of that in the contributions, no mention whatsoever. But in the motion, if you read it in detail, these gentlemen are being condemned for being even standing alongside certain people. Well, the acting leader in this place got caught out recently, didn't she? Standing alongside operatives of the Communist Party of China, that brutal dictatorship. And there she was standing alongside of such an operative. Do we, does the Labor Party condemn her for that? Stony silence. Or indeed, the acting leader of the Labor Party in this place, and I would suggest possibly unwittingly, appointed people that have now served jail terms to her ministry while she was pre a Premier of New South Wales. Or indeed, the Labor Party. How did they defend the criminally convicted Craig Thompson when he was sitting in the House of Representatives? And the list of Labor debacles in this space goes on and on. One wonders how this Labor motion even saw the light of day. The lack of self-awareness in this motion is genuinely and truly concerning. And in this debate, sure, there is a narrative at the moment as to the best way to deal with COVID, but let's remind ourselves that Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and not in the dark recesses of far-right clutches, but they have just determined to remove all barriers whatsoever in relation to COVID. No more mandates, no more mask wearing, no more limits on crowd numbers, <coughs> based on their medical advice. And so to suggest, listen to the science, is uh, often used as a mantra to shut others down, to cancel them. And there are alternate points of view held by men and women skilled in science, and often they are quoted by 
my colleagues. Do we agree with them? That's not the issue. The issue is do they have the right to put those views to the public? And they do. And look, just to remind people in this place, men and women of good faith and highly intelligent can actually come to differing conclusions on exactly the same matters. And I refer to the High Court. Seven men and women who are sworn into an office, who are of a high intellect, capable lawyers, they hear the same evidence, apply the same law, and then these seven men and women sometimes come down to a 4-3 decision. Are they somehow in the clutches of some conspiratorial force? No, they're not. They are men and women of good faith who have exercised a judgment in relation to a certain matter. And if high court judges can be so divided on these matters, why can't Australian citizens be divided in relation to mandates, mask wearing, or indeed whether they want to have a vaccine or not? And that is why, Madam Acting Deputy President, I have consistently been against the concept of mandates. I don't want to see a divided society. I don't want to see a two-tiered society based on those that are vaccinated and those that are not vaccinated. Those men and women who make a choice are entitled to their jobs. We are, as we speak, seeing university students in Tasmania being told you cannot continue with your studies if you are not vaccinated, as a result of which their dreams are shattered, the public is denied their expertise, and of course, halfway through, they've got a hex debt that they were expecting to pay off after graduation, now being denied that opportunity but still left with a debt. The same applies to TAFE in my home state of Tasmania. Completely unacceptable that apprentices should be denied the opportunity. We've got a shortage of tradesmen. We've got a shortage of nurses and all sorts of people, of doctors and surgeons, and they're now being denied the right to practice and being a service to the community. So I happen to be pro-vaccination but anti-mandates. And that is a right and proper position to hold, and I will defend it uh, most uh, vehemently for those that have an alternate view to mine in relation to vaccination. My view has always been that in this debate we should seek to educate and not discriminate. We should seek to convince and not coerce. That is the way a civilised society and community seeks to go about a discussion. And yes, my, uh, what I would say to uh, colleagues and others, if you are so convinced of your position, you should have no fear of an opposite view being put to you. If anything, your counter to that view will show that your initial view is in fact correct. Whereas if you cannot counter it properly, what it informs you to do is to nuance your position to accept that that which has been countering your view has some merit to it and you need to adjust your uh, position. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, what is most disappointing about this debate, not only Labor's hypocrisy in putting forward this motion, but it's the relentless negativity and failure of Labor to put forward an alternate point of view, an alternate platform. Where are they in this debate? Their big criticism is three members of the coalition. You know what? The average Australian is not concerned about two senators and a House of Reps member. They're concerned about the fundamentals of Australian government. Things like, and allow me to read this list, and that is why the Australian Labor Party don't want to talk real policy, but we have had 1.1 million jobs created since the pandemic hit. How about a motion of congratulations in relation to that? Deathly silence from Labor. 11.5 million Australians benefiting from tax relief. 700,000 jobs saved through JobKeeper, 
71.3 per cent of trade and exports are now covered by free trade agreements. 815,600 female business operators in Australia as of August 2021. 220,000 trade apprentices, a record high. 20 per cent reduction in emissions since 2005. Electricity bills down 8 per cent in the past two years. They're the sort of things people talk about. Apprenticeships for their sons and daughters. Their electricity bill. How can they afford to pay it? These are the real issues, and that is what a former Labor Party used to discuss on a regular basis. But today, no, 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 those cost of living issues, those things that are actually discussed under the corrugated iron roofs of our suburbs are no longer the matters that excite the interest of the Australian Labor Party. What excites them are the political stunts and the attempts to try to divide our society between their elitist view of the world, and if anybody disagrees with it, they need to be shut down. But in the moments left, how about 1,213 major transport projects supporting 100,000 jobs? Over 99 per cent of homes and businesses with NBN access. Madam Acting Deputy President, despite the COVID, the Morrison government has done a fantastic job, and all that Labor can point to is some illusory view about three coalition Order, backbenchers. Senator Abetz. Senator Wish Wilson. To you, Deputy President, uh, to quote Russell Crowe from Gladiator, Senator Abetz, the time for honouring yourself and your government will soon be at an end. Uh, sitting here listening to the achievements of this government, no wonder Australians are so exasperated, so frustrated and despairing at the state of politics in this country. We have maybe five days, five days in this parliament this year, that's it, five sitting days before almost certainly an election, which has to be held for this august chamber by the 22nd of May. And what do we have on the agenda? We have a government fighting culture wars, bringing in a religious discrimination bill to discriminate against transgender individuals, citizens in this country, who have rights. We see exchanges of text messages in the media making up the bulk of news stories between senior members of the LNP, Mr Peter Dutton in the other place, and the Prime Minister, Barn Mr Barnaby Joyce, calling the Prime Minister a psycho and a psychopath and who knows what else. This government is just a long series of dumpster fires. This parliament has been non-stop chaos. Scandal, corruption, and in just a few months' time, in fact, in less than 100 days, Australians have a chance to go to the polls and take back the power, take back the power from this government. I and many other Australians are most despairing of the fact that this chaos is distracting from so many important things and so much reform we need in this place. The great challenges of our time. And I accept that COVID has been a very difficult few years for all of us and for all Australians, in fact, the whole international community, and we're not out of the woods yet. But we also are still seeing a relentless assault on our environment by big corporations, hell-bent on propping up their balance sheets, hell-bent on growing their earnings per share so they can keep their share prices up, going out and exploring 80,000 kilometres of new ocean acreage for oil and gas at a time when the International Energy Agency tells us that 2021 has to be the last year 
of oil and gas exploration on this planet. If we were to stick to 1.5 degree warming, I despair when I look at my home state of Tasmania, where the Tarkine is still under assault. Mining company MMG wants to go in to some of the most precious Gondwana rainforests left on this planet, where just recently the Bob Brown Foundation released information that it's a breeding ground for the rare and endangered masked owls, a company that just cares about money and its own profits, building a toxic tailing stand on a beautiful river in the Tarkine in Gondwana Forest, and in Blue Derby, where mountain biking has turned that town into a transition town. So-called Sustainable Timbers Tasmania want to log right up to the mountain bike tracks, even though the reason that this place has been so successful is because of its beauty and its rareness and its geology. It is on the international map, and yet we still want to log it, even after millions, tens of millions of dollars of federal and state money have gone into investing in a different future to forestry. But we just can't let go. And we see uh, oil and gas companies, as usual, getting the run of the roost in this place. Well, um, Acting Deputy President, it will be different in three months' time. I have absolute faith and confidence that Australians have had enough of the chaos and enough of the corruption and they want change. I believe that and I believe I will be vindicated on election night. We can take this country in a new direction. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And it's just interesting to listen to the contributions uh, this evening uh, by senators in this place. I guess for the past two years, Australians have come together to get through this pandemic. And I, essentially, that's been the core message uh, from the motion of Senator Chisholm, how many Australians are coming together and have come together to get through these very difficult and unprecedented times. However, by respecting um, one another and receiving advice from leaders and experts, we have kept our friends and families and many other loved ones uh, throughout our various communities in which we represent, uh, uh, which are represented in this place safe. Of course, there have been rules that have been difficult to follow um, and there have been different rules in different parts of the country. But some directions that might not have been um, intuitive sense to some of us, but the vast majority of Australians have understood that defeating COVID is the core goal here. Defeating COVID is important because if we don't, then there will be other consequences that we'll face. And what we are seeing around the world is those that have not been at the front of the curve. We've seen thousands upon thousands upon thousands of deaths every single week. But despite the uh, Morrison-Joyce government completely bungling the vaccine rollout, most Australians have turned up to get their jab as soon as they could. But one must say that was because of many decisions that were taken by state governments rather than by the federal government. And many of these Australians, in fact over 90 per cent of these Australians, the vast majority of Australians have trusted the science. They've trusted their doctors. They have trusted the many experts in the healthcare professions. And they got vaccinated, not just to protect themselves, but to protect their loved ones. Now, this trust is, as fuss is the very foundation of our society. None of us can be an expert on everything. And I don't think anyone in this place claims to be. But we do trust in others to provide us with that advice and the guidance on very complicated and complex issues. That's why we have departments. That's why we do listen to experts. And I know there are many, many individuals in this place and in the other place who are very sceptical about some of the advice that they receive. But thankfully, the vast majority of us do take on advice from scientists. Certain members of the government, 
and many have been outlined in uh, Senator Chisholm's motion, have consistently undermined and attacked the information that Australians are relying on to keep them safe. And that is core to our debate today. Members of this government have used their platforms as elected representatives to spread mistruths and disinformation about vaccines and about other important public health measures. You know, it's interesting to listen to those opposites who claim that we somehow are lecturing them, but you do listen to the contributions that were made. And one might have to say that uh, you know, it is a bit of a lecture from others to tell us that we are wrong when we point out the very point that when we do listen to health experts, that they should be taken seriously. Yes, they can be critiqued, and yes, we should be able to question the advice. But at the end of the day, when you have multiple, multiple health experts around the country in very different jurisdictions saying the same thing, one has to say, how can they be wrong? But these members of the government have stoked the flames of division in our communities, feeding the worst of our instincts. They have done their best to turn Australians against each other rather than uniting them. And thanks to those, some Australians now no longer trust their family doctor. And if you believe some of their harmful ideas, our hardworking nurses and paramedics are all part of a worldwide conspiracy instead of the selfless heroes that most of us know that they are. So instead of focusing on creating jobs and cutting bills, members of this government are detracting from the efforts of all Australians to beat this virus Order. and get Senator on with their Shikani. lives. Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Deputy President, I had a more fulsome speech prepared, but given the lateness of the hour, I won't. So I'll just make this point. Getting vaccinated is a sensible and responsible thing to do, and that's why West, uh, Australians have taken up the opportunity to go and do that. But I have to say I am against the mandation of vaccination. In my home state, we are seeing uh, extraordinary measures being taken to uh, coerce people to get vaccinated. As I said, it's a sensible and responsible thing to do. I myself am triple dosed, uh, and I encourage people to do it. But you can't even go to a drive through bottle shop in Western Australia without showing your vaccination certificate. That's just a vindictive attitude that I think the state government has taken uh, against Western Australians, that on the balance of all the evidence they've got, they have decided for themselves that they don't want that medical procedure. Now, they're only putting themselves at risk. The data is showing that you're protecting yourself but it's not doing much actually to reduce transmission. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, it being 7.20 p.m., pursuant to order agreed to earlier today, the debate is now interrupted and I will put the question. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. I'll just give the whips a few more moments. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the nose.
There being 24 ayes and 27 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Uh, I'll give senators a moment to leave the chamber. I will be calling the clerk. We will be moving to government business. I'll call the clerk. Please leave the chamber as silently as possible unless you are participating in the upcoming debate. Government Business Orders of the Day number 1, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform, Maeve's Law Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Watt, I believe you are in continuation. You believe correctly, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, if I can just have a moment to assemble my papers, thoughts and various other things. Um, just resuming where I left off earlier today, uh, where I did outline at the outset that the Labor caucus has uh, decided to uh, approach this bill uh, as a matter of conscience uh, for our members, uh, I outlined that I would be supporting the bill, and I'll explain why a little bit further into my contribution here. Uh, but I think. What I was sort of doing it earlier today was simply explaining some of the uh, factual basis around what the bill is proposing to do. And where I think I left off, I was sort of distinguishing between uh, two of the different techniques which are under consideration within this bill. Um, and I was outlining that uh, the two techniques uh, for mitochondrial donation are known as maternal spindle transfer and pro-nuclear transfer. Uh, maternal spindle transfer means the transfer of the nuclear DNA from the mother into the donor egg, which happens before the fertilisation of the egg. It happens before the donor's egg is fertilised by the father's sperm. The second technique, known as pro-nuclear transfer, involves both eggs, both the donor's egg and the mother's egg being fertilised. The mother's nuclear DNA is removed from her fertilised egg and inserted into the donor's fertilised egg, which has its pro-nuclear DNA removed. The reason I just go over that again is that it is an important distinction, um, especially as we all are considering uh, our views on this bill, uh, because the pro-nuclear transfer happens after the fertilisation of the egg. The mother's fertilised egg is then destroyed. Um, as I said, the debate and vote for this bill will be a matter of conscience for members of the Labor Party caucus due to its sensitive nature. This is an extremely delicate issue that raises some very deeply held, serious ethical and faith-based beliefs by many in our community. Sadly, mitochondrial disease often has a human consequence, uh, and that is one of the reasons for my decision to support this bill. Um, it can be fatal for very young children, causing enormous grief and real suffering to their families. And there are hundreds of heartbreaking examples, and just to go through a couple. Baby Chloe Metz was conceived via IVF and was born happy and healthy to first-time parents Joanne and Alan. At just six weeks old, a specialist broke the news that their beautiful baby girl may have mitochondrial disease, but there was no treatment or cure for the disease. Their bundle of joy was in good health until her immunisations triggered an episode of acute distress and led to an imbalance of chemicals in her little body. The mito episodes were unpredictable and traumatic. Chloe was in and out of hospital for about six weeks. A series of medications kept her relatively stable right up until her final day. Her parents say that she kept people guessing from the moment she was born until the very moment they lost her. Chloe was diagnosed with mitochondrial respiratory chain disorder. Her parents were told there was only one other case with the same genetic mutation. Joanne then discovered she carries the same mutation, but she's never shown any symptoms. Now, she and her husband are in a process of understanding what the mutation means for their family. They believe that legalised mitochondrial donation would give them an opportunity to have a child that doesn't have to experience the same devastating impacts of mitochondrial disease that Chloe did. They are holding on to hope that mitochondrial donation will be an available option. And they're not alone. Bethany Hodge grew up watching her sister suffer the symptoms of mitochondrial disease, including tremors in her hands, balance issues, hearing loss, speech impairment and intellectual delay. Her family knew there was something wrong, 
but doctors could determine uh, sorry, but doctors could not determine the cause of her symptoms or what could be done to help Bethany's sister. After suffering with no solution for years, Bethany's sister was eventually diagnosed with a type of mitochondrial disease called MERRF, or myo myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibres. It was soon discovered that Bethany, her mother and her brother were also carriers of this disease. Bethany grew up watching her sister suffer through the pain of this disease uh, which makes it difficult to eat, dress herself, read and write. Now Bethany is ready to start a family of her own and is terrified to pass on that pain to her children. As Bethany said, mitochondrial donation would allow my partner and I to start a family with peace of mind. It will stop this vicious cycle of it being passed on from generation to generation. Now, uh, as I say, I recognise that there are a range of views on this bill, both within the Labor caucus and across this chamber, and it is important that uh, these matters get proper consideration uh, and that all of the ethical, medical and other factors concerning it are fully examined. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the work that a range of groups have done to really examine this bill and to examine uh, the potential role and, and ethics surrounding mitochondrial donation. Um, a Senate inquiry was held a couple of years ago looking at this matter, and I was a member of the committee uh, that undertook that inquiry. Of course, there's been a more recent uh, inquiry in relation to this bill itself. And since that initial Senate inquiry, uh, there's also been an NHMRC review. The Department of Health has issued a discussion paper which has given uh, members of the public an opportunity to have their say on something that is really important and a challenging topic. Uh, for me, I consider that this bill is an important step in ensuring that families like Joanne's and Bethany's can live without the devastating pain that this disease causes. I recognise once again that mitochondrial donation is a scientific development that members of our community may, may struggle with. Uh, and that's why I think it is important that what this, propel, this bill proposes is a pretty cautious uh, approach uh, to implementing uh, or to allowing mitochondrial donation to occur. Initially, what is proposed is for its application in research uh, before empowering the creation of regulations, uh, which would allow for uh, wider implementation of mitochondrial uh, donation. Uh, but one of the reasons why I am comfortable supporting this bill is because I do think that it is putting forward a, a highly regulated framework that does take into account ethical considerations uh, that requires more re research to be undertaken as well. And I feel that there are some good parameters being put around um, the adoption of what is a, a, a challenging uh, and new technology. I believe that this bill has struck the balance between addressing the ethical concerns of members of the public by providing a regulated, careful rollout, while also providing a path forward to improve the quality of life for thousands of Australian families. Um, mitochondrial donation, as I say, if this bill is passed, will be introduced in a staged way, uh, and I think that is the right approach uh, for something uh, that is a challenging topic like this. Uh, so, in summary, uh, because of the uh, real benefits that I think that this will provide to thousands of Australians, uh, because of the way that ethical considerations have been dealt with in this bill and the regulated framework that is being put forward, uh, I'm personally offering my support for the bill and I will be voting for it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Acting President. Mitochondrial diseases are significant, life-limiting, serious diseases. In Australia, each year around 56 children are born with mitochondrial diseases. These diseases develop as a result of genetic faults within uh, the DNA in our cells' mitochondria, part of our cells that provide uh, the very power for the body's cells themselves. When a fault in the mitochondria is transferred from the parent's egg uh, to a child, there is a likelihood that the child will be born uh, with mitochondrial disease. This bill uh, before us today moves us closer to granting uh, people uh, the ability to make a choice when they are considering conceiving a child. This choice enables a medical procedure 
uh, that would allow people to decide not to pass this genetic abnormality onto their child. Passing Maeve's law through the Senate will allow parents with a high likelihood of having a child who will develop mitochondrial disease to be a step closer to choose to undergo a procedure to replace the mitochondrial uh, to replace the mitochondrial that has a genetic abnormality with a mitochondria from a, from a donor egg. After careful consideration, I have decided that I will be supporting this legislation. Now, I have heard firsthand um, at the experiences of families that have journeyed with the impact of mitochondrial diseases, and I've had first-hand experience of children born with these diseases too. I want to emphasise to the Senate that it is a significant multi-systemic and progressive disease. It can impact your heart, your muscles, your brain and much, much more. It leads to multiple organ failure and can be deeply unpredictable in its nature. Indeed, the, life, the average life expectancy is between 3 to 12. It is clear from the evidence that has been presented to the multiple inquiries that have played an integral part in pulling this piece of legislation together that this is, without a doubt, a devastating, life-threatening disease. I'd like also to acknowledge that this bill, as written, commences with a stage one, a phase defined as a research and clinical trial phase. It is anticipated that this stage is expected to take around 10 years. In speaking to parents, it is clear that while there is hope in the passage of this bill, it is in its nature bittersweet for those who are wanting to reduce the likelihood of transfer now. This is especially true as mitochondrial donation has been legalised in the United Kingdom since 2015, with the first donations procedure occurring in 2018. Uh, for, this, the U, uh, for this UK example, assessments were completed and parents carrying mutations on a gene that would cause a rare mitochondrial disease called uh, MERRF uh, syndrome. This syndrome can be devastating uh, and neurodegener neurodegenerative in its nature, a disorder that worsens over time, often resulting in early death after losing muscle control and experiencing dementia. It is examples like this uh, that are exactly why we must commence making this procedure available to those who need it as soon as it is safe to do so. We also need to ensure that funding for rare diseases is continued to be made available. The Greens support ensuring people with rare conditions including mitochondrial diseases, are provided with wraparound healthcare services uh, for the person with the disease, their families and their support networks. I call on the government to, to prioritise funding uh, for research, including resourcing organisations that are doing much of the heavy lifting in this area, uh, particularly the Mitochondrial Foundation. And I am proud in making this speech uh, to where a pin in solidarity with the Foundation tonight. I will close by thanking the many people who have campaigned for and enabled this change. It has been many years in the making to get to this point. Those passionate about this banner have participated in the 2018 inquiry into the science of mitochondrial donation at the National Health and Medical Research Centre Community Consultation in 2019 and in 2020, uh, through to the Department of Health's uh, process early in 2021. 
Often when supporting someone through significant illnesses or experiencing one ourselves, it can feel as though change is slow and hard to come by. Today is one of those historic moments where the community uh, and its voice collectively has been heard by people in this place and we get the opportunity to take a major step forward together. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much. Acting Deputy President, and I rise tonight to speak on the mitochondrial donation law reform bill before the chamber. In July of last year, the World Health Organisation released a report detailing some of the ethical concerns raised by genetic interventions, such as mitochondrial DNA donation. The report presented a number of important questions with regard to this new technology. Questions such as who should have access to it? Who should make and enforce regulations for human gene editing? Indeed, questions such as should we be editing the genetic makeup of humans at all? Now, these are some of the questions which were presented and, what, and also questions that we are presented here in the Senate today as we discuss and debate this bill in greater detail. The same questions that we are each seeking to find answers to. There is no denying that these questions are for most deeply personal. The views of both advocates and opponents are often informed by their own lived experiences, some of them traumatic, by their values and their faith. Let me at the outset state that I respect all these views. And whilst my own personal decision as to how I vote on this issue may be different to what others might wish for, I hope that together we can all recognise the validity of other people's decisions that which informs them. Acting Deputy President, there are for the most part two different techniques that can be employed to facilitate mitochondrial DNA donation, the pronuclear transfer and the maternal spindle transfer. The pronuclear transfer involves the creation of two embryos from which parts of each would be removed to then create a third, with the first two being disposed of. The maternal spindle transfer, on the other hand, uses a separate process which avoids the destruction of two embryos, but also involves three genetic parents and the associated difficulties of a threefold shared lineage. The instrumentalisation of the human embryo in this way, the use of a human embryo as merely as part of a production process, is a proposition that we as a society must consider whether we are comfortable with. It is the ethical challenge which is before us. At this stage, we still don't know everything about mitochondrial donation. The science behind it is complex and makes it difficult to determine whether this technology currently is completely safe and effective. As with many other new medical technology, the risks associated with mitochondrial donation are still unknown. Many scientists and clinicians suggest there are too many questions around mitochondrial that still need answering. Indeed, one might suggest that the divisive nature of this subject is proof enough that we may be pushing the boundaries of nature beyond a morally acceptable level, especially when the consequences are potentially so severe. Now, I do share concerns about this technology, and I hold concerns about what it does, what it might do, and what it means for us as human beings to employ this technology in the way that this bill is currently drafted, which would propose what we should do. While it's true that mitochondrial donation has 
the capacity to create heritable changes in DNA that could have significant benefits in the prevention of a disability or disease. We're also confronted with the many questions which I alluded to earlier. At what cost do we decide to forego legitimate ethical concerns? Surely it is incumbent upon us to acknowledge the unknown impact of some of these changes, the inability of future generations to provide consent to these changes, the implications of altering a person's genetic composition. We do not know how much mitochondrial DNA is transferred from the mother's affected eggs during the process of mitochondrial donation. Studies have shown incidents of carryover of mitochondria from the woman with mitochondrial DNA disease into the reconstructed embryo, presenting a potentially new risk factor for mitochondrial DNA disease in the child. In fact, mitochondrial DNA carried over from the woman with the mitochondrial DNA disease may have a greater chance to replicate than donor mitochondrial DNA. It is also unclear whether mitochondrial donation could result in significant changes to the development of the embryo in comparison to normal embryo development. Whether the nucleus transferred from the mother's egg must adapt to the donor's egg is still being investigated. Specifically, whether this adaption could compromise the reconstructed egg's development. There is also debate as to whether compatibility between the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA is important. Some studies have shown a mismatch could compromise metabolism and overall health. But again, there is still very limited data available. With so many questions yet to be answered, how could we in good conscience approve of such an intervention? In considering this bill, the Senate must also have regard to the interests and well-being of the people that will be born from mitochondrial donation. What consideration is given to the rights of the child? Those born as a result of the donation have no say in the procedure or the consequences that follow it. The experimental nature of mitochondrial donation is likely to necessitate continual follow-up over the child's lifespan. And whilst this is true of many medical interventions, is it fair to expect this of someone who's had no say in how they were brought into this world? Information relating to the health and well-being of a person born of mitochondrial donation and future generations is still required to better understand the science. However, this information cannot be gathered unless families also provide consent to follow up. Prospective parents have a choice. They have a choice in their pursuit of conceiving a child. They do so on behalf of someone that is yet to be born. One might argue that the child will simply be grateful to be born. But there is no way to know whether the child may feel conflicted as their personal beliefs and values develop over time? Would they feel comfortable knowing that their parents made a decision that has or could have severely compromised their existence? How will this impact the child's relationship with their parents? The social implications of mitochondrial donation are also significant. And beyond their immediate family, would the child want to know or foster a relationship with the mitochondrial DNA donor. It is true that the contribution of DNA from the donor is very small. However, this does not detract from the fact that it took three parents to bring said child into the world. The genetic relationship between an egg donor and child born, a mitochondrial donation, is extremely complex. And I just don't think anyone in this place would argue against that. An egg donor's nuclear DNA would not be
be present in the child, as only mitochondrial DNA would remain in the implanted embryo. However, if one or both parties were to value the donated mitochondrial DNA differently, it could be cause for major distress. Madam Acting Deputy President, consideration must also be given to the status of the embryo. Some, such as myself, firmly believe that life begins at conception, and the process of mitochondrial donation involves the use and destruction of human embryos. A morally significant component in the creation of new life. As the earliest stage of development in a human being's life, an embryo should be considered precious. In Australia, we already have assisted reproductive technology in the form of IVF. The use of IVF with egg donation is an option which is already legal and allows parents to be able to have the opportunity to have a child without the risk of having mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial donation is distinct from the traditional IVF, as it involves a third party in the production of an embryo. Using IVF to produce embryos that result in the birth of a child is one thing, but if mitochondrial donation were to be approved in Australia, it would involve the creation of embryos with no intention of fostering life births. Instead, embryos would be used for, for scientific purpose that involves the experimentation and destruction of a morally significant component of human life. And this is already evident in the United Kingdom, where despite the procedure being legal for five years and the regulating authority having already approved pregnancies, there is yet to be any reported life births resulting from the mitochondrial donation technique. Further, the prohibition of human cloning for the Reproduction Act of 2002 and the research involving Human Embryos Act of 2002 make it an offence to create, for the purposes of reproduction, a human embryo that contains the genetic material of more than two people. They also specify that it is an offence to create, for the purposes of reproduction, a human embryo that contains heritable changes to the genome. Mitochondrial donation involves both interventions. Legislators pass these laws to prohibit such interventions because the consensus back then was that they were inherently wrong. Legislation was passed under the premise that the interventions of this nature cannot and should not be justified, irrespective of the good intentions that may motivate such interventions. Performing one of these procedures would be a serious breach of these established ethical boundaries. And we must question why these boundaries should no longer be respected. I sympathise with prospective parents wanting to use mitochondrial donation to have a healthy child. Who doesn't want to have a healthy child? However, just because we can do something does not mean that we should, nor does it mean it is ethical. The reality of this decision is that there are no harm options. We must inevitably make a decision on where this harm will fall. Allowing mitochondrial donation through pro-nuclear transfer would involve creating human embryos with an intent to destroy them, turning them into a therapeutic product that degrades and strips them of inherent human dignity. We must question what precedent this process would establish. We are at a crossroads with this decision here in the Senate. As the genetic manipulation of our own evolution has never precisely been possible, the power, genetic, the molecular biology research and technology has bestowed upon us should not be taken lightly, as we now have the capacity to shape the future of humanity from its earliest stages of development. Stepping down this path 
would permit us to take over our own genetic evolution. This is a reality, Madam Acting Deputy President, that I struggle to feel comfortable with. Thank you, Senator Giovanni. Senator O'Sullivan. President, I rise today to speak on the mitochondrial donation law reform bill 2021, known as Mies Law. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, before I outline to the Senate my thoughts on this bill, and I indicate here that I, I will be opposing this bill on moral grounds, I think it's reflect, worth reflecting on the mature and sober manner in which this debate has been conducted, uh, not just here, and as a terrific contribution by my colleague Senator Raf Ciccone, uh, but also by colleagues over in the, the House of Representatives. Uh, a conscious vote uh, has been exercised by both parties on the consideration and uh, in amending this bill, uh, and so it should have been. Uh, this is good that this is happening in this regard. Now, while the debates and shenanigans in Parliament can border on or even enter into the pantomime, uh, Australians should be rest assured that when it comes down to it, although democracy can be messy, it is, of course, the best form of government and it gets things done. Uh, reading and listening to speakers and speeches on this issue uh, on both sides of this debate has been very insightful. And uh, we've seen uh, the unique position where there's some on the other side that are agreeing with others on this side and vice versa. And it's, uh, uh, it's great to see this happen. Uh, you can't always say that about uh, political speeches. They don't always uh, bring, I guess, the, the very best uh, out uh, in this sort of occupation. Uh, but this bill is different. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, as I stated before, I will be opposing this bill. Uh, while I appreciate its intention and honour those that have lobbied for it, this bill presents some serious moral issues to me, and I do not believe that the appropriate safeguards are there and have been enacted to prevent the worst excesses of this science. I do, however, note and endorse the amendment that was passed in the House of Representatives preventing sex selective procedures. And this is a good amendment and, and vital. Uh, but at this time I pause just to acknowledge uh, the many people that have reached out to me, particularly those uh, from the Mitochondrial Foundation and uh, family members or friends or fa uh, you know, community that have been touched by this disease. And I, uh, I can't imagine what it's like to, to get that news that your child has uh, inherited this gene and, uh, and is suffering from this disease. I, I, as a parent, um, you know, you obviously you want the very best for your children. To get that sort of news, it must, be, it must just be absolutely um, heartbreaking. And, and I know you, you do everything you can for your children and, you know, and for parents to find out that they, they can, or potential parents finding out that they're carriers of the gene uh, the, the, the trauma and, and the, you know, the, the difficulty maybe in hearing a speech like this where all you want to do is, is be able to have a child uh, of your own. And, and so I, I acknowledge that and I accept that, accept that maybe my position on this bill um, you know, might not uh, be the kind of uh, support that you would love to have had. Uh, I do respect that and appreciate that. Uh, I would like to pay tribute to the member for Menzies, uh, the Honourable Kevin Andrews. Uh, sadly, he's going to be leaving uh, Parliament uh, at the end of this term, uh, but he's left a wonderful legacy. Uh, but one of the things that he did uh, more recently is he contributed by, in the other place by way of a number of amendments that I think had they passed, they would have made a significant contribution to this bill and made it a much more balanced and acceptable bill. And uh, if amendments such as those, and I believe there might be uh, similar amendments, uh, They've been foreshadowed to, to come into this place. I'll certainly be considering them and, uh, and more than likely passing them if they're in the form of what uh, many of those amendments were in the House of Representatives. Uh, so, uh, this being said, uh, the fundamental biological truth of two parents coming together to create a child is, is not one that I could vote for to alter. The comparisons to organ donation are disingenuous, as it does not result in DNA being passed on. Uh, speaking the other place, the, the member for New England, the Deputy Prime Minister, he put it well, and I'm sure he won't mind me 
uh, quoting him verbatim here. Uh, he said there's not a parabola of rights where at certain ages through your life you have absolute rights and that those rights dwindle towards the end and they somehow dwindle towards the start of your life. This very much echoes my position. The idea that a life or what could amount to a life is created simply to be harvested and destroyed seems dystopian and wrong to me. And despite what good may come from it, there is always ways that technology deployed uh, could really um, interfere with that. Uh, despite the best intentions of this bill, I will uh, beg your pardon, it will eventually create embryos with the genetic material of three adults while destroying another embryo or zygotes. It is for this reason in particular that I cannot support this bill. As someone who believes that life does begin at conception, the idea of using three embryos simply as a source of genetic materials is an anathema to me. Were uh, the amendments preventing this type of procedure passed, then uh, perhaps this bill could have been considered differently. Uh, two of the five methods outlined in this bill do not require the destruction of embryos and zygotes. Uh, and I hope that research will focus on, on this area, uh, but I do, of course, still have that issue around uh, three genetic uh, parent, you know, impacting. Uh, I also note that uh, although this technology uh, has been legalised in the United Kingdom for roughly five years, there's not been any viable births as a result. Uh, it's not as if this technology is widely embraced around the world and providing results, and it's banned in many jurisdictions. The United Kingdom has also not raised or released beg your, beg your pardon, any data on the efficacy of the project, and this causes me concern. Uh, I was involved in a, uh, in a briefing uh, by experts in this area, and it was a question that was raised, and they couldn't provide it because they cited privacy reasons. Now, that may be that there's a uh, few people that uh, have actually engaged in this, and while it might not be revealed to me directly if they release the data, who that the identity of that person, but of course, you know, if there are individuals close, uh, you know, sometimes those uh, by just releasing data, you can uh, you can potentially breach breach the privacy of those individuals that are uh, participated in in such a program. But uh, it, it really concerned me that there wasn't, you know, we're, we're trying to make a decision on whether or not. Uh, the efficacy of this program is, is justifies the, uh, you know, a change in, in law, and uh, not having that data really meant that uh, you know, I couldn't have any confidence that we're doing the right thing. Uh, so while there have been reports of this procedure producing a viable birth in Mexico and the Ukraine, neither of these two countries have explicitly legalised the technique, and no, no medical journal has ever verified this. The World Health Organisation has also cautioned against editing the human genome in a way that can be passed on to future generations, while the United States has outlawed mitochondrial donation trials. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I do not understand the need for Australia to rush into this area of medical research. Concerningly contained within the legislation are immunities from civil liberty for ministers and civil servants. So this kind of implies that some uncertainty around the long-term effects of the procedure. And while I generally support the attitude of, you know, at your own risk, uh, this does raise some serious questions over informed consent in this case. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I would again like to thank those on both sides who have put their thoughts forward in a respectful and well-intentioned way, and certainly from those uh, that are advocating strongly for this, uh, the way that they've approached us. We don't always get approached on issues. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues can attest to this in, a, in, a, in such a uh, respectful and um, uh, collegiate and responsible way uh, on issues. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. But uh, certainly those involved in this uh, topic have uh, certainly conducted themselves. Um, you know, I've very much learnt and I appreciate uh, the time and the effort that's been put in by them. Uh, I have given careful thought uh, to this uh, and I expect that the bill will probably pass, uh, probably on similar ratios that we saw in the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, and this bill will pass with or without my support. 
Uh, but that being said, and for the reasons that I've outlined here today, I cannot support it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, I, I don't intend to speak on the provisions of this bill. Other speakers have already explained it in detail how it works. And I also don't intend to speak about the arguments in favour of the bill. These have been very well canvassed and will no doubt be explored much further. Instead, I want to talk about love. It's not something we often discuss in this chamber, but it lies at the heart of so much of what we do. As senators, there are issues and policies we advocate for because they are sensible or rational solutions to problems that exist. But there are other things we advocate for, things we champion out of love, things that are very much close to our hearts, things we desperately want to see done, things that give us a reason to be here. The bill we are debating today is not a matter of love for everyone. Some will vote with their heads. Some will vote based on their religious beliefs. And some will vote with their hearts. But this bill is certainly a labour of love for some. Some senators, some members of the other place. And most importantly, some Australians whose lives have been touched by mitochondrial disease. What they want to see is change, a relatively small change in law, but one with massive ramifications for those trying to understand, treat and prevent mitochondrial disease. Their motivation is not personal gain. Far from it. Their motivation is not fame or fortune. Their motivation is simply to reduce the amount of suffering, incredible and needless suffering, in this world. That change would allow for changes to be made to the human genome. And I appreciate there are those, particularly in some religious circles, who do not think this is appropriate. Their view is that this is not a utilitarian matter, not a question of costs and benefits, but a matter of principle and of duty. And I can see how that fits with their beliefs, their values and their ethics. But there are some moral issues where the pros so outweigh the cons. And this is very much one of them. This issue, mitochondrial donation, is a very important issue that this chamber needs to deal with and deal with in this sitting period. Back in 2018, I participated into the inquiry into the science of mitochondrial donation. It was one of the most powerful and gut-wrenching hearings I have been involved with. What I heard and what I learnt has stayed with me for many years. Mitochondrial disease is not just a medical condition. It's not like flu or a scraped knee. It's not a mild irritant that will soon pass. It is a death sentence. Think about that for a moment. It is a death sentence. No doubt about that at all. And a death sentence which is delivered before a child even takes his or her first breath. A death sentence which will only come after months, years or even decades of distress, pain and suffering. A death sentence which condemns families to anguished lives of seeing their child live the worst possible life. It's a death sentence which leaves bereaved mothers unable to conceive out of fear of the same tragic fate that awaits their next child. I simply cannot imagine anything worse. I cannot imagine the amount of suffering and anguish and pain this awful disease imposes on people. And it affects many people. Potentially one in 5,000 Australians are born with mitochondrial disease and serious, serious health implications. It is a staggering number who face staggering pain. And if we can do something to reduce the scale of this suffering, or even to prevent it entirely, we have an absolute moral obligation to do so. An absolute moral obligation. 
I heard the arguments and read the objections in the 2018 inquiry, but to be completely honest, I cannot accept them. I cannot accept there is a system of ethics or morality, rational or spiritual, which accepts this amount of suffering as acceptable. Certainly, it cannot be a system based on love because love is the antithesis of suffering. I most certainly will be supporting this bill. And I ask that every other senator listening to this think seriously about what they love and who they love. And to ask themselves if it was their child or their grandchild who was suffering from mitochondrial disease, whether they would not give everything they have to make this change and to ease their suffering. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to start my contribution on this bill by thanking Shelley Beverley, a young woman living with mitochondrial disease, who met with me and shared her story. Shelley's story is a perfect example of the devastation mitochondrial disease causes. As a genetic disease, those who live with it are likely to see its impact not only on themselves but on multiple family members. Shelley lost a mother in 2016 after experiencing heart failure, muscle weakness and fluid on her lungs. Her brother died the following year, a few weeks short of his 35th birthday, after experiencing seizures and stroke-like symptoms. He had also suffered from migraines, vomiting and hallucinations. Shelley herself has experienced many horrific symptoms, including hearing loss, muscle weakness and diabetes. She also has a high risk of heart failure. She regularly visits a range of specialists and the disease has put incredible pressure on her career, finances and family. And adding to this pressure is the constant fear that, like her mother and brother, her life may be cut short by this awful disease. Shelley and her partner have a strong desire to have a happy, healthy child. And if you want to read Shelley's story in more detail, it's available on the Mito Foundation's website. For me, meeting with Shelley has given me a very personal and a very human perspective to what is an otherwise technical, clinical and ethical debate. And there are thousands more Australians with similar tragic stories to tell. For those listening who are not familiar with mitochondrial disease, I'll just take a few minutes to explain what it is. The disease gets its name from the complex tiny organelles that cause, that cause it, my, mitochondria. Mitochondria resides in our body's cells. They provide our cells with the energy they need to power their biochemistry. You could say mitochondria are the batteries of our cells. Mitochondria have their own DNA, which is passed down through generations as the organelle replicates inside our cells. Children inherit mitochondria from their mother as they reside in the mother's egg during conception. So, as such, the genetic risk for mitochondrial disease is always passed down from mother to child. Mitochondrial disease occurs when the body's cells contain mitochondria with faulty DNA. This leads to the cells not receiving the energy they need to function and, as a result, they start to break down. And just going back to the battery analogy, if a battery is faulty, the machine it is running loses power and dies. It is this process of the cells dying from lack of energy that leads to the devastating symptoms of mitochondrial disease. Around 1 in 200 people carry the genetic risk for mitochondrial disease, but only 1 in 5,000 will be born with mitochondrial disease or disorders that lead to severe illness. There is no cure. Prevention is the only option. And while some people with mitochondrial disease go on to lead full and relatively normal lives, a particularly tragic outcome is that many sufferers do not survive childhood or even infancy. Around 50 babies are born a year with severe mitochondrial disease. Many of those children would die before their fifth birthday. And my conscience says to me, if I can stop one of those children dying, I will do my utmost best. 
By identifying carriers, carriers it's possible to stop it from being transmitted. Sadly, this presents another cruel outcome of the disease, that a carrier cannot have children without the risk of passing it on. But this problem can be overcome with the mitochondrial donation IVF technique. This procedure provides an opportunity for women with mitochondrial disease to have children who are genetically similar to them but without passing on their mitochondria and therefore without passing on the disease. This bill will legalise this procedure and provide the appropriate regulatory framework for it. As such, the bill offers the possibility of allowing carriers to have children while once and for all eliminating this disease so that future generations do not have to suffer. Mitochondrial donation is an assisted reproductive technology procedure in which nuclear DNA from the egg of a birth mother who carries the genetic risk for mitochondrial disease is inserted into a donor egg which is then combined with the father's sperm. The resulting child will inherit the nuclear DNA of their mother and father and the mitochondrial DNA of the egg donor. A 2018 Senate inquiry explored a wide range of issues related to mitochondrial donation, and this was followed by an extensive community consultation in 2019 and 2020 conducted by the National Health and Medical Research Council, or the NHMRC. Both inquiries did an excellent job of exploring the scientific, social, moral and ethical considerations that go into whether to allow mitochondrial donation and the associated regulatory considerations. As a result, senators have an abundance of well-considered information that has been brought together through broad consultation to inform our positions on the bill. I understand that there are senators in this place who hold moral or ethical or religious objections to this procedure, and I respect their opinion. As long as the senators have thought through these issues thoroughly and deeply, then I appreciate the effort they have put in, regardless of the conclusions that they come to. Personally, through my careful consideration of these issues, the case for legislative change is abundantly clear to me. I don't intend in my contribution to thoroughly explore the full range of issues outlined in the NHMRC's report or the Senate inquiry. I will, however, outline a couple of the key objections to this technique and respond to them. One argument against legalising the procedure is that it's unnecessary. As the argument goes, parents have other options available to them, such as adoption or fostering, and a strong parenting bond can form with their child, even though the child is not closely genetically related to them. The same argument, of course, could be applied to all parents accessing assisted reproductive technology, including art procedures that are already lawful and regulated. And just as a side effect, um, in Tasmania there was one child adopted last year, so um, if people need to adopt a child it's not as easy as just getting your name on a list. I and I believe society rejects the view that parents who find it difficult for whatever reason to conceive by natural means should be denied the opportunity that is available to other parents. People living with mitochondrial disease should not face this discrimination on top of all the struggles and challenges this disease already presents. Even putting aside the question of whether parents should be able to have genetically similar children, adoption and fostering, as I said, may not be viable options. As was noted in the Senate inquiry, adoption and fostering programs have strict eligibility criteria, including health screening, and this counts it out as an option for parents with mitochondrial disease. Should mitochondrial donation be permitted in Australia, it may be the only viable pathway for women with mitochondrial disease. Another common objection is the argument that this technique is a dangerous new experiment creating three parent babies. Related to the three parent argument is the argument put by some that children born by this technique will be confused about their parentage. The term three parent baby is an emotive term, but it's not accurate. The reality is that a child born under this technique inherits their nuclear DNA and therefore their genetic characteristics from two parents. The mitochondrial DNA con contributed by the egg donor makes up about 0.1 per cent of the total DNA inherited. 
Even so, it would not have any effect on the child's appearance, personality or a range of other features. In fact, the only noticeable difference it will make to the child is that they will be free of mitochondrial disease. In practical terms, the child will have two biological parents and will grow up knowing and loving those parents. There is no reason to regard the egg donor as a parent at all. There are no more, they are no more a parent than any other donor of bodily products, such as a blood donor or an organ donor. Now, I've, cho I've chosen to address two of the key arguments against the, this bill. And I'll, you know, there's obviously more arguments, that, but they're the two that I really wanted to um, respond to. And I just want to say, as I come to my conclusion, I really appreciate the phenomenal amount of work that has gone into this bill, particularly from the Health Minister, Mr Greg Hunt, and Shadow Minister, Mr Mark Butler. I also want to acknowledge Mr Butler's predecessor, Mr Chris Bowen, who has also studied and consulted extensively on this issue and with whom I had very informative discussions about mitochondrial donation when it was first raised with me. And, um, the other person I'd really like to thank is uh, Mike Freelander, the member for MacArthur, who is also a paediatrician of about 40 years, uh, who I also sought information from, uh, and I found his him just so helpful in those discussions. Again, I want to thank Shelley Beverley for her strong advocacy, for sharing her story with me and explaining what this leg legislative change means for her and her family. And finally, I'd really like to thank the Mito Foundation, who have also spoken to me and who have strongly advocated for this bill on behalf of the thousands of Australians living with mitochondrial disease. It's been several years since the parliament and the government started exploring the options of legalising to allow mitochondrial donation. And Australians living with this disease have waited far too long for our regulatory framework to catch up with the advances in medical technology. But we have the opportunity to allow women carrying the genetic risk for mitochondrial disease to have biological children without the fear of passing on the disease. Parties across both chambers have granted their members and senators a conscience vote on this issue, and I have no hesitation in supporting it. I recommend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam of Queensland and Australia, I announce that One Nation's position is to oppose this bill. This bill would legalise research that remains experimental with no accurate predictions of outcome. Mitochondria are tiny parts of a cell that generate most of the chemical energy needed to power the cell's biochemical reactions and are part of our DNA. Now, I empathise with those potential parents who are identified as potentially high risk of transferring this genetic disorder to their future children. There are high risks to those children born out of the proposed experiments and a high risk of end-of-life scenarios if the experiments fail in utero or be before that point. This is risky. The bill contemplates the use of multiple techniques that may be addressed under licence to achieve pregnancy after genetic intervention. The intention is to intervene genetically with the, out intervene genetically with the outcomes permanent across future generations by removing identified offending genetic content. One problem is that future generations may be affected by other, as yet unidentified changes, unknown at this stage, that are permanent. Irrespective of what I say, or irrespective of what some say, this bill is promoting gene editing. It is promoting gene editing, a practice that should be discouraged as it goes beyond therapy. It will not help any people with mitochondrial disease, not one. <clears throat> There are many alternatives to achieve parenthood for the couples identified as high risk of passing on mitochondrial disease. There are a number of specific problems with the bill, some of which I'll now highlight. There's been a clear failure in involving independent, unbiased persons in the decision-making process. The regulator, the Office of Gene Technology regulator, is excluded under the bill, excluded, without adequate explanation from any consultation role in issuing a license for experimentation. That's a big concern. The bill puts limits on the extent that information shall be reported. Why? 
especially when it's experimental. There still remains no feedback on effectiveness of experimental procedures carried out in the United Kingdom where experiments similar to these proposed here were legalised in 2015. Now, given the failure to report back on the outcomes of experiments conducted in the United Kingdom over a six-year period, to say that this is only because of privacy issues is somewhat fallacious. I ask, is the real reason for failure to report back because there have been no successes? There are serious deficits in the bill related to a lack of accountability for adverse outcomes of the experiments. What's to happen to human tissue when there is failed embryo development? There are indemnities from liability for virtually all involved in the activities if something goes wrong. Where's the accountability? Where's the scrutiny for an experiment? There are no ways for a child born out of the experimental procedures to be compensated for injuries, negative conditions or loss stemming from the experimental activities. There is no accountability for those who would intervene and experiment with living human beings. That's wrong and I cannot support this bill. I wish to commend Senators Deb O'Neill and Matt Canavan for their considered amendments which would ensure both scrutiny and accountability. We will support their amendments. I remain very concerned about this bill and the potential lack of respect it shows for the nature of being human, the lack of respect for human dignity, and the lack of respect for the way we value people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Askew, remotely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to add my contribution to this debate and acknowledge that there are many varied thoughts and opinions on this topic across the chamber. The Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform, or MAVE's Law Bill 2021, proposes amendments to the Prohibition of Human Cloning for Reproduction Act 2002, the Research Involving Human Embryos Act 2002, the Research Involving Human Embryos Regulations 2017, the Freedom of Information Act 1982, and the Therapeutic Goods Excluded Good Determination 2018. As we have heard during previous contributions, the successful passage of this bill would make mitochondrial donation legal in Australia and allow permitted mitochondrial donation techniques under a specified mitochondrial donation licence for research and training purposes in clinical settings. This bill was introduced to the House of Representatives on the 24th of March last year and was referred to the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee on the same day. As chair of this committee, I would like to begin by thanking all submitters and witnesses to the inquiry for their input and acknowledge that the bipartisan committee report made no recommendations, simply noting that we were aware that all parties would allow a conscience vote in the parliament. MAVE's law has the ultimate goal of assisting women with mitochondria disease to have a biological child who would not inherit their predisposition to this severe and life-threatening disease. It allows for further research and training into mitochondrial donation to build up Australia's evidence base, expertise and data on the safety and efficacy of donation techniques before allowing them to be introduced more broadly. The bill also proposes creating a mitochondrial donation donor register to store details about people born using mitochondrial donation with those people able to find out the identity of their mitochondrial donor once they turn 18. Mitochondria are small structures in human cells that produce 90% of the energy the body needs to function. These structures contain DNA which can be passed on from a mother to her child through the mitochondria present in the mother's egg cells. Mitochondrial disease is a complex group of inherited conditions that can impact health and life expectancy. In some cases, this disease can be fatal. The disease itself is caused by mutations in the person's mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA impacting the ability of their mitochondria to function properly. Common symptoms include developmental delays, seizures, weakness and fate fatigue, muscle pain, vision and hearing loss, organ failure and heart problems, and in severe cases, premature death. 
Around one in 200 Australians are estimated to be predisposed to mitochondrial disease, with around 56 children born each year with a severe form of the disease. There is no known cure for mitochondrial disease and treatment options are limited to managing symptoms, although there is significant research and clinical practice being undertaken trying to identify a cure or find potential treatments to alleviate the condition. The bill aims to prevent some instances of the disease by legalising mitochondrial donation. It is hoped that when used in conjunction with IVF, the process may allow women whose mitochondria would predispose their children to the disease to have a biological child who doesn't inherit the predisposition. Mitochondrial donation involves the transfer of nuclear genetic material extracted from the mother's egg to a donor egg that has had its own nuclear genetic material removed but retains its own mitochondria. This procedure was introduced in the United Kingdom in 2015 following extensive public consultation and several comprehensive scientific reviews of safety and efficacy. However, only one clinic in the UK is licensed to provide this treatment to eligible women, and at this stage, no formal data has been released on the outcomes of the treatment. It is our understanding that possibly up to 21 couples have attained a licence to receive the treatment, and up to eight treatments have been approved, although the success or otherwise of these treatments have not yet been released publicly due to privacy reasons. The 2018 Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee inquiry into mitochondrial donation and the resulting National Health and Medical Research Council community consultation during 2019-2020 identified there was some community support for legalising mitochondrial donation in Australia, but also highlighted significant ethical issues. These issues included concern that such donations would result in three parent children or genetic modification. The Department of Health released a, pub released a public discussion paper in February last year around introducing mitochondrial donation in Australia in two stages, with this bill designed to support this implementation. The first stage would allow lab-based research and training, followed by a trial with some families at one Commonwealth-funded clinic. This trial is intended to determine the safety, efficacy and feasibility of mitochondrial donation technology. If the trial is successful, the second stage of implementation, allowing for this treatment to be made available more broadly. At that point, which according to the Department of Health is not expected to occur for possibly 10 years, it is proposed that this progression is subject to a further decision by the Australian Government through the issuing of a new regulation by the Minister. Despite being disallowable by the Parliament, this approach does concern me. Should legislation be passed to implement Stage 1, I believe it is vital that the Parliament undertake a full and comprehensive review of the trials before formalising the final stage of progressing to clinical practice through legislation at that time. When I was first made aware of this legislation, my daughter was expecting my first grandchild. My initial th thoughts were that, like IVF, this is yet another form of scientific development that will assist young people to have a healthy family. I wondered how I would feel if my daughter had been in the situation of those mothers who do have the mitochondrial mutation and who go into each pregnancy wondering if they will pass it on to their newborn child. I could relate to their predicament and on first reflection thought it likely that I would support the bill. However, through the committee inquiry process, I've come to have a better understanding of what is before us. The proposed donation techniques, the limited amount of international research to date, the fact that no known successful births have eventuated after more than five years of research being undertaken in the UK, and the fact that in some cases embryos are created, harvested and then disposed of as part of the research, made me realise I could not support the bill as proposed. I was pleased to note that several government amendments were agreed in the House of Representatives that have increased the level of reporting and removed the ability of sex selection by parents as part of the research. I also understand that further amendments will be moved in the Senate in relation to the various mitochondrial donation techniques included in the bill and the progression to clinical practice licences. Various submitters and witnesses to the inquiry, as well as further consultation that I've undertaken since, have stressed that in the case of a pro-nuclear transfer, the mitochondria transfer takes place at the zygote stage of a fertilised egg, shortly before it becomes an embryo. It results 
in two eggs being fertilized by the father's sperm, and then the mitochondria from the donor's fertilized egg is transferred into the mother's fertilized egg, and the donor's egg or zygote is then discarded. I appreciate that there are various views on this. However, I believe that a zygote is the beginning of a new life. It already contains all 46 chromosomes that will exist throughout its development to embryo, onto the birth of a baby and onto adulthood if given the chance to do so. I do not support the post-fertilisation techniques included in the bill. The maternal spindle transfer method of mitochondrial donation is to me the only ethical technique proposed involving the transfer of the donor's egg's mitochondria into the mother's egg prior to fertilisation and the development of the zygote. Another area of concern to me relates to the impact on future generations through genetic manipulation. As stated by the member of Tangney in his second reading speech, and I quote, this bill reverses the long-standing prohibition on heritable human genetic manipulation. Mitochondrial donation allows changes to the heritable genetic information of a child and will affect that child, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and the many generations to come. That's why it's important to make sure that the provisions of this bill are considered with the utmost care and diligence, end quote. The member for Menzies also touched on this during his second reading speech, and I again quote, some proponents suggest that the procedures are simply extensions of existing practices, such as organ transplantation and assisted reproductive technologies. In organ transplantation, DNA is not passed on to future generations. And in current reproductive technologies, neither human eggs nor human embryos are modified in the radical ways proposed in this bill, end quote. In his contribution, Mr Andrews went on to highlight that the US Food and Drug Administration has taken the view that all forms of mitochondrial donation, whether using male or female embryos, constitute germline editing and has maintained its prohibition on clinical trials for this reason. We need to take note of that decision and perhaps question why there is only one country globally that has granted licences for these mitochondrial donation techniques. Why is it that to date, after five years of trials, there remains no evidence of a successful birth from mitochondrial donation? 20 years ago, the Office of Gene Technology Regulator was established to provide oversight of any proposed gene modification techniques, yet this bill specifically excludes that office from having oversight of the proposed techniques. To me, this makes no sense, and I believe we should ensure that the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator together with its Gene Technology Technical Advisory Committee, does have the opportunity to review all aspects of the proposed mitochondrial donation techniques in the same manner that they do for all other medical genetics proposals. Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a complex and sensitive issue, and I appreciate that there are real lives impacted by the decisions made in this place. My heart goes out to each person impacted by this disease, and I fully understand the desire and intent behind this legislation. Our responsibility is not just to the current generation, but also to future generations, and we need to be assured that the final legislation, which I suspect is likely to pass despite the concerns that I've raised, offers the best protection for those to come. I therefore, therefore urge all senators to consider each amendment closely to ensure every possible safeguard is in place going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to be able to make a contri contribution today on the mitochondrial donation law Reform Bill, MAVE's Law 2021, the purpose of which is to legalise mitochondrial donation for particular research, training and reproductive purposes. The bill also amends the prohibition of human cloning for Reproduction, for Reproduction Act 20, 2002 and the research involving Human Embryos Act 2002. The bill also seeks to introduce many safeguards. I would first like to thank Dr Mike Freelander, the member for MacArthur, for, for providing me and other colleagues with his insights into the bill and for distributing the research paper on mitochondrial, mitochondrial transfer produced by Oliver Herven, an intern from ANU 
working in Mike's office. I also acknowledge the advocacy and determination by the Mito Foundation. From time to time, those of us entrusted to serve in this place have the privilege and the responsibility to be able to support meaningful change that has the potential to dramatically improve people's lives. The bill before us today is one such opportunity. Under the bill, mitochondrial donation will be introduced in a staged and closely monitored way. The first stage allows for certain research and training purposes, including the undertaking of a clinical trial. The bill before us has been a long time in the making, nearly five years from the production of the 2018 Senate Community Affairs References Committee report recommending that some further consultation should be undertaken with the community and relevant experts. In response to the Senate report, the National Health and Medical Research Council, the MHMRC, undertook a series of community consultations to seek community at attitudes to the ethical, legal and social issues associated with introducing mitochondrial donation in Australia. The HMRC also convened an expert committee to review key scientific questions raised by the Senate inquiry. The NHMRC and the Senate inquiry identified significant community support for legalising mitochondrial donation for use in Australia. The consultation also identified concerns about the technology. In February 2021, the Health Department released a public discussion paper seeking feedback on, on a proposed two-stage implementation approach. Public consultation concluded in March 2021, which identified support for the proposed approach. The change that this bill seeks to make is significant, but in my view, a change that we as a parliament should endorse. The change will be the change will make a big difference to families. It's been a long time coming, as I've said, and, I've, and I'm sure many passionate advocates are listening in today, filled with much emotion. Today, I hope is your day. I hope that, as, that at the conclusion of this debate you will be able to ce celebrate a well-deserved achievement. I am sure you were as heartened as I was when the bill passed the House of Representatives with a significant margin—92 votes to 29. Of course, as we know, this bill has been appropriately dubbed Maeve's Law. I want to acknowledge and pay tribute to a brave and special young girl, Maeve Hood, and her family. And as we know, Maeve was diagnosed with a severe type of mitochondrial disease, Lee syndrome, at 18 months of age. Maeve's mum and dad, Sarah and Joel, have been tireless advocates for the law reform needed to allow for the use of IVF technology that can prevent mitochondrial disease. This advocacy will have undoubtedly taken its toll. It's never easy talking so frequently about something so personal, more so about someone you love, especially your own child. I would like to pay tribute to them and acknowledge their pivotal role in making this much needed change happen. But they're not the only ones. There are so many people, parents and their children, in the Australian community who have experienced the ravages of a rare genetic disease and who have shared their stories to bring this issue to the attention of policymakers. Your passion, commitment and advocacy has meant something. It has led to this day. It has worked. The passage of this bill through this place will allow women to give birth without passing on a genetic disease. This will be enabled through making lawful a mitochondrial donation process.
process. When necessary, a pregnant woman, woman will be able to replace their own mitochondrial DNA with healthy mitochondrial DNA from a, doc, uh, from a donor egg of another woman. It has been estimated as many as 56 babies born each year in Australia could potentially be saved from inheriting mitochondrial disease with the passage of this legislation. Indeed, one Australian baby is born every week that will develop a severely disabling form of mitochondrial disease. That's according to the Mito Foundation, which works to enrich the lives of people with mitochondrial disease and has led much of the research and policy work and calls for law reform and funding to enable IVF mitochondrial donation. Sadly, most children diagnosed with mito die in the first five years of life. There is no cure and there is no real treatment. The Mito Foundation estimates one in 200 people or 120,000 Australians carry the genetic change that puts them at risk of developing mito or passing it on to their children. This bill will dramatically change the lives of these Australians should they have children. A series of amendments to this bill and the other place were made and well received by advocates, the medical, um, medical profession and medical research profession. The amendments address concerns raised by the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of bills around what the committee saw as a lack of clarity in some provisions of the bill. The committee did not seek to change the functioning or intent of the bill. It is pleasing to see the government act constructively in pursuing these amendments to this bill. And I must acknowledge here the work of the Minister for Health, Mr Hunt. The amendments agreed to in the House provide greater clarity and privacy protections without changing or impacting the intent or substance of the bill. In particular, the amendments clarify that donated mitochondria must be sourced from human eggs, expand and clarify the circumstances in which proper consent is needed before mitochondrial donation techniques are used, clarify the circumstances in which the Embryo Research Licensing Committee is able to seek expert advice when performing its statutory functions, Enhance mitochondrial don donor privacy through provisions relating to the register and further enhance privacy by ensuring that the EALC statutory reports to Parliament cannot disclose identifiable, identifiable personal information. I welcome these changes and I welcome this bill. The passage of this bill provides Australian parents affected by mitochondrial disease a choice to minimise the risk of their, their children inheriting this life-threatening disease. I will be voting for the passage of this bill to allow parents to have that choice. And I sincerely hope that this bill is successful and becomes law. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. As the speakers before me have noted, this is an incredibly complex issue. And I felt that I had to rise and speak to this legis proposed legislation today, despite the fact that the issue of mitochondrial disease is not one that I have followed closely, like many of my colleagues have. Um, I have not met with families who have suffered from mitochondrial disease. I have not you know, heard personally their anguish. Um, but it's clearly a in very important piece of legislation addressing some really complex issues. I mean, there have been so many concerns about mitochondrial donation that have been raised through various inquiries and stakeholder consultation activities. On the one hand, we have families that are suffering the anguish, the trauma, the huge grief of having children born with mitochondrial disease who die. Yeah, um, usually before they are five years old. We have the anguish of parents, of mothers, of potential parents who don't know whether they want to go ahead with pregnancies, 
because of potentially bearing a child that is going to suffer with mitochondrial disease. To be able to do something for these families is something that you would think, yep, that is something that this parliament should do. On the other hand, the issues that have been raised about the risks, the rights of the child, future adult and future generations, issues with the creation and destruction of embryos, the creation of embryos from more than two people, the limited supply of donated eggs, donor rights and responsibilities, the fact that trial participants potentially were able to undertake sex selection following pre-treatment um, counselling, and the unintended and un or unknown consequences of manipulating or altering genetic material, which may lead to the genetic engineering. As I said, there have been now numerous inquiries um, looking at all of these issues in all of their complexity. And in particular, the most recent one, the Community Affairs um, Legislation Committee, looking into this bill, which noted that, look, this is a matter of, of conscience. And as that report said, it engages difficult ethical, social and scientific issues. And the committee report notes that the changes proposed are significant and the bill would amend existing laws that strictly control embryo research and prohibit cloning. I want to really thank everyone who is engaged in the consideration of these issues. I want to thank the advocates for this bill, who have been engaged in this space for a long time and who understand that nuance and complexity. And they have advocated for an approach that respects human life and fully recognises the com powerful complexity of the processes that are involved. And I particularly want to thank and recognise the families who live with mitochondrial disease and the Mito Foundation, who have been working on their behalf. And I also want to thank those who are taking a position not in support of this bill, because I think it's very important that they have been able to bring their concerns forward for us to consider. In particular, I want to thank um, Bob Phelps from Gene Ethics, who has been lobbying very hard against this bill, who has made me think long and hard and read a lot more about this issue and about this bill than I thought I was going to when we first started considering the issue. And I think it's important that all of these issues are thoroughly canvassed and considered by all of us so we can all grapple with these issues and all come to a decision on, on balance as to where we stand. And particularly, I mean, in thanking Bob, and I've worked with him for a long time on issues of genetically modified organisms, and I have a lot of respect for his passion for public policy that properly considers the risks of genetic modification, particularly in this instance of human genetic, genetic modification. So I've been grappling, as all of us have, in working out where we stand on this. And where I have come is, I think, on balance that the benefits of this bill outweigh those risks. Having heard and deliberated over evidence from multiple advocates on multiple occasions, I believe this legislation will provide meaningful change and much welcome change for people who suffer from mitochondrial disease, and that the checks and balances in this legislation will very significantly ameliorate the risks associated with these new, te with these new techniques. But in doing so, I recognise that you know, this is not a straightforward, simple step to take. And it involves changing legislation and it's important to have really strong protections in place. And I remain concerned about the lack of data from the UK trials and think that you know, it would be a much easier position for us to take if we had data from those UK trials and if it was there in the published literature to say this is what the results of their trials have been. And so in putting my case today to say that I am support, I'm going to support this legislation. On balance, I think it is good legislation. It is going to have a lot of benefits for people who are suffering from mitochondrial disease. But I foreshadow that I've got quite a bit of sympathy for the further amendments that are being proposed in this place to add in some extra checks and balances to make sure that we really have a good understanding of the science, we have a really good understanding as the clinical trial goes um, goes through the, the years to make sure that we know that this is appropriate um, techniques and appropriate processes to carry on into the future. So, look, I, in conclusion, I really do want to thank those who have walked, worked across this parliament, who have approached this complex debate constructively, 
and I look forward to hearing the debate during the committee stage about further amendments that could improve this legislation that, on balance, however, I feel is important legislation that should be passed. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, acting, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, at the start of this debate, I, or my contribution to this debate, I do want to recognise that uh, uh, the desire to create a, a human life uh, is perhaps the most fundamental human desire. Uh, uh, there's something inbuilt, seemingly, in human beings that would like to or want to uh, have a child of their own uh, to pass on, to some extent, their legacy uh, beyond uh, their time uh, in this world. And, and I can deeply understand uh, the desire of uh, those in our community that are afflicted uh, by mitochondrial disease, um, their desire to, to successfully uh, have a child and raise it as their own. I am in the situation, lucky and fortunate situation, have five children of my own with my wife and they're the greatest uh, joy in my life, even though I sometimes joke that the only reason I've had children is so I can have grandchildren. But again, that is to pass on uh, that, uh, that genetic material, if you like, a desire we just seemingly have. Now, those that are afflicted by mitochondrial disease in a, in a severe fashion uh, uh, have a difficult choice about whether to have children uh, because it is a disease that can and does, and does be passed on genetically. Uh, and I, can, I must, well, I can't understand the angst that those people must go through because I do not have children or loved ones that are afflicted by this disease. I do want to uh, respect, I do want to pay respect uh, to those uh, uh, committed individuals uh, who have for a long time advocated uh, for these changes. Uh, um, uh, I have seen some of the experiences that uh, those families have been through. And, uh, uh, I do uh, acknowledge uh, their great desire uh, to see a solution uh, uh, to this uh, terrible disease that they have been burdened with. While I do respect those efforts, uh, uh, I, I cannot support this bill myself for two main ethical uh, considerations I have with its approach. The first of those is the inclusion in this bill of techniques that would seek to remove defective mitochondria in a way that necessarily destroys life, in my view. Uh, I don't think we should ever uh, seek to use a life, a human life, as an instrument uh, or a tool uh, to help uh, someone else's life. I believe in the dignity and sanctity of each individual human life. And to the extent we can possible, we should strive and aim to protect each individual sacred human life. Uh, however, this bill would approve um, two techniques uh, that would result in the creation of zygotes or embryos uh, with the purpose uh, of using one of those uh, zygotes, or in my view a life, using one of those lives uh, uh, to help uh, the other life that does not have or does have defective mitochondria, but would then result in the, the necessary destruction of the, the donor, the mitochondria donor, donor life, if you like. Uh, those two techniques are the pro-nuclear transfer technique uh, in this bill and the, also the second polar, polar body transfer technique. They are apparently, according to Dr Megan Best, a uh, similar, similar um, methods that are used uh, in, in cloning. And uh, because they do result in, in this destruction of a life, I, I, I just simply cannot uh, support an approach uh, that goes down this path. There is a dispute, I recognise, about when a life begins, but uh, it seems to me that uh, once conception occurs, there is a continuum uh, from that conception that involves the evolution of a human being. There is really no other distinct point that ethicists have identified which switches a, a, a zygote uh, through to an embryo or to a later stage. There, there's, no dis, there's no discontinuity there. There have been some, uh, I would say, artificial uh, boundaries that have uh, been defined by human beings, but there's nothing you can actually identify and say, at that point this is a zygote and at that point it's an embryo. I, I don't see that myself. Second, the other second ethical uh, issue and concern I have with the bill, this bill has been raised with others around the, the removing the prohibition on 
on, on transferring genetic material between two human beings. This would result in permanent changes to the human germline. And there are a lot of things we do not know about these techniques and the ramifications of them. There can be, we do know from animal trials, there can be mistakes and uh, off-target, so-called off-target errors that are made in genetic modification. Uh, and I do not think we're at a stage that, to, to, that we should overturn this prohibition with so much yet unknown about these techniques. I do also, I also am concerned about the broader ethical considerations of, of using the same techniques approved in this bill uh, to tackle other uh, diseases or afflictions or even ultimately to uh, look at more heritable traits um, around uh, uh, attributes of height or strength and other things. I know this bill does not do that, but it is hard to separate here the development of these techniques from the ethical considerations of those broader applications that might occur once the techniques have been established. Now, because of those ethical considerations, as I've said, I, I can't support the, the, the bill as a whole. However, I, I, I would like to flag that I and, and I know others in this chamber will be moving amendments to seek to uh, uh, tackle some of the ethical considerations I have. And in particular, there is a specific amendment that I propose to move that would remove the, uh, the pro-nuclear transfer and the second polar body transfer techniques, the ones that involve the destruction of a fertilised egg. Uh, remove those from the bill and therefore deal with that ethical consideration I have, it would still leave that amendment would still leave uh, the possibility of the maternal spindle transfer technique and the first polar body transfer technique as ways with which to make the mitochondrial donation that does not result in the creation of two fertilized eggs. In that case, the donation would occur at the egg stage before conception uh, and would therefore absolve that, that first ethical consideration I had. I did have another ethical consideration with the bill as it was originally drafted and proposed in the House. At that stage, the bill also did provide for the approval to destroy any female embryos that were created uh, from the mitochondrial donation methods. Uh, uh, that the rationale for that was you, you acquire your, or most, almost all of your mitochondria are acquired from your mother. And so an added protection, if you like, originally was there to allow uh, parents going through this process to destroy the female embryos and therefore reduce any residual risk of mitochondria being transferred uh, to, their, to their children. Um, I, I thank the government for considering amendments that were previously drafted and, and, and also acknowledge the efforts of uh, um, Mr Kevin Andrews in pushing those in the House and, and that has already been, the bill has already been amended in the House to remove that and I think that's sensible that we should not allow a form of sex selection uh, to be approved or legalised. Um, in this country. Um, the, the other amendments I will seek to move um, don't completely ameliorate the ethical concerns I have, but, but uh, would, I think, go some way to providing greater oversight by parliament and other bodies uh, from, um, on, on the, 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 uh, the development of these techniques uh, if it is approved by uh, this parliament. Uh, originally, the bill only required a, year, a review after seven years. I do again acknowledge the efforts of Mr Kevin Andrews, who have, has now inserted annual reporting uh, into the bill. However, I would like to I will flag and move further amendments that would uh, require more detail in that annual reporting, including um, detail on the number of participants, um, any, any births that have occurred in a de-identified and private way. Uh, the amendments I, would move, I will move will also seek to uh, remove the so-called stage two of this bill. This bill establishes a number of licences that are, if you like, ready to go, licences that involve further research and trials of mitochondrial donation. Uh, uh, my amendments would not uh, um, affect those first three licences. However, two further licences are in the so-called stage two process. Um, which would result in the clinical practical application and provision of mitochondrial donation services to the broader community. At this, at this stage, as the bill outlines, there's no regulatory framework to govern uh, the stage two licences, the clinical practice licences, because there's just too much we do not know at this stage of how that, that framework could work once the trials and research are concluded. I do not see a strong rationale for us to 
give pre-approval to these licences, if you like. This bill would allow the minister, in the, a minister in the, the Minister for Health in the future, uh, to provide a regulatory framework for these licences through mere regulation rather than parliamentary legislation. There has been a broader debate uh, over the past couple of years in this House about the appropriateness of delegated legislation uh, to ministers. I do recognise the work of Senators Carr and Ferravanti Wells through the Regulations Committee of highlighting this concern that there's too much, too much legislation uh, is providing uh, authority to ministers to effectively make laws through regulation with more limited parliamentary oversight. Of course, some of those, these regulations can be disallowed in the future, but we all know that that process is a much more limited one compared to the passage of legislation through committees, uh, through the scrutiny of these two chambers. So by removing the stage two of the bill, what I propose is that following uh, the conclusion of research and trials, uh, the government of uh, that day would need to, or any senator or member, would need to bring through uh, additional legislation to provide a regulatory framework for the clinical practice elements of this bill. To me, that, that enhances our, our role and our, our, our um, uh, job as senators uh, and in the other place, the members in the other place, uh, to provide proper parliamentary oversight over these novel and revolutionary techniques. Uh, almost all contributors to this debate, both for and against, have recognised the uncertainties uh, uh, and unknowns associated with some of these technologies. And to me, it seems absolutely appropriate that we walk down this path one step at a time, that we do not seek to jump over uh, a level of parliamentary scrutiny and oversight here. So I'll be moving that amendment as well. I'll just quickly flag a few other amendments that I know. Um, some other colleagues of mine will be moving, so perhaps leave to them to explain in more detail. But I, I do think this bill errs in exempting the Office of Gene Technology Regulator from having oversight of these processes. Uh, uh, again, in a similar vein, these are novel and revolutionary approaches. Uh, uh, we have a regulator established uh, to deal with a lot of these issues, especially in regards to animals and, 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 and plant life. Uh, it seems strange that the OGTR would be, would be removed uh, from the process here and instead a new body under the NHMRC. Um, this bill establishes an embryo research licensing committee. Uh, I, I think we should be using the existing, t uh, the existing um, expertise in this area through the OGTR. I also would uh, flag that I'd, I'll move amendments to seek to, if, if stage two remains in the bill, if my stage two amendments fail, I do think we should prescribe at least a minimum number of trial participants be, go through uh, the first stage before a stage two could be regulated by the minister. And finally, I, I don't see a strong rationale to uh, exempt um, uh, those providing these procedures from civil liability through these processes. Um, that has not been explained to me in a sufficient fashion. As I say, I, I look overall. I, I, I think this bill does uh, is a is a uh, an understandable. Uh, uh, reaction to a disease that is debilitating uh, for many people, uh, uh, but we as senators, I hope, cannot uh, allow uh, that emotion to, uh, to absolve us from the need to provide proper scrutiny of these techniques, which can have much, much more broader ramifications uh, for human development, uh, for the ethical treatment of life uh, and the protection of what is the most as I say, sacred, fundamental human desire to create another life and to protect, support and nurture that life. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy Speaker. And uh, I rise to, to make a contribution to um, what I have to say is a, a, a profoundly respectful debate about a complex matter. And I want to commend all of those participants who've, uh, whose words I've heard already this evening. Um, the mitochondrial donation law reform bill of 2021 is, is Maeve's law, and it arises out of the experience of the frailty of the human condition and a particular person, uh, young Maeve, around which this bill really is centred. Um, if it's passed, this would be a landmark piece of legislation 
with very long lasting consequences for healthcare in Australia. But I don't believe that it would enhance those health outcomes. In fact, as it's constructed and at this point of time, it raises serious and profound questions about ethical issues of great importance, such as cloning, sex selection of infants, children having three parents and germline tampering. Now, I am a Labor senator, uh, brought up in the Catholic faith, and uh, with all the sinners alongside me in that church, I still take my moral guidance very significantly from a belief in the fundamental dignity of human life. And my party, the Labor Party, uh, seeks to uh, um, effectively govern and effectively participate in the parliament by binding on how we vote. There are very few occasions on which a conscience vote is enabled, but this is one of those pieces of legislation to which a conscience vote has been allocated. And I acknowledge that it's not just through the language of faith that people come to a moral and ethical disposition, but the language of my faith and the teachings of my faith uh, have informed significantly my views about the sanctity of life. I want to acknowledge uh, one of my colleagues in the other place, Dr Mike Freelander, uh, who has served the people of the MacArthur region for decades as a specialist paediatric, uh, a pa a paediatric specialist before he came here, and I know that he continues to serve in that public hospital at no charge to provide his service to the community. He's a man of great integrity. I'm very proud to serve alongside him, and he is supporting this piece of legislation. And he has also been in a position where he has looked after children with mitochondrial disease, and I acknowledge his expertise. We hold very different views about what the purpose, uh, what the action of this parliament should be with regard to this bill, um, but the conversations have always been very informative and very respectful. And I think, again, that's been characterised by the debate to date. Before I um, put out uh, more, more uh, in, in a more linear form, the rationale for my view, I want to acknowledge the advocacy of young Maeve Hood and her family. It's never easy to step into the hurricane that is national politics and attempt the long and slow process of political reform, but the Hood family have actually undertaken that with considerable grace and candour. Many families turn their grief and their loss into profound activism. Maeve and her beautiful family and other families like theirs are in my prayers and I pray for their health and well-being. And I do know the suffering and the grief of losing someone so young, not one of my own children, and I am happily a mother to three now grown adults. But I can still remember uh, just before my niece Lucy, Lucy O'Neill, was to turn four, having her on my hip at her pre-fourth birthday while she blew out her candles. She didn't quite make four. She died of liver cancer. I know families that have had young children, so many of them die of brain cancer. That suffering is best translated into a positive effort. And that is what Maeve's parents have attempted to do here. But we are legislators, and we need to think about what this bill will do and what it will establish, and the broadest good and the least harm that we can manage. This bill, as it's currently constructed, would legalise processes in Australia that currently carry large custodial sentences or fines. We are seeking to overturn law that if you acted against that law right now, you would be in jail. Now, the reason we've done that because the law is trying to prevent the creation for the purposes of reproduction, a human embryo that contains genetic material of more than two people or contains heritable changes to the genome. 
My fellow senators, we shouldn't have to change legislation to do ethical science. The process that we're considering here in this legislation is only legal in one other country in the entire world, and that is the United Kingdom. And we are not even sure that the five years of research that have been undertaken with the carve-out that they created in their laws has actually come up with anything at all that's approaching a success. I have here beside me the report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee that I served on that investigated this piece of legislation. And we sought to inform ourselves about what's really going on. The committee uh, made one recommendation, which was to make no recommendation, as this is a conscience matter. And the report simply summarised the submissions and views available at the time of reporting. What we couldn't report was any factual data or evidence, despite five years of the program that, we're, uh, that is before us for consideration tonight here in Australia, five years it's been going in the UK, and there is no data. There is no evidence. We can't see if there was any progress at all, because the way in which that legislation passed did not allow the sufficient scrutiny. And if time allows this evening, I will move to um, the amendments that I have already uh, advanced and I, I, I think are available to senators uh, that were alluded to uh, in his comments by Senator Canavan. And I've been speaking with colleagues throughout the day about my concerns and why we need to make amendments to what is before us. Even if the bill should pass, it should pass in a different form. I do not believe that Australia should become a society where people can have designer babies. And that will not be the intention of those who seek to advance this legislation. But it could well and truly be the intention of somebody entrepreneurial and I say that in the worst possible way, who sees the opportunity to make money for themselves at a cost to others that is beyond consideration, beyond possible consideration. We shouldn't be thinking about enabling the construction of designer babies made to specifications where people tinker about the embryo to pursue a perfect child. I'm deeply troubled by the production of genetic material, the building blocks of life, casually discarded as byproducts of a process. Another relatively unknown implication of this legislation is that children born of this process will have three, not two, three genetic parents, a father, a mother and the donor of the mitochondria. It's a very significant change, and it's a new frontier for society. We need to acknowledge the novelty of this social change and, uh, and the effects of any, on any child growing up with this knowledge. We need to acknowledge the profound issues that this bill raises in terms of the moral, the social, the scientific, the ethical and the practical realities that it will enable. The te techniques that are under, under consideration will have long-term and irreversible and unknown consequences for the germline of those born following the treatment. And that means that child and all its descendants will carry unknown consequences to their children and their children's children. This will not end with one generation. It goes on and on. And we have not seen that before on this planet. Children of MRT are the first in human history to be genetically modified from the moment of their origin. Surely one day they will ask, who am I in the most fundamental way that we ask ourselves as human beings? Who do I belong to? Who am I really like? Where does this bit of me come from? Who are my parents? And perhaps a register of the donor will hold that information without error in perpetuity. Or perhaps it will be like everything else in our society, a little bit broken at least. 
And where's the security? And that's just for the holding of information, let alone the understanding of the deepness of our need to explore our identity. Now, some senators will argue that this proposed pathway debating is the only way that the very real impact of mitochondrial disease and the deaths of very loved young Australians has on the people who know and love them. But what's being proposed in this bill is not really a solution to eliminating mitochondrial disease. It is an attempt to create a new way of interacting with the disease. But I want to point out that, uh, as Senator Canavan eloquently described at the beginning, the gift of being actually able to have children is something we all deeply understand, and people make choices for and against that. But I, it does concern me that with the options that are available to these mothers who want to have children without the mitochondrial consideration, there are options. There's the capacity to uh, undertake IVF with a donor egg, even perhaps from a sibling, to get that genetic connection. There is the capacity to adopt. And both of those models are legal and exist within the law and don't ask us to change what we have currently outlawed. If this bill is enacted, it is going to receive the benefit of $10 million of Australia's uh, hard-earned taxpayer dollars and the time and energy uh, that it will draw will take people away from what I consider other very pressing medical research that will have a much broader impact across the community. And that is our task as parliamentarians, to weigh up the relative merit and benefit and risk. There is merit, there is benefit, but there is extraordinary risk embedded in what we are considering here today. How many will this bill affect compared to the advances that could be made in treating current diseases such as brain cancer in children? or liver cancer in children under five. What's proposed here isn't a cure. It's a radical technology trial to enable a choice for those who would prefer their children to be genetically related to them but not carry the genetic disorder. I believe that the legislation of experimental mitochondrial donation treatment is simply not worth the scale of the risk that is embedded in what has been put before us. Perhaps if we had more data from the UK that could underpin a solid assumption about the capacity of this initiative to work, I might be more inclined to give it some support. But that is not the case. We're literally flying blind here. This proposed treatment shatters decades of long consensus around experiments regarding human cloning and germline editing. We will, if this bill passes, create a new frontier in the use of cloning and editing and, and gene editing. Um, I do want to indicate uh, that I will have further comments to make when we get a little further along in this process, and that there are three amendments that I've put before the Senate for consideration. The first uh, goes to the need for the creation of evidence and data that can be observed and that there is an experimental threshold where we should have at least 20 occasions on which this technology has been successful. The second goes to, before we, before we advance, civil liability protections and the third to uh, the Gene Technology Act. And I look forward to continuing the debate Thank in the you, coming Senator day. Thank you, Chair. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Mitochondrial disease can be serious and debilitating. It causes a range of symptoms, including muscle and neurological problems, with symptoms that can range from the mild to the severe and sometimes prove fatal. Between one in 5,000 and one in 10,000 Australians will develop severe mitochondrial disease. For those individuals affected, Australians like Juliana, Shelley, Rosie, 
Alana, Pippa, Cara, Dot, Marcus, and so many more. The serious of that condition is only compounded by there being no cure at this stage. This bill offers hope to each of those people and their families, and that hope is so important. These people's lives matter, and every life matters. And yet those two short sentences carry with them the very difficulty of this bill. The mitochondrial donation law reform, Maeve's law bill, sets out a legal framework for mitochondrial donation. In doing so, it provides hope for a world without mitochondrial disease. But it does this by allowing in this country, it will be the only, only the second country in the world to permit it, five different experimental procedures, some of which require human life to be created and then destroyed during the donation process. That's why, after careful consideration of this bill and the procedures it allows, and with something of a heavy heart for those families who I know are looking for answers, I nevertheless can't support it in its current form. Mitochondrial donation is not a cure for mitochondrial disease. It's instead aiming to prevent children inheriting mitochondria that cause the disease. This is a really worthwhile goal. And while mitochondrial donation is yet to lead to a successful birth, as I mentioned, the UK is the only country to have legalised the procedure to date. This on its own shouldn't be a deal breaker. We all want Australia to be a leader in medical research because we all want Australians to get the best possible medical care. That inevitably has to involve experimentation. But our desire for medical progress must be balanced against the nature of the research involved and the ethical ramifications of it for the rest of society. In the case of this bill, I believe it ignores ethical implications in the hope that it will lead in time to viable medical treatments. Mitochondrial donation involves a permanent modification of the human germ line. Now, that's not germs as in bacteria, but rather a reference to genetics. And the procedure involves combining the genetic material from two females in order for eggs and zygotes to be created without the genetic disease. A human embryo created through this process will contain, necessarily, the genetic material of more than two people. That's an ethical boundary that causes me concern. The reasons for wanting a treatment of this kind are completely understandable, particularly from those um, who carry the disease. It must be heartbreakingly difficult for those who desperately want to become parents but know they carry the gene. And I can only say how much empathy I have for those in that position. But we're only in the very early stages of understanding the human genome. We have a limited understanding of genetics, and there's a real risk that our experiments will cause off-target effects. In other words, unintended consequences that occur due to editing the genome in the wrong place. The consequences of our actions won't only affect the child born through a successful procedure, but it will affect all of their future descendants. It's important to stop and think about the ethical threshold we may be about to cross. By allowing genetic manipulation to reduce disease, we are permitting genetic ma manipulation that could equally be used for a host of non-therapeutic purposes. It's not beyond contemplation that the science used in mitochondrial donation could be used for other 
more troubling purposes. These include editing the physical attributes of a child or creating human enhancements. And I regard both of these as unethical, especially if human lives are created and then destroyed during the donation process in order to make it possible. Now, there are, as I understand it, potential methods by which mitochondrial donation may be able to be pursued without creating human lives solely to end them for the purposes of donation. I'm open to the pursuit of treatments that don't require such ethically troubling steps. I'm open to amendments that will enable treatments to be pursued for mitochondrial donation that don't involve the creation of embryos for their destruction. I remain troubled by the risks of the editing process and the use of the genes of more than two people to make a child. Ultimately, it's not right, in my view, for the life of one human to be prioritised over another or used as parts for another. There is goodness in every human, there is dignity in every human, and there is the spark of the divine unique talents, gifts and contributions to be made in every single human. That's why I can't, in good conscience, support this bill without amendments that adequately safeguard against these risks. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Today I speak in favour of the mitochondrial donation law reform bill. And I know people in this chamber consider this bill to be a test in some cases of their dearest convictions and closely held beliefs, and it certainly speaks to mine. The debates before us tonight have evolved over time alongside human scientific discovery and our need to legislate for ethical frameworks for science and indeed demand and developments in reproductive technology. I voted in the State Parliament of Western Australia in the early 2000s to ban human cloning. It was important at the time, uh, and it was at the time uh, debates. There were debates about genetic uh, making genetic copies, and it was nevertheless put forward at the time that it would be the role of the legislature to amend or change those preclusions based on, change, uh, on changing the ethical framework in the context of new discoveries and ensuring uh, continued scientific development in a proper scientific and ethical framework. And in this case, uh, the bill before us is not really about gene editing. That's not what we're doing here. It's about mitochondrial DNA and its donation, DNA that comes from outside the nucleus where all our personal attributes come from. It's not about, in the case of this bill, I, I don't put an over-onus on excess embryos or that it's like cloning or that it creates three-parent children, which I don't believe it does. And indeed, expert evidence also demonstrates the same. This bill is about preventing painful and unnecessary death. It is not about legislation to prevent physical diversity or designer babies. Many of us will remember from school science class, for some of us the only thing we remembered, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. I don't know if you remember that from science, but I certainly do. They produce 90 per cent of the energy that the body needs to function. And for people without proper mitochondrial um, uh, material in their cells, can you imagine anything more difficult and horrifying than uh, feeling like you've got the flu all the time and the utter pain that comes with that? only for it to get more and more extreme. It's not just a physical variation. It is a painful uh, and catastrophic condition for many people, especially 
on young children who have a severe form of the disease. As part of an inherited um, condition, it lowers people's health and life expectancy. It's caused by a mutation in mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA in an individual. And although the number of people born with the disease is low, one in 200 people are estimated to be predisposed to mitochondrial disease. And also, uh, um, carriers. So here today we have an opportunity to support reproductive science that prevents this cruel disease. If this uh, mitochondrial donation is successful, it's not going to prevent all such cases of the disease, but it might, hopefully over time, reduce its incidence in the Australian population. Because to use this technology, you will, of course, have to know that you're a likely carrier and that you and your partner's genes will combine um, to create a child that has a high likelihood of the disease. So it won't be a panacea and prevent all disease. Of course, people are going to still have sex and they're still going to have babies uh, without the benefit of this technology. Um, so it highlights the importance of people understanding their own genetics and their genetic history. I don't believe, as I said before, mitochondrial donation is not human cloning. Um, that I, it's, I believe that it's not human cloning, gene editing or creating a three-parent child. It is an assisted reproductive technology that can be used in addition to IVF treatments, enabling a woman whose mitochondria would predispose her to children with mitochondrial disease to have a biological child who does not inherit that trait by using don donated mitochondrial material from a donated egg or embryo. It involves the transfer of nuclear genetic material extracted from the prospective mother's egg and the placement of that material into a donor egg which has its own genetic material removed, keeping its own mitochondria. So we know that uh, this technology isn't going to help people who are suffering through this terrible disease right now or those who will unknowingly pass this trait on. But the evidence from overseas does show that mitochondrial donation could stop the inheritance of mitochondrial disease and give people a long and healthy life. So what good reason can there be for not preventing such a painful death in a young child, which is the reality for children born with mitochondrial disease? Most will die in their first five years. I was on the inquiry which investigated the science of mitochondrial donation back in 2018, and I thank the MITO group for pushing the law reform that is before us today. The parliament and the government have been cautious. At the time, we found that further research and community consultation needed to be done. And over the past couple of years, it has been done. The National Health and Medical Research Council, along with the Department of Health, have done just that. They've undertaken a series of community consultations, looking into community attitudes to ethical, legal and social issues associated with introducing mitochondrial donation. And we, when we look to the motivation of many people in the chamber here, yes, they have their own concerns about the creation of excess embryos and the destruction of those embryos. And that is a valid ethical concern for them and many other Australians. However, IVF and reproductive technology is widely used in Australia and it comes with it all of those ethical questions around excess embryos, the scientific research, uh, and all of those different ethical questions that go with it. We all know children who have been created uh, through reproductive technology, and I'm a very privileged mother uh, to have uh, had the opportunity to have a child through IVF. So it's no surprise to me that there's significant community support 
for this legislation and the technology. But also, in, uh, as outlined, concern over the rollout. People have recommended a regulated approach with ongoing safeguards and ongoing monitoring, which is the case in the legislation before us. There are several protections in the legislation, uh, including counselling for parents for the potential risks and alternative options such as gamete donation uh, are all there in the kind of counselling that's available to people using this technology. It's also consistent with gamete donation and other counselling provisions, which are well known. Privacy for parents and children is a top priority, as well as mandatory reporting for any adverse events and mitochondrial egg donors uh, are not, of course, considered legal parents. These are all well-known frameworks within our existing reproductive technology landscape. And I think that is really important for this chamber to understand in the context of um, uh, it being put forward that this is somehow extremely novel and unknown. It is not. It, is, uh, it has been part of the landscape of reproductive technology for decades now. The bill uh, has included in it a staged and closely monitored path forward with the first stage legalising mitochondrial donation for certain research and training purposes, including undertaking a clinical trial. And I certainly wish all of the families and donors involved in that, should this legislation pass, all the best. The bill implements a cautious approach consistent with other reproductive technology. Uh, and in relation to mitochondrial research, as we know, it's based on the approach used in the UK, which has been in place since 2015. As a mother who has used IVF to have my beautiful son, I understand the stress of infertility and the willingness to endure countless IVF cycles to make a family. The debates about donor conception and the need for children to understand their genetic origins are also important. But frankly, this bill has less uh, complexity in it than other donor conceptions, I think, in that regard. There are other um, options that remain in play for people who carry um, these genetic variations. You know, you can use a donor, but they are at least as complex as the bill before us. Donating your gene genetic material, um, getting gen genetic material donated to you is hard to come by, and I think that will be easier for donors who know they are donating their mitochondrial DNA rather than all their DNA, which is the case uh, for someone who requires an egg donor to bypass uh, uh, carrying this trait forward. I also note that from November 2021, many uh, patients can claim a Medicare rebate for pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, I was offered this after a number of failed IVF cycles, but it seemed to me what was the point? It was many thousands of dollars per test, and it is little wonder that I decided simply to do more cycles of IVF and forego the test on the embryo, which is the kind of tests uh, that are available currently. And those kinds of tests offer no solution when all of your embryos uh, carry this kind of trait. So for, again, for those worried about um, excess embryos, the alternative is years of failed IVF cycles. Yes, more embryos and more expense under what the fertility options for these families are currently. IVF raises uh, a myriad of ethical questions, and one not particularly related to this bill, but many of our debates overlook some of the most fundamental issues in reproductive technology, and they are the social and economic conditions that mean people delay having a child and have to resort uh, to using reproductive technology to start with. 
I would hope that those of you in the chamber who are opposed to IVF might work with others who support it to address some more of these underlying issues on which we agree. And I certainly hope that mitochondrial donation research will mean fewer IVF cycles and, in the future, healthy babies uh, for many more Australian couples. This bill has been extensively consulted on and thought through. It has a system in place that will ensure its ethical application. I consider myself extremely lucky to have a healthy child. And in supporting this bill, I do so because I want to support others, other parents, to have that same opportunity, an opportunity to have a healthy child of their own. I'm proud to support the legislation before us today. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I want to start by acknowledging the extensive discussion that has already been had of the science and of the technology. And I want to acknowledge uh, the incredible contributions of so many of my colleagues in the chamber. Uh, it has been um, an education. I've enjoyed listening to people and will continue to follow the debate uh, for the rest of tonight and, uh, and tomorrow. Uh, because this is a very, very complex a piece of legislation and human issue. Because any parent's first response on hearing that they are having a baby or hearing of a pregnancy is, I hope the child will be healthy. But sadly, not all children are born healthy. But modern medicine has assisted to change the fate of many children. And with medical advancement comes not only a desire to do good, but a responsibility to do what is right. So our ethics are to do no harm, don't intervene, health at what cost. Strangely, we often see more outrage expressed about animal testing of products than about the value of human life and the welfare of human beings. Each day, human children, Australian children, are abused in squalor. There is elder abuse, domestic violence, but mention animal testing uh, and people lose their minds. So what value do we put on human life when is an embryo alive? For women who have experienced joy at seeing a tiny heart beating on a pregnancy scan, life begins at conception. But on the other hand, extreme right to choose activists openly celebrate abortion at any stage of pregnancy. For me, this is a dilemma. I support technology that allows parents to have healthy children. But this legislation deals with genetic modifications and donations of mitochondrial DNA. As a mother who wants everyone to experience having their own children, but also feel that people at risk of passing on disabling conditions via their genes should have access to technology. We've just had a great contribution from Senator Pratt about access to other methods of having children, whether that be IVF, adoption, surrogacy, instead of going down a uh, technological road. Um, but of course the problem is, is that the child does not feel biologically their own. My own experience is that uh, I understand only too well the all-consuming desire to have your own child. And for me, it was a very, very long uh, six years before uh, I was able to have a baby. But this desire to hold your own child uh, is a different uh, is, is more complex in this situation because uh, the mother knows the risk of having her own child. She knows the pain and the suffering that she may have endured and certainly understands what is possible uh, for that child. Critics fear legislating for use of mitochondrial technology that it will open the door to laws allowing choosing baby's gender hair colour or height. 
that Maeve's law, this legislation, is intentionally narrow to avoid that. Mitochondrial donation techniques don't alter personal characteristics and traits, because personal characteristics and traits such as eye colour are derived from the nuclear material. Others are worried that living embryos will be discarded once genetic material is obtained, but our legislation dictates a procedure happens before an embryo is created. I have followed uh, the discussion of the amendments that are being uh, proposed uh, by Senator Canavan and Sen Senator O'Neill and possibly others, and I look forward to seeing those come forward because I hope that they may assist me with some of the concerns uh, that I have uh, come upon uh, in researching this legislation. I want to acknowledge the friends and the families of Maeve, their advocacy and how personal this issue is to them, how close this is to their hearts in a way that we, uh, well, many of us will never understand. But we live in a world where science and technology means that we have to make decisions that previous parliaments could not have imagined. The ethical considerations around artificial intelligence, as simple as driverless cars, and the science of human DNA selection and amendment is incredibly, incredibly serious and important to the future uh, of our, our race, our species and our society going forward. This is technology that has been considered in animals. But I keep reflecting, just because we can, does, that it, mean, does it mean we should? So, I will spend the rest of this debate period rereading the correspondence that I've received from a wide range of stakeholders, following the discussions of, uh, and contributions of my colleagues, uh, the, the ability to um, amend or use technology to uh, hopefully remove suffering for this particular disease and perhaps others in the future is incredibly tempting but I don't feel confident that we truly understand the door that we're opening by passing this legislation. And for that reason, uh, I do look forward to the, uh, any amendments that are being proposed to this legislation because uh, it truly is, um, I believe, a fork in the road of our society, the use of technology and how we think about human life. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak in support of the passage of Maeve's Law, the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Bill 2021. This bill is one of those moments when this place can have a clear and significant impact on the personal lives of some Australian families. It's a reform that has been years in the making, and it's a reform that will bring hope and relief to many. Maeve's Law, named in honour of little Maeve Hood, who at 18 months was diagnosed with Lee syndrome, a severe mitochondrial disorder. The bill was named after Maeve because of the tireless work of her parents, Sarah and Joel, along with the Mito Foundation, who worked to raise awareness and build support for those in our community with mitochondrial disease. It is a testament to the efforts and the tireless campaigning that this bill has made it to the Senate floor, and I really hope we will pass this bill as the other place did in the last sitting of 2021. I thank the Hood family, Sean Murray of the Mido Foundation, who has worked so hard talking and explaining to MPs and senators about why this bill is so important, and of course to the many other families who have championed this issue. Mitochondrial disease affects all communities in Australia. And just last November, over 1,000 Canberrans participated in the 35-kilometre walk, bloody long walk, for the Mito Foundation. They walked for the many families who have felt the pain of losing loved ones to this dreadful disease. In preparing for this bill, I spent time reading the stories of those Australians who have shared their lives and shared their stories advocating for these laws. They are the stories of sons and daughters, mums and dads, and of course, there's little Maeve, who is only five and who has done so much, along with her parents, to raise awareness 
of mitochondrial disorders. But there's also so many more, and their stories, more than 30 of them, that appear on the mitochondrial um, website. I read every single one of those stories in educating myself to get a full appreciation of why this bill is so important to pass. Behind those names are the stories of babies, toddlers, young children, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged Australians, older Australians, all affected by mitochondrial disease. The stories are often difficult to read and the generosity in sharing them in the single hope that we, the people in a position to change the laws and help families, is the most unselfish of acts. The stories from mums and dads about losing their babies to this disease written with such love and loss, were painful to read and almost impossible for me to comprehend. The photos that accompanied each story, cheerful, cherubic faces, children with wide smiles surrounded by families and adults, parents themselves, everyday Australians struck down out of the blue by random with often debilitating and life-limiting symptoms. The stories of not knowing what was happening to young babies as they started to show symptoms, the misdiagnosis, the testing, the guilt and pain from learning that the condition is passed on from parent to child and that you as the carrier of the faulty gene had caused this disease to occur in, in your babies and the uncertainty and fear that comes with caring for someone with mitochondrial disease. Alistair was a Canberran who was diagnosed with mitochondrial mitochondrial myopathy in his late 60s. He suffered from poor hearing, loss of balance and extreme fatigue. Alistair unfortunately deteriorated quickly and needed his wife and eventually his son to care for him before he passed away, aged 74. Alistair told his son, be careful having kids. What a burden that must be to carry. These and many others who have been touched by mitochondrial disease are the most powerful of advocates for the change that this law proposes. This bill is an opportunity to take advantage of the advances in reproductive technology to avoid the heartache, pain and anguish of having a child with severe mitochondrial disease. It would exist, amend existing legislation to make mitochondrial donation legal for research, training and human reproductive purposes, allowing families to have a biological child in a way that minimises the risk of transmitting mitochondrial disease. I know other senators have gone through the detail of this bill in their contributions, so I won't repeat that, other than to say we know that around 56 children are born with the disease a year, approximately one child a week. This bill can reduce that number, and on those grounds alone, I support this bill. I acknowledge that the bill does raise concerns for some senators. On votes of conscience, when the colours of party are stripped away, we stand here as individuals. We all bring our own perspective, our own life experience to this chamber. I come to this vote as someone who spent years working in the disability sector. I come to this vote as someone who spent eight years as a Minister for Health. I come to this vote as someone who's experienced death of loved ones and the deep grief that follows. But mostly I come to this vote as Senator a mum of three amazing children. Senator Gallagher, it being 10 p.m. as per the Change routine of business. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.